Chapter 51. Guardian Shadows. Part 4. Chiron only unsheathed one of his two swords. As if he had been planning on joining this practice session, he already had his armor on. The moment he saw the dragon's sword, Azel thought about Arietta's sword. It seems the princess sword was made in imitation of this sword. The dragon's sword and Arietta's sword looked alike. The hilt and the blade looked different, but both the swords held a white glow. Unlike Arietta's sword, his sword wasn't curved. It was a double-edged longsword. The hilt looked like a dragon with wings, making it look like a ceremonial sword instead of a weapon used in fighting. The blade must be made out of dragon bones. Chiron's dragon swords were entirely made out of ingredients harvested from a dragon's corpse. The sword was probably manufactured using magical means on the dragon's bones. Chiron spoke. Let's play a little bit. Truthfully, I've been a bit bored. Who wants to go first? Giles stepped forward first. In a flash, Bor's expression hardened, since he had lost the initiative. Azel laughed. A dragon's sword. Azel eyed Chiron's sword. Since he carried a pair of swords, Azel inferred Chiron was a dual sword user. He only took out a single sword to enjoy the sparring session, since there was a huge gap between his opponent and him. If he wanted to show his true skill, he would use his dual swords. His hands are in such conditions. Both of Chiron's hands were rough. He had countless calluses from wielding a sword. It was the hands of a person, who had swung the sword even if blisters had burst open on his hands. Well, he is from the dragon demon race. Even if he is a dual sword user, he could sever bones with just a single hand. Dual sword wielding was rarely found within the knights. Truthfully, even if one also counted the mercenaries, there were that many people that used that style. The difficulty of learning the techniques were too high, and it was disadvantageous to use it against an armored opponent or a monster with a tough hide. However, Azel had learned it in the process of searching far and wide for sword techniques, and he had even used it in real fights. When he fought the dragon's shadow, he had used dual sword techniques with the sword he had hidden with his stealth skill. Giles stepped forward enthusiastically. Ha! Good! Chiron was excited as he received Giles's attack, then he counterattacked. The confrontation didn't last very long. Around the 20th exchange, Chiron's blade rested on Giles' neck. Okay. I've lost. Your basic foundation is sturdy. You move well forward and backwards. However, you are clumsy at reacting to attacks from the sides. Keep that in mind for the future. Thank you. Giles was moved since he was able to spar with him. And he also got a pointer from Chiron. Azel smirked. His advice was concise and to the point. It seemed he's quite talented at teaching others. This opinion was reinforced by the fact that Chiron exchanged 20 blows with Giles. If he used his true skills, he could have won with a single exchange. However, this was a sparring match, so Chiron tried to bring out the best in Giles. Then he assessed his weaknesses. Bor was next. He also lost after they exchanged around 20 blows, and Bor was able to hear Chiron's critique. Bor used a shield, so he was better than Giles in terms of defense. However, he was dispatched without a problem by Chiron. Chiron spoke as he looked at Azel. How about you? If you want me to spar, then I'll give it a go. You are acting hard to get. Why don't you follow the examples of these young men? Ha ha ha. It might be because I've met the Duke only recently. Azel unsheathed his sword as he spoke spoke those words. It was true he had wanted to face Chiron at least once. He had completed dual banding his third ring of life yesterday, so he wanted to see how much his battle capabilities had increased. Moreover, he needed an opportunity to evaluate his senses. Chiron spoke. Come at me. Then. I won't decline. Azel showed his respects then he immediately went offensive stance. He really doesn't like to lose. Chiron frowned. He had been planning on giving Azel the chance to attack him first. However, Azel approached him in a languid manner, as if he was provoking Chiron. It was an attitude showing that Azel wanted to see who would give in and attack first. It got on Chiron's nerve, so he eventually took the first strike. 
After the issue of who would take the first strike was resolved, the two of them exchanged sword strikes at extreme speeds. Chiron was fast, but Azel wasn't a slouch either. When Chiron fought Bor and Giles, he matched his own speed to theirs. However, he was steadily increasing his speed now. Giles and Bor's eyes became wide as they saw the action. The two of them were moving at a speed they couldn't follow. It was tight. Surprisingly, Azel was sparring against a living legend, yet he wasn't being pushed back at all. Instead, as time passed, Chiron was being pushed back. Chiron was astonished. I'm losing in terms of predicting the opponent's move. The exchange was so fast that it was hard to follow it with the naked eye. Still, even in such a situation, Azel was a half step in front of Chiron. He was able to see Chiron's moves, and he was able to make a move on the board accordingly. As time passed, the cumulative effect of the exchanges mounted, and one could clearly see which side was advantaged and disadvantaged. It was evident after each blow that Chiron was faster. No, his movement, chained moves and reaction was also faster. Moreover, each of his moves were sharper. Yet he was being pushed back by Azel. It wasn't as if Azel's assault was at a level where Chiron couldn't deal with it. Both of them only strengthened their body and senses. This was a simple battle with a sword where Spirit Order and Dragon Key wasn't being used. Azel was frighteningly controlling the situation to the minute detail, and Chiron was at a disadvantage against Azel. It felt as if the answer had been predetermined. No, it felt as if his opponent was solving a problem where every advantage was given to him. If he stabbed, then his opponent would block it in a certain way. If he stabbed in a different way, then the opponent responded in kind. At the time, Chiron had thought he was making a move that would give him an advantage. Azel's advantageous moves stacked one after another, and Chiron was a hair breadth away from defeat. Ha! Huh, where the hell did a guy like this pop out from? After he got past his inexperienced and youthful period of time in his life, Chiron had never lost to anyone in terms of techniques. He was a master swordsman who had trained longer than a human's lifespan. However, unlike a human, time hadn't aged or weakened him. He still possessed a body in its prime. However, he had met an opponent who was better than him in terms of technique. It had been several dozen years since he met someone like that. No, this isn't about the techniques. Chiron tried to find a more suitable expression. Feel. Yes, it was his senses. This didn't mean Azel was not using his intellect and moving based on his instinct. Didn't the word sense have multiple meanings? Each of Azel's sword techniques weren't close to perfect. His physical body was weak, and he lacked an edge. However, he was able to assess and have a feel for the beat of the battle. Moreover, he could tie his senses to the, the weapon he possessed, and he was able to manipulate the situation into outcomes he desired. He was showing an almost miraculous level of battle sense. Him. In the next moment, Azel stopped his onslaught then he retreated backwards. Chiron had been completely outmatched, so he had been slowly forced into a corner. Chiron frowned. Are you trying to give me face? That isn't it. Ha! Huh, I thought you would want to use your second sword right about now. Chiron's expression crumpled into a frown. He took a deep breath, and he spoke after he calmed his heart. You know are well acquainted with how I feel. Chiron unsheathed both dragon swords. There was a complete change in his spirit when he held both his swords. Of course, Chiron was plenty strong with a single sword. However, it was rare to meet an opponent where he had to use his dual swords. He needed both to be able to defeat this opponent. This man was a true expert. However, Azel. He wasn't an opponent he could defeat if he held back the killing intent and power. Chiron had to use dual swords to be able to defeat him in swordsmanship. Such a young human has this much skill. Age, experience and training didn't always result in someone having a higher cultivation level in martial arts. Still, how could a human keep up with the long-lived dragon magian and the dragon demons? However, it wasn't like that in reality. Humans go through an extreme amount of change in their limited lifespan. This mean experience and way of thought could influence a human to either become stronger or weaker. 
Chiron had witnessed a human possessing exceptional talent suffer a single defeat. Afterwards, the human desperately trained himself, but he worsened as time passed. One had to know which path one wanted to take in life. It wasn't about being lazy or training in a repetitive manner. One had to find the correct method for oneself. It allowed one to work hard and it would stimulate oneself. Chiron was sure Azel had walked down this path. Chiron had seen numerous geniuses, but Azel was a monster who was beyond his comprehension. If Chiron knew of Azel's identity and what kind of life he had led, he would have understood why Azel was so skilled. The Dragon Demon War was an incarnation of Hell where it weeded out those who had participated in it. One didn't survive because one was strong. Being strong was a prerequisite in surviving the war. But one also needed luck. Azel had great potential, and he had met many good teachers who had nurtured him. Moreover, he was able to survive, since his potential had been allowed to fully bloom. The process of his development couldn't be assessed with reason and logic. The world had been conquered by evil. The confluence of events was something of a miracle, and it was something no one else could replicate again. In the end, a monster capable of killing the dragon demon king Atain had been born. Suddenly, Chiron asked a question. What does the sword mean to you? Him, why are you suddenly asking such a question? Please answer my question. It seems you like to talk from a philosophical point of view. The sword is a lethal weapon used to defeat enemies. Your answer isn't very heroic. I have never thought about composing my thoughts on what the sword means to me. It is a tool I use to achieve my goals. This was why Azel didn't mind his sword breaking. If one used a tool, there was always a chance it'll break. He didn't obsess over the ruined tool, rather he focused on how to acquire his next tool. Chiron queried, so swordsmanship is just a way for you to kill people. What answer do you want from me? I want an honest answer. Swordsmanship isn't just a method used to kill people. Him, Chiron was puzzled by the unexpected answer. Azel continued speaking. Swordsmanship is a technique that allows me to use the tool named a sword in a proficient manner. I don't see why I have to always use it with the intent of killing something. My answer may be innocent, but I have a narrow point of view. Ha ha. Should I say your views are too simplistic? The simple answer is the best. If you want an answer that has a deeper meaning. It is a game. It's a game. Yes. It's a game where I put my life on the line. Azel had become a swordsman since the sword was the strongest and most effective weapon. Moreover, he liked the sword and swordsmanship compared to the other disciplines of martial art. He did things that was impossible for others. When he faced opponents, he always found a way to come out on top. He always challenged himself to obtain something that shouldn't be able to be achieved in such situations. That is what the sword means to me. So, you just like swordsmanship. That's basically what you are saying. There is a saying, those who are talented can't beat the hard workers. Moreover, those who work hard can't overcome those who enjoy what they do. It isn't a sentiment that I can entirely agree with. Azel smirked. Chiron was strong. He had lived much longer than a human as a dragon demon, and he was passionately addicted to improving his swordsmanship. Chiron's techniques had reached an astonishing level. If I looked at the completion of each of his techniques, he is on par with my heydays. At the time of the Dragon Demon War, this was the reason why he learned a diverse amount of techniques. No other spirit order practitioner was able to use as many variety of skills with his proficiency. Of course, this meant his techniques weren't as complete as those who stuck to a single technique until it was perfected. However, he was able to chain various skills to optimize the usage of the skills. No one could reach his level of proficiency in this aspect. Well, now, should I experience his true skill? Chiron, who was using dual swords now, could be considered an entirely different person than the one he faced before. Azul's heart beat faster in anticipation. He would be able to experience Chiron's true skills. Chapter 52. Guardian Shadows. Part 5. Chiron spoke. Well, since I've suffered a bit of a loss, I'll be attacking first. Isn't it the duty of a senior to yield the first move? I did so before. Didn't you turn down my offer? 
Chiron snorted as he attacked with his right sword. Chiron wasn't planning on making any exploratory moves. This was why his strike was tremendously sharp. However, as L read the trajectory and reach of the attack beforehand, so he was able to dodge it by the slightest of margin. Moreover, he attacked at the same time as Chiron was pulling back his sword. It was a perfect way to deal with such an attack, but the problem was Chiron was a dual swords user. Got you. As if he had waited for this moment, Chiron counter-attacked with his left sword. It looked to be a perfect trap. At least, it looked like a perfect trap to Giles and Bor. Azel hadn't forgotten Chiron was using two swords. There were numerous types of sword techniques in existence, and there were a specific type of technique where the left and right hand acted as if it was attached to a different person. The hands moved independently of each other, and they showed ever-changing movements. Chiron was like that. Azel had predicted his attack beforehand, so he accelerated a beat faster when the right sword was swung towards him. The sound rang out as sword clashed against sword. Surprisingly, it was Chiron, who retreated. I've been had. Azel purposefully slowed down his speed. When he ran in to parry the right sword, he accelerated his speed in an instant. Chiron missed the spot he was aiming for, and Azel dug in towards the inside of his guard. He waited for Chiron's counterattack, and he returned a counterattack of his own. Chiron was barely able to stop his stance from dissolving. Chiron was in an ill humor, so he went on the offensive again. His dual swords turned like a wind-up clock, and he started performing a very precise pattern of attack. It was fast, accurate, and flashy. There wasn't much difference between each blow. There was sufficient power behind the two swords, and the two swords worked in perfect unison. Most opponents wouldn't even be able to untangle the flurry of movements. However, Azel surprisingly reacted to such attacks in a natural manner. He moved his sword in the most efficient manner, and Chiron's sword slid off of his sword. Moreover, he moved back and forth to subtly control the distance from the dual swords. It cut off the rhythm of the dual swords being swung at him. Both of them moved in harmony as if they were dancing. After performing a breathtaking exchange of sword strikes, both of them took a step back. Chiron smiled. You reaction to my attacks are very natural. Have you ever fought against a dual sword techniques? I'm quite familiar with it. Azel had experience fighting against a very diverse type of dual sword techniques. The techniques differed depending on the region one was in, and the types of weapons used. It also differed by how talented his opponent was at using dual swords. There were as many difference between dual swordsmen as those who only use one sword. Chiron fell into the most troublesome group of dual swordsmen. He could use both arms freely as if one was fighting against two opponents. Chiron spoke. I heard you had five teachers. It seems the princess tattle on me. I'm disappointed. Didn't you also hear all kinds of slander about me? We are even now. Well, I don't want to be called a petty man. So I'll agree that we are even. Aha! You heard secret stories from the dragon demon princess. Most of the people of this country would love learning about those stories yet you are acting so hard to get. You should ask this question to any citizen of this country. How much worth does your story have compared to Arietta's story? They'll probably consider mine to be more valuable. In a flash, the thought crossed Azul's mind. Such as he was, he was the legendary hero who took down the dragon demon king. If he revealed his identity, everyone would drool at the prospect of hearing his story. He could probably gather a legion of people. However, I would probably believe the story of a beautiful girl instead of a weather-worn man. Him. I would definitely be conflicted if I was asked the same question. As he was thinking seriously about it, Chiron spoke. Did one of your teachers use dual swords? One of them did. Who? except he was a different type from you. Azul's third teacher was a dual sword master. He was born in the desert, and he used two very curved blades. He used the two swords to move as one. He wasn't as dynamic as Chiron, but his teacher's style was very effective against multiple enemies. Chiron asked a question. Then are you able to use dual swords? I can. However, it isn't my main weapon. I'm the opposite of the duke. Too bad. Well, if you want to, 
I can face you using dual swords. This is only a training session. No, it isn't like that. I'm just lamenting the fact that I won't be able to fight with you using my full capability. I'm not interested in destroying this fine lodging facility. I don't want to pay an exorbitant amount for the damage it will cause. Currently, the two of them were sparring using only sword techniques. However, their true skills would only emerge if Azel used his spirit order techniques and Chiron used his dragon key. The moment those factors were applied to the battle, their sword techniques would morph into something entirely different. However, this would cause a complete destruction of the lodging facility. No matter how skilled they were they were fighting with superhuman powers. It was inevitable they would cause damage to the surrounding. Chiron smirked. Well, I want to see your techniques right now. Why not try using your dual sword style? I don't have a lot of chance to go up against a fellow dual swords wielder. If I want to grant your request, I'll have to borrow a sword. It wasn't easy to ask another swordsman to borrow his sword. This was why Azel hesitated. At that moment, Bor spoke. You can use my sword. Him, are you sure? I'll just treat it as an admission fee for seeing this sparring session. Moreover, my sword is more suitable for your use than Sir Giles's sword. Thank you for letting me use it. Giles's sword required the use of both hands, so it was a bit on the heavier side. Bor used a shield, so the length and weight of his sword was ideal for one-handed use. Bor thought through all of this, and he decided his own sword was more suitable for performing the dual sword techniques. It really wouldn't have mattered. The sword Azel was using right now was akin to Giles's sword. It would be a problem if it was a great sword that required the use of both hands, but he wasn't too picky about a sword of this size when he was using his dual sword techniques. Chiron spoke in a pleased manner. The road to the capital city got a little bit more enjoyable. Him. I can clearly see your intention. You just want to pester me. It is the privilege of the old to be able to pester the young. That is why the young hate dealing with the old. Azel kept grumbling as he sparred Chiron using his dual sword techniques. It was the same as before. The sparring was fierce and tight. They exchanged blows until they were tired, but they couldn't decide the victor. He's a monster. After a session of sparring with Azel, Chiron spoke to Arietta. Arietta queried. He is good enough to receive such an assessment from teacher. In Arietta's view, Chiron was the strongest being. No one in the kingdom could hold a candle against Chiron. Chiron had spoken up about someone having a high potential before, but he had never acknowledged someone having skills on par with him. Yes, this is the first time I've seen someone like that. I can't see the limit of his abilities. He had thought Arietta mixed in some exaggeration in her storytelling about Azel. However, he never thought Arietta was lying to him. He had thought Azel looked better than he was to Arietta. Chiron had thought Azel possessed skills that made him look better than he really was when fighting his enemies. However, he found out Azel was extraordinary when Chiron faced him. His sword techniques. Surprisingly, Azel was better than Chiron at using multidisciplinary sword techniques. In terms of physical ability, Chiron held an overwhelming edge, so if it had been a true fight, he would have eventually won. However, they were fighting only in terms of techniques, and he wasn't able to gain an upper hand over Azel even though he was using his dual sword techniques. Spirit Order. This was also a part of Azel he hadn't seen yet. However, he caught glimpses of it during his travels, and he had heard the stories from Arietta. He concluded Azel was at a higher level than any Spirit Order practitioner Chiron knew. Still, how could his reservoir of magical energy be so poor? This was the part where he had a hard time accepting. This was the part, which had puzzled Chiron and also Niberus. Chiron had heard how Azel was first found, and what condition he was in. However, magical energy didn't become depleted when one's body weakens. It might happen for a brief moment, but the rings of life always replenished the energy pulse. Moreover, after a spirit order practitioner reaches a certain level, their magical energy increased in an upward curve. He had never heard of someone like Azel, who was extremely unbalanced. He said black magicians performed experiments on him. Him. I'll have to ask others for their opinions later on. 
Chiron was knowledgeable about spirit order and magic, but he wasn't an expert in those fields. Chiron put away these questions for now, and he thought about who he should ask these questions. He'll become really scary once his body is built up, and he attains enough magical energy. He is a little bit of an upstart, but it is comforting to know that he isn't evil. Azel had been accepted by the Guardian Shadows. Moreover, he had observed Azel up until now, and he wasn't a bad egg. Azel didn't hesitate to say annoying words to him in front of his face. He actually liked Azel's insolent attitude. Arietta mumbled to herself. I don't know what happened to him, but how could a being of his caliber show up all of a sudden? I don't know, that's the part that raises so much questions. Even if we take his words to be true, he would have been captured by the black magician for several years at most. Even then he should have made a name for himself by then. We might not know who he is if he is from a different country. Chiron had already sent messages to various territories, so his underlings could look into Azel's background. They didn't have much information to start with, but it was enough to be able to start an investigation. Azel Zestringer, red hair as if it's on fire, high-rank spirit order practitioner, likely to be of the royal blood. If his name was made up, then their search was all for naught. Still, there should be some information that could be salvaged. How could such a person be entirely unknown? If Azel knew Chiron's thought, he would have laughed. It was a wild goose chase. At this point in time, no one had an inkling of Azel's true identity. Arietta asked a question. Isn't there a high chance that he is someone from a different country? Probably. There were times when magic was used to deliver news, but the speed, in which information was spread, was still slow. It was possible not to know about a person if he gained his fame in a remote location of a different country. Even if a person was famous in a foreign country, it was still difficult to hear about them. Chiron spoke. I want to meet those, whom he calls teacher. According to Arietta's story, two of his teachers were already dead. However, this didn't guarantee the other three was also dead. If they were still alive, he really wanted to hear how they brought up such a being. Chapter 53. Guardian Shadows. Part 6. What is a sword? Azel leaned against the window frame. He mumbled to himself as he looked up into the night sky. He had heard this question numerous times long ago. It was 220 years after the Dragon Demon War had concluded, yet he repeated the question and answer he had discussed previously with his teachers. There were five people who Azel had considered to be his teachers. They each had their own answer to this question. The sword is a really nice lethal weapon. It allows a small and skinny kid like you to be able to kill an adult. It is a very wicked invention. Is it fine to let a child like me hold such a thing? Isn't it obvious? I'm letting you grasp the sword because you desire to carry out these lethal intentions. His views influenced Azel the most. It was why he thought of weapons strictly as tools. Maybe it was because he was Azel's first teacher. Azel had guessed the man was a noble, and he didn't treat the sword like how a typical mercenary would. His view was unrestricted. His second teacher spoke. It is beyond the capability of most people to control their own body perfectly. We are a very poor performing living organism. What a great achievement it would be if one could perfectly control something that isn't one's body. What a feat it would be to be able to perfectly control a tool called a sword. He considered a sword, or more precisely weapons, as a means to reach the state of absolute sense. After he lost an arm and an eye, he realized the inborn gift of humans were deficient and he therefore searched for the absolute sense. Amongst all his teacher, his second teacher would be the only one called the true seeker of truth. His third teacher spoke. The path of the sword is the only destination for a lost soul like me. Don't become like me, Azel. He was an heir to a fallen kingdom. He had lost everything to the dragon demon king's army. He took revenge on the people directly involved, but he was always felt a sense of futility. In an age of darkness, he was a hero who gave hope to the people like a ray of light. However, he had always been in pain, and he was tormented after he lost everything. To him, the sword and the sword techniques were a connection to his destroyed past and memories. His extraordinary sword skills made dragon demon king's soldiers shake in fear. 
However, he didn't pursue the sword for its strength, or the truth. It was a keepsake of his deceased loved ones. It connected him to the past as his memory gradually became fuzzy during the time of madness. His fourth teacher wasn't a swordsman. No, he didn't use a weapon in the first place. He hadn't even learned any martial arts before he met Azel. He was like wild beast. However, he had an interesting opinion about swords and weapons. It is an item that represents how large a murderous intent the humans have. What? Humans are weak. However, humans have an unbelievably large desire to kill those who scare them. Isn't this the reason why these items were made? I guess it could be interpreted that way. The weak could kill the strong. It is something that happens quite often even in nature. However, it doesn't happen as often as it does amongst the humans. Weapons and even martial arts were the ultimate result of humans trying to overcome their disadvantage. To his knowledge, his fifth teacher was a swordsman who possessed the most outstanding techniques. He was a crafty man who respected the sword more than anyone. The sword is my life and soul. That is so old-fashioned, old man. Are you trying to say that new is more right than the old? Young men like you are too frivolous. I've devoted my whole life to the sword. It would be funny if my sword didn't hold that much weight. From the time when I was a child with no hair to the time my hair had turned white from old age, I focused my everything into the sword. Of course, it is my life and soul. They were men who grasped the sword. They bet their lives of the present on the sword. They bet their ideal of tomorrow on the sword. Each of them had their own answers. Azel thought of those times, quietly putting on a smile. They were being chased. Nibirus wasn't used to situations like this. It was strange that a dragon demon king worshipper had never been chased before, but truthfully, she had only moved within the confines of a well-made plan. Her underlings had worked hard to gather information, and they had set the stage for her. She had leisurely worked under these conditions. She was basically a flower grown indoors. She had extraordinary potential, and she had used it to reach an astonishing level in magic. She couldn't understand why her organization was so afraid of the world. They possessed such powerful strength yet why did they have to hide while being afraid of the world? Of course, the prophecy said they couldn't show themselves until the, the dragon demon king returned. If they carelessly made a mistake when facing the humans, they would be swarmed by their troops. Their organization might be destroyed. Still, was there a reason why they couldn't rule from the background? Even if there were people opposing him, couldn't they squash the antagonists with their power? Would it be so hard to fill the upper society with the dragon demon king worshippers? Nibirus always had a sense of dissatisfaction in her heart, and now she realized she had been wrong. Miss, don't worry about blocking each blow. Put more effort into running away. Duran, who was running beside her, gave the advice. There were beings possessing powerful magic following them from the back and these beings were firing magic blindly. Moreover, there were more than one. If it was one on one, I could. Consecutive magical attacks exploded in the surrounding, and the sound of the explosions rang out. Nibirus had summoned her demonic beast of darkness, traveling along at a high speed as if she was sliding across the surface. Just a moment ago, she had tried her flying magic to surge forward, but she had been humiliated by being shot down. It was the dragon demon magician Count Michael. He was known as the patron saint of the Eastern Rulan Kingdom. Moreover, three of his students and five knights were chasing after Nibirus and Duran. Duran, Nibirus and her other companion was moving at twice the speed of a galloping horse. Normally, they would have lost Michael's party long time ago. Moreover, if they were the only ones tracking him, they wouldn't have had to put as much effort in escaping as they were doing now. The problem was that the beings moved at a frightening speed. These beings were circling their surrounding. These beings had a white robe over their entire body. They were like ghosts. It was the guardian shadows. The problem was, they weren't ghosts. They possessed true bodies. They moved incredibly fast, and they kept disappearing while they attacked, as if they were skipping dimensions. Duran received an attack from a guardian shadow. The guardian shadows had taken a transparent phantom-like blades out from within his robes. Every time its sword clashed with Duran's sword, 
A light burst forth. That wasn't the only problem. Each guardian shadows fought in a different combat style. Some bastard shot energy arrows, and another one attacked using magic. They all had frightening mobility, and they had a variety of ways of attacking. Moreover, they were all powerful. Even Nibiris couldn't become lax in her defense. They all seemed to have a screw loose, but at the very least, there were twenty of them in pursuit. Moreover, they worked surprisingly well together. Unlike humans, the Guardian Shadows ran forward without worrying about their lives, so they were very hard to deal with. The Guardian Shadows are really, they are really annoying. Michael was leading magicians and Guardian Shadows. If one of the two group was missing, Nibiris thought that she could take care of them without much difficulty. However, the two groups working in concert was very troublesome. Her group was at a numerical disadvantage, and the Guardian Shadow's special nature was terrifying to a magician. Nibiris let out an attack towards a Guardian Shadow who was approaching from the side like a ghost. She had put a large barrier over her entire party, yet this bastard used some unknown method to enter within. It looked like wizardry whenever it skipped across space. It was at that moment that a Guardian Shadow appeared behind Regina, who had been running beside Nibiris. Look out! Nibiris reacted almost reflexively. The Guardian Shadow attacked the shocked Regina with a beam of light magic. She lay herself open to attack, and Nibiris took a magical arrow to her arm. Duran raged when he saw this. Miss! How dare you! Sparks flew from the eyes hidden by the helmet. They had to run away a long distance, so Duran had been saving his strength. He had been focusing his power on defense and running away. However, at that moment, his magic swirled like raging waves and a shockwave poured out into the surrounding. The guardian shadows in the surrounding was swept away in a single stroke. I'm, I'm fine. Nibiris spoke as she calmed her breathing. She wasn't used to feeling pain. She had always been able to overpower her opponents, so she had rarely felt a threat to her body. The only time she experienced being shaken up was when she had trained her mind. This was why she had almost lost it when she was hit by the arrow. Still, she endured by gritting her teeth. Even if she had led a sheltered life, her pride wouldn't forgive herself if she let her mind become disordered from a mere arrow wound. Regina who had been struck dumb, spoke. Thank you. Don't divert your attention. The moment you let your guard down, you are dead. Nibiris spoke coldly as she glared at Regina. She had given her enemies an opening when she tried to save her underling. The fact that she had been injured was humiliating. If it wasn't for that man, this would have never occurred. The man with the name seeped in sin. I'll be sure to repay this humiliation. Nibiris' anger towards Azel allowed her to overcome her pain as she continued running away. Eleven a boy sleeping under the shade of a tree opened his eyes. The teen had sleepy eyes underneath the hat that was pressed down on his head. His age looked to be around fifteen or sixteen. Arm, um, what is it? The boy looked around his surrounding. The guardian shadows slowly moved around as their white robes billowed behind them. The boy was also someone who had been chosen by the Guardian Shadows. What's going on? The boy asked a question, but the Guardian Shadow didn't give him an answer. After staring at the boy, it disappeared. Him. Was it sent to protect me? The boy tilted his head in puzzlement. He wasn't upset at the non-answer. He was well aware that the Guardian Shadows were terrible partners to have a conversation with. All right, I'll go. The boy let out a yawn. He stood up then started to walk. After he had been chosen by these beings, he repeatedly experienced things he couldn't explain. The current situation was a perfect example. No one told him exactly where he should go or when he should be there. He just felt a tug towards a direction, and he had a feeling that he had to travel that way. Prophecy. He suddenly heard the voice of a guardian shadow from his surrounding. The surprised boy turned to look at the guardian shadow. What? The prophesied being. Are you saying the man of the prophecy has shown up? An answer wasn't forthcoming this time around. The guardian shadow had said some ambiguous words, then it shut its mouth. However, it had been enough for the boy. Ha! He really came during my lifetime, at a time when the meaning of my life is almost at an end. 
The boy was in blank amazement as he mumbled to himself. Then he walked towards the direction his senses were directing him to. Chapter 54. Dragon Demon Prince. Part 1. Rulan Kingdom's capital Ruldia. In the twilight of the Nadic Empire, this kingdom became an independent country. When Duke Rulan became the founder king, he made the Rulan castle that he was residing at the time the royal palace. Afterwards, he expanded the capital city, so it would befit the dignity of a king. The city had become much more lively and beautiful as time passed. A squad of troops exited the royal palace. There were twenty knights and three magicians. Moreover, the group also had two healers. The composition of the party made it unlikely that they were going out for a patrol. They left the capital and out in the open for the night. Then, they headed towards their destination. The middle-aged veteran knight who was leading the party spoke. We'll be able to join up with the princess party in the afternoon without any complications. I believe so. Personally, I have great expectation about this meeting. I don't know why the Dragon Sword Duke has come here, but it's the same for me. It wasn't only the knight who had answered. Every one of them shared the sense of anticipation. They weren't talking about it, but their eyes sparkled when Dragon Sword Duke was mentioned. These men were sent out by the throne to go greet the Dragon Demon Princess Arietta. When they received news that an unsavory group had tried to kidnap her, they sent out enough manpower to be able to protect her. Arietta wasn't expecting such a welcoming party. As she was about to arrive at the capital safely, she decided to send a brief explanation on what had happened in recent days. However, from the throne's perspective, they couldn't help but be appalled by the news. Him, the horses ran at a languid pace as the knights conversed with each other. However, their expressions hardened as they heard the sound of an explosion from afar. It wasn't just one explosion. Consecutive explosions rang out. The veteran knight asked the question. What do you think is going on? Is there a unit that's training nearby? No matter where one went, troops trained with magic. This was why one could occasionally hear sounds of explosions in passing. The mage replied. Please wait here for a moment. He used a far-seeing magic. The origin of the explosions was too far away so it was impossible to get a detailed account on what was happening. However, one could get the gist of the situation. Soon the magician's complexion changed. I don't think the army is training right now. The sound is coming from the road. Oh no, is it perhaps the princess party? Arietta's party, whom they were traveling to meet, might be under attack by the enemies again. The veteran knight let out a shout. Everyone run at full speed. Yes, sir. They galloped at full speed towards where the sound of the explosion had originated. As they were getting closer, the sound of the explosions continued. One could tell from the sound that a fierce battle was occurring. As they approached the location, the magical shockwave from the explosions made their senses tingle. Who is fighting whom? The veteran knight became very anxious. He was a quadruple master, but the power of the explosions was something that he couldn't handle with his power. However, when they frantically arrived on the scene, they couldn't help but be confused. Princess. Two people were standing a small distance away from the explosions. One of them was a beautiful girl with white blonde hair and yellow eyes. It was the dragon demon princess Arietta. Her young maid was by her side, and they were looking at the battle in a relaxed manner. Him, aren't you Sir Varan? Arietta recognized the veteran knight and was puzzled. The veteran knight Varan quickly got off his horse. He was too taken aback, so he forgot about the manners he had to keep towards a royal. He asked her a question. I'm sorry, but what's going on here? That's the question I want to ask you. Why are you guys here? We are here to escort Princess Party to the capital. Ah, was it because of the message I sent ahead? It seems I caused you trouble for nothing. Arietta couldn't help but laugh. She had sent her news without putting much thought into it. Of course, this would be the move made by the throne in response. Varan carefully asked the question. Princess. What's? At that moment, the sound of an explosion was heard again. The surprised Varan looked towards where the sound of the explosions had originated. He heard Arietta's answer from the side. It's my party members. 
Sir Azel and Duke Tarantos is in the midst of a sparring session. You aren't in any danger if you don't get too close. You don't have to worry about it. They are in the midst of a sparring match. Varan asked the question, to which Arietta nodded her head. That's right. Varan lost the words he was about to say. This was happening within the view of Arietta. Moreover, the action happening in front of them exceeded anything he could have imagined. That, that's a sparring session. This was too intense and grandiose to be called a sparring match. You are as slippery as always. Chiron yelled with an annoyed voice. At the same time, his dual swords danced fiercely. In a blink of an eye, he had swung his swords over ten times in midair. The empty air was shredded, but the person who should be letting out a cry wasn't there. He was sure he had attacked the real body, but the smirking illusion had disappeared. Then, a dangerous presence appeared from his side. Sword clashed against sword, and a clear sound rang out. However, this lasted only for a moment. The resistance he felt at the tip of his hands disappeared as if it was a lie. Chiron couldn't help it as his stance faltered. In a flash, a red-colored hair young man named Azel appeared behind him. Chiron let out a cry of indignation. He stabbed without even looking backwards. How many time are you going to use the same method? Until it doesn't work on you. Okay. Chiron was taken aback. He was sure he had caught the real body, so he had thrust backwards in an acrobatic move. So why was Azel's voice coming from the front? Then, a sword was placed on Chiron's throat. Azel spoke with a triumphant air. Hoot. I've won today. Shit. Chiron's expression crumpled. I destroyed your three-layered clones. Did you create a four-layered body clone? Are you some kind of a child? You keep adding another layer every time I break one. Aha. Uh -huh. You shouldn't complain after losing in that fashion. Moreover, it wasn't a four-layered body clone. You were very far from the right answer. What? Then what the hell did you do? Of course, it is a secret. You should think about it and come up with your own answer. Maybe if you win next time, I'll tell you. With this match, I'm up three victories on you. I'm going to collect a fat reward when I get to the capital city. Azel whistled as he sheathed his sword. After the first sparring match of the sword, Chiron and Azel sparred every day on the road to the capital. They had even started using the dragon demon key and spirit order. Of course, this was a sparring session, so they set various parameters beforehand. Still, the aftermath was quite scary. This was why they only sparred with simple swordsmanship near a town. They also agreed not to use techniques that would cause too much damage to the surrounding. Currently, Azul's record was 7 win, 4 loss, and 2 tie. He was ahead by 3 wins. Chiron sheathed his dual swords while grumbling. My reputation as the Dragon Sword Duke has taken a huge hit. Of course, no one would believe it even if you told them you won. I guess so. Azel smiled as he thought inside. My friends would have never believed it if I told them I had lost four times. Even if Azel was in his weakened condition, this was a great accomplishment for Chiron. Moreover, Azel couldn't get smug about being ahead of him. In terms of pure swordsmanship, he held the edge. However, once they started using their true powers, it was hard for Azel to overcome the difference in strength. He achieved victory today by using all the various tricks he had hidden up until now. If this was a real battle, him, I would give the current me the odds of 3 to 7 in his favor. Azel made a cold assessment regarding the difference in battle capability between him and Chiron. This showed how highly he regarded Chiron. Azel became overly chatty. Well, I don't care if they don't believe it. It isn't as if I'm doing this so the Duke loses face. You little shit heel. The two of them sparred after they agreed to a bet. They mutually agreed that one would grant a request if the other won. The request had to be within reason. Varan and the knights were all appalled, their mouth open as if their jaws would be dislocated. Him. Did you come from the throne? I'm Duke Tarantos. Chiron Taratos. A. Hey, it is an honor to be able to meet you, Dragon Sword Duke. Varan was barely able to collect his thoughts then he gave his greetings. After joining up with the escort sent by the throne, it took the party four days to arrive at the capital Ruldia. The capital couldn't be compared to the other cities. 
It was much larger in size and quite grand. Azel was a bit impressed. The size wasn't comparable, but the exterior appearance of the city was about as good or better than the old cities. Before Azel went to sleep, the Nadic Empire had almost unified the continent under the Great Empire. Moreover, they had been quite meticulous in making the capital to have a dignified appearance. It had been quite a striking city. Moreover, he realized this city was much larger than the cities he had seen before. He couldn't help but enjoy himself as he looked at the lively city. The thing he liked the most was all the people were overflowing with energy. I bet the Nadic Empire would have become like this after I went to sleep. After the Dragon Demon War ended, a deep scar had been left behind. Azel remembered the people. They had gained a hope for the future, but the majority of the people had struggled to live on. The party received glances from the residents of the capital city. Moreover, people shouted from joy at the sight of Arietta. 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 The kingdom's valiant flower. Embarrassing praises were thrown at her from the surrounding. It didn't matter if the person was male or female, old or young. He found out that she was a universally loved existence. Azel slyly asked her a question. So this is the reason why you dressed up. If I walked around the capital with a shabby appearance, it would basically stain the throne's reputation. It is annoying, but I have to endure it. Truthfully, they could have arrived at the capital yesterday night. However, Arietta insisted on staying at a town a bit off from the capital. She had delayed her schedule, and when she came down from her room in the morning, she had dolled herself up. She said she had the duty to show the people that greeted her a beautiful appearance. Azel asked her a question. Geez, what would you have done if you didn't have Mozanora? Him. Well, when she set off to visit the western border guards, Arietta had insisted on leaving behind Anora. However, she had lost to Anora's tenaciousness. As they traveled, Anora had found out Arietta was terrible at dressing herself. Arietta let out a bitter laugh. I wouldn't have been put in a tough spot, but I'm sure it would have all worked out. I don't think it would have worked out. If it hadn't worked out in the end, I could have borrowed a maid from a noble nearby. I'm not as hopeless as you think. Arietta started justifying herself. Azel looked at Anora. She didn't say anything, but she had put strength into her shoulders as she preened. I guess being a maid to the royal family is quite the achievement, was Anora. Of course. It isn't something anyone can become. Do you see me a little bit differently now? I've always thought Muzanora was amazing. Haven't you realized that yet? Oh my, you are almost comparable to a veteran knight at speaking flattery. Even if she spoke that way, he could tell Anora liked his flattery. Arietta returned with a dignified appearance, and it notified the people of the capital that she had returned safely. When the people heard that she was returning, they had vacated a part of their schedule and were ready to greet her. As they were on their way to receive an audience from the monarch, Azel asked Giles a question. What's wrong, Sir Giles? Ooh, him, you are acting uptight like a new recruit given his first assignment. Am I really acting that way? As a soldier, it was a metaphor that truly appealed to him. Azel spoke. Yes, you are. Why? Ah, that's. I can't help but become nervous when I think about the fact that I'll have to meet his majesty. That's a normal response. If anything, Sir Azel is the weird one. How come you are so unaffected? Bor asked the question. He was part of the royal knights, so he had experienced meeting with the monarch. However, when Bor met the monarch for the first time, he had been more rigid than the current Giles. In contrast, Azel was completely relaxed. Azel spoke. Him. I don't know. It is a great honor to have an audience with a monarch, but we aren't the leading characters. We just have to stay next to the princess. After standing still, we'll just withdraw. I guess so. Still, I can't help it. Well, Sir Azel acted this way even when you met the princess and the duke. I'm not sure whether you are daring or fearless. Giles let out a bitter laugh. Chapter 55. Dragon Demon Prince. Part 2. Soon the party was granted an audience with the king alongside Arietta and Chiron. As Azel had said before, they didn't have to do anything. It was a formal occasion to announce Arietta and Chiron's return to the capital. 
Arietta and Chiron gave a report on the important events that had happened up until now. Everyone else just held their head down and knelt. After a while, they exited. That was all they did for the entire audience. Giles made an expression as if he had just survived a life and death situation. Phew. It's finally ended. It wasn't that big of a deal. What will you do if you get promoted later on? Him. A promotion. I'll have to excuse myself for now. Bohr spoke. He was a member of the Royal Knights, so he had to go report on what had happened on the return trip. Bohr spoke to the two men. I'll contact you guys when I get off work. If you don't mind, why don't you come to my house tonight? The Marquis Zilred's domain was far from here, but as a noble, he naturally had an estate in the capital. Moreover, Marquis Zilred was from a prestigious family, so the extravagant estate was located near the center of the capital. Azel spoke. Ah, I'm thankful for the invite, but I don't think it'll be possible today. Why? I don't think the princess and the duke will let go of me. Ah, that's true. Sir Azel is quite popular with those two. I don't particularly want to be popular with them. Why don't you tell yourself that lie, while watching yourself in a mirror? Please be sure to contact me when you escape from the grasp. I'll most definitely give you an invite. I'll do so. Sir Giles. Him. What about you? Do you have any older relatives you have to give greetings to? No. I don't have to do that. I'll gladly accept the invitation. Viscount Vince's family wasn't really well known, and not many of their blood relations worked for the throne. This was why Giles had planned on looking for a suitable inn he could lodge in for his stay at the capital. All right, Sir Azel. You have to contact me later. Ah, all right. You are inviting another guy, so why are you being so persistent? I get the impression you are the kind of man who will suddenly disappear if I turn my back on you. That is why I'm trying to nail you down. Do I look that cold-hearted? At Azel's question, Giles and Bohr looked at each other, and they nodded their head as if Azel had said something very obvious. Azel was slightly wounded. Geez. All right, I'll most definitely contact you, so don't worry about it. I'll try putting some faith in you. Bohr grinned then he left his seat. Azel also grinned as he looked at Bohr's retreating back. Giles asked in puzzlement. What? Nothing. I was just thinking Sir Bohr has changed a lot. When I think about how he was at the start of the trip, his actions right now is almost unimaginable. I guess that's true. Giles snickered. He would have never thought a person could change so dramatically. At that moment, Honora was walking towards them from the opposite corridor. Sir Azel and Sir Giles. Do the two of you have a place to stay in the capital? Of course, I don't. I don't have any firm plans right now. I see. The princess has arranged for a place where the two of you could stay. Thank you. Giles showed some signs of relief. Truthfully, he didn't have much disposable income, so he had been worried about the cost of lodging in the capital. It would have taken a large share of his money. The two of them headed towards Arietta's royal villa. In accordance to Arietta, a guest room had been prepared for Azel. It was basically a detached palace inside the royal palace. It was a guest room, but it was a far cry from what a normal person thought of as a room. It was as spacious as a large house, and the interior was as luxurious as royal palace. However, Azel wasn't surprised when he saw the room. As expected of a palace, it is quite gaudy. That was all the words of admiration he spoke. Giles was flabbergasted. I really am curious on what kind of life you lead in the past. Everything here is so dazzling. I'm also curious. Well, didn't Princess and Musa Nora say I was of noble birth? Maybe that's why. You've regained some more memories. One or two. I would be doing a task when my memories would overlap with the present. My identity always eludes me, but various experiences from my past appears in my mind. I do believe I was part of a well-off noble family. They had been traveling in the same party, and it was getting harder and harder to believe Azel's words regarding his memory loss. He was unbelievably strong, and he was hiding too many secrets. There were a lot of holes to his story, but they couldn't outright call him a liar. They were in an uncertain situation where they couldn't press him for answers. Above all else, he is too self-assured. If Azel was trying to fool them, 
he would be more careful. He didn't display such an attitude. He acted as if he didn't care if others believed him or not. This made people trust his story. Moreover, Giles and numerous witnesses were present when they first found him. Azel had been in such a rough state that it wouldn't be surprising if he had some lasting traumas. Azel spoke. However, I'm pretty sure I'm not of this country. Why do you say so? There were too many unfamiliar sights as we were coming here. The appearance of the streets, the customs and manners. If I could recall all of those, I would probably be a noble of this country. Still, I have no idea why I was in the forest. Him. It's quite fortunate you speak the same language as us. Truthfully, that was the point he was most impressed about after waking up in this time period. If he compared the, the current spoken and written language to the ones before he went to sleep, they were almost identical. He could somewhat believe it for the written words, but the common speech hadn't changed either in 200 years. How incredible was that? At the time, the Nadic Empire used the language of Babel. Rulan Kingdom and the other seven countries that broke off from the Nadic Empire was still using that language. There was minor changes in vocabulary and speech, but the framework of the language was still the same. It felt as if he was hearing a dialect of the language. I'll thank the legend of the Babel. It is unknown whether the legend is true, and I would have never thought there would come a day when I would give thanks to it. Even during the days of the Nadic Empire, the story of Babel wasn't written down in the history books. It was a story passed down through the ages. There used to be a lot of languages in existence in the past. Even though the Nadic Empire had been very close to uniting the whole continent, the lands outside their territory had their own language and culture. However, in the far distant past, the world had countless more languages in comparison. Even by crossing a single mountain, the spoken language would change. The language divide lead to many conflicts and death. The great immemorial mages of the past found this situation to be regrettable. They all gathered in one place to cast a massive magical ceremony, and it was named the Babel. They erected a large tower that rose high into the sky, and they gathered all the languages from the consciousness of people. After gathering as many as they could, they created a common language that would express the intent of all the people. This was the language of Babel. When the language was born through this highest order of magic, every single person on the continent knew the language. Then it had been passed down the, the ages, and the framework of the language had never changed. Some of the lexicons changed, but it allowed people to speak to others without a hitch. Azel spoke. I guess I'll rest a little bit until the princess calls me. Since we can't probably wander around this place, would you like to have a chess match? Him. I'm a pretty poor player. You should build up your skills up to a certain point. It is an indication of refinement for a noble. Those words really don't suit you. Giles couldn't help, but smirk. In the end, Arietta hadn't called for Azel on the day they arrived at the capital. After her return, he had a lot of reports to make, and she had been dragged around to make appearances at various locations. Before she knew it, the day had come to an end. After receiving Arietta's message of apology, Giles followed Boar to his house when he got off work. Azel was the only one left. Arietta had assigned servants and maids to him. After eating the dinner they brought, Azel was vacantly staring up at the ceiling. I should have asked for permission to enter the library. The royal palace's library probably had a lot of books. While he was staying here, he wanted to read up on all the history books to his heart's content. Azel was lying atop a bed that was big enough to jump around in. He had thrown his body atop it, and he was looking at the ceiling of the bed. It really fit in with the image of a bed that should be inside the royal apartments. Each corner of the bed had a post, and a fabric with fancy patterns was placed above to make a canopy. Relaxing like this isn't too bad. Now that he thought about it, it had been a while since he had the opportunity to do nothing. It had been only a month since he had awoken from the ruins of the Balan forest, but that month had been really hectic. He had experienced several battles, and he had been always been on edge inside as he tried to hone himself once again. It's true even if I included the time before my sleep. After the Dragon Demon War had ended, he hadn't had a true rest afterwards. He was too busy taking care of the post-war events, 
and the dragon demon king's curse had been eating away at his life. This was why he didn't mind spending his time doing nothing right now. He was planning on spending the rest of the day staring blankly at nothing when it happened. He heard a knock on his door. Azel bade the maid to come in. After she entered, she spoke to him. Sir Azel, someone important is here looking for you. Someone important. Azel was puzzled. Arietta had already said she won't be able to see him tonight. Was it a message from Chiron? However, the maid should already know Azel had traveled in the same party as Chiron, so it was strange for her to use the term someone important. Azel pointed at his head as he spoke. Him. May I ask for some help in tidying myself? Yes. The maid understood what he was asking for. She approached him, and she brushed his tangled hair. Then she helped him straighten his clothes. Azel knew how the world of the nobles worked, and he knew he was an outsider. Normally, even if the maid had offered to help him, he would have feigned ignorance of not knowing what she was offering, and it would have probably lead to irritating his maid. However, Azel had become the guest of the throne, so he had to think about Arietta's reputation. He knew he needed to act with more prudence. This is why they keep saying I act like a noble. As he was installed into the role of Duke Kazark, he was taught about manners until he became dry and worn away. It had been seeped into his bones. Azel stepped out of his bedroom with a bitter smile on his face. Then his eyes widened when he saw the young man drinking tea in front of the table. Ah, this was the first time Azel had seen this young man, but he knew who this was at a glance. The young man had wavy yet tidy white hair. He possessed golden eyes and his ears were slightly pointed. There was a sharp and bluish white feather-like horn above his left ear. Dragon Demon Prince Saiga Vile Rulan. The young man looked very alike to Arietta. He was two years younger than Arietta, yet he looked at Azel with a cold elegance flowing across his face. I'm sorry for showing up announced so late into the night. Are you Sir Azel, the man who was knighted by my sister? Yes, Prince. I told the maid not to tell you my identity, but it seems you recognized who I was. Of course, it should have been expected, since you spent a good amount of time with my sister. The young man didn't show any signs of being surprised. The dragon demon prince was used to others knowing his identity, and he was well aware his appearance was similar to Arietta. I'll formally introduce myself. I am the first son of the Rulan kingdom. I am called the dragon demon prince Saiga Vile Rulan. Knight Azel Zestringer gives his greetings. Azel gave his greetings in a courtly manner. When Saiga saw this, he looked over Azel conspicuously. I heard you were an unknown countryman until my sister gave you the title of knight, but it seems those rumors were wrong. If she had told me you were from a noble family, I would have believed it. Thank you. Please sit. You might think me strange for saying this, since I came here looking for you. The young man was only fifteen, but he carried himself like a royal. He didn't show any awkwardness when speaking informally to an older person, who was beneath him in station. Moreover, he didn't give the vibe that he was looking down on others. He acted the way he did, because it was befitting his station. It came naturally to him. When Azel sat across him, Saiga spoke. I came here, because I wanted to see you. Me, Chapter 56, Dragon Demon Prince. Part 3. Yes, this is the first time I've seen my sister and teacher speak so passionately about someone. It seemed after returning to the palace, she had talked about Azel in the presence of her family. Saiga spoke. Also, I wanted to thank you. Thank me for what? I heard my sister wouldn't have been safe if it weren't for you. Thank you for protecting my sister, Sir Azel. He had a cold expression, but his words were sincere. Azel spoke. No, I just did what I had to do. There aren't a lot of people in this world, who would have done the same. My elder sister is strong. She is a woman, yet she has the burden of to fighting by herself to raise the throne's reputation. She's always pushing herself to the limit, yet we keep asking her for more. I would like her to think a little bit about her own happiness. Saiga spoke after he let out a sigh. Sir Azel, I've heard your skills are outstanding. Do you have any thoughts about being one of my knights? 
You won't be disappointed by the remuneration I will give you. You have such a high opinion of me even though this is the first time you have seen me. I'm thankful. However, I have some unfinished businesses that will require me to travel. I won't be able to accept your offer. I apologize. Him. I heard my sister knighted you. Are you perhaps thinking about working under my elder sister? No. Is what my elder sister said was true? You have no ambitions towards being promoted. That is true at least for right now. There is something I have to do first. I heard you've gone through some difficulties that are hard to explain. I won't ask you any further questions. However, it's too bad. I've only recently started my activities, so I need a lot of men with skills. Even if it isn't me, doesn't the prince have a lot of talented prospects within your service? The throne always lends me men, but it isn't enough. I need a lot of men, who will work directly under me. Unfortunately, there aren't many men like that. The veterans are already entrenched in their positions, and it would create some friction if I just take people I like. So in the end I have to look for men who have potential yet they mustn't hold any high positions. It isn't easy. I see. He spoke about a topic that didn't suit a young man. However, he had grown up as a royal, so he knew the meaning of his work. Moreover, he could accurately pinpoint what issues were causing problem when dealing with people. My elder sister is experiencing similar troubles. Unfortunately, she also doesn't plan on increasing her immediate staff. We need to aggressively find people that could assist my elder sister, but she doesn't like others sacrificing themselves for her. This is why she jumps into danger, and she overworks herself. I want to lessen the burden of my elder sister. This is why I need talented people. Saiga wanted his activities to lessen the burden on Arietta. This was why he had come here to poach Azel. He is assuredly a strange human, but, as Arietta and Chiron noticed, Saiga also felt a faint sense of dragon demon magic. However, it was very subdued compared to the dragon demons, or the dragon magians. It was an oddity. That was all he thought it was. It seems my elder sister and master exaggerated their story a little bit. If he ignored the scent of dragon demon magic from him, Azul's magical energy wasn't that great. This made it impossible for Saiga to think of Azel as a strong person, since this was their first meeting. Even if he was a strong person hiding his magical waves, he would be able to sense whether the person was hiding a powerful strength or not. Saiga didn't trust others' evaluation of people. He was satisfied only after he checked the person himself. There was already a lot of stories going around about Azel. Arietta had mentioned him, and the royal knights, who went out to escort Arietta, was making a fuss after they witnessed the sparring match between Azel and Chiron. However, now that he had met Azel, Saiga determined that the stories about Azel had been exaggerated. Well, he is only a human. I put too high of an expectation on him. Saiga reaffirmed to himself the fact that he was strong. If he excluded his master Chiron, there weren't that many, who exceeded him. This wasn't a simple childish assessment from a young man. It was an opinion supported with his experience in actual battle. He had his first live battle experience this year, and he had participated in two more battles after that. He had overwhelmed his foes. After being trained by Chiron, he had faced off against a lot of humans. However, he had never come across one that he considered to be really strong. Even the royal knight, who was called the strongest swordsman, couldn't do much against Saiga. Without realizing it, Segia formed the opinion that humans could be outstanding in terms of techniques, but they won't be able to touch him in terms of overall battle ability. Ah, I don't plan on thanking you with only words on saving my sister. Do you want anything? If you don't have anything particular in mind, I can give you riches as a reward. Him. What if? Could you make it so that I'll be able to enter the palace's library? The royal library. Saiga was puzzled. This was a request he had never expected. Azel spoke. Yes. I want to see the books in there. I would be thankful if I was given full access. That won't be too hard. I'll put in a word. Just in case, I'll ask them to give you an admission pass. Thank you. I'll excuse myself now. This conversation was enjoyable. Please take care on your way back. After receiving his respects from Azel, 
Saiga joined the servants waiting for him outside to leave. Azel mumbled to himself. It seems my stay in the palace will become annoying. Him. His prediction was spot on. Azel placed a hand on his head the next day when he received a mountainous pile of invitations and presents. I. My God. The noble society was always like this. Their main source of amusement was their interest in people and their social life. This was especially true in capital. There were too many of their peers gathered in a single place. This meant cultural and fashion changes happened up to the minute here. If they saw someone eye-catching, the nobles wouldn't leave that person alone. The dragon demon princess had never knighted anyone before him. Moreover, she hadn't required him to take the oath of loyalty. This had surprised everyone. Moreover, they had heard from his travel companions that he had shone brightly when facing the dragon demon king worshippers, who had targeted Arietta. Even the dragon sword duke, who was called the living legend, gave him compliments. On top of that, Sir Varan had gone to escort the princess, and he swore he saw Azel fighting on par with the dragon sword duke in their sparring match. The story started to spread. The nobles were very sensitive to rumors, and their eyes sparkled at the chance to see someone interesting. Of course, the nobles would show interest in Azel. Wow, I envy you. Honora had come to invite Azel to lunch, and her eyes were sparkling. Azel replied in an apathetic manner. What's so good about this? You've become the star of the social circles overnight. Everyone is sending you invitations and presents. As a noble lady, it is a dreamlike scenario. Since I'm not a noble lady, this isn't welcomed. Well, it wasn't as if he hadn't experienced this before. Maybe, that was why he wasn't excited about it. Before he was put to sleep, every noble had shown interest, respect and affection towards him. Even the members of the royal family begged for some face time. They even begged for him to teach them martial arts. Moreover, the presents are a little bit. Do you want this perfume, Muzanora? Amongst the present he received, there were perfumes, scarves and silver jewelries. A lot of them were meant for female use. Honora's eyes sparkled. Are you sure? Well, I don't need these items. Also, if you want anything else here, you can have it. It didn't even cross Azel's mind to return these presents. From the perspective of a normal person, the presents sent along with the invitations were very expensive items. From the perspective of the nobles, it was something they sent out of formality to keep up appearances. If one returned the presents, because of the expensive price tag, it would be considered rude. The only time he would be able to turn down a gift was if the item was more expensive than all of these presents combined. Also, this couldn't be seen as an unnecessary favor. Azel would need clothes befitting the noble society. From the perspective of nobles, they didn't want the person they invite to embarrass themselves by dressing informally. This was why they even sent items for female use. Honora was smiling with joy. Wow, you seem to be a really good person, Sir Azel. By looking at the timing of your words, you make it seem like I was a really bad person in the past. Are you sure about this? If you plan on accepting the invitations, you will need these stuff. If you don't have a female companion to go to these events, I can introduce you to some of my unnies that I know. All the palace maids were of noble birth. This was why they were all eager for a chance to make their debut in high society. Everyone would love for the chance to escort an emerging character in Azel. Azel clicked his tongue. A young lady shouldn't speak such words. I have no interest in them. The palace maids have an appearance standard they have to pass, so they are all beauties. They also know how to carry themselves since they are of noble birth. You still aren't interested, Moza Nora. Are you perhaps trying to sneakily paint yourself as a beauty? Oh my, are you denying it? Moza Nora is more cute than beautiful. If you talk like that, you won't be popular with the women, Sir Azel. Azel couldn't help but laugh when he saw Honora put on a sullen expression. Then he spoke. Anyways, I'm thankful for the offer, but I will have to decline. I'm not planning on accepting any invitations. What? Are you serious? Honora asked as if she couldn't believe what she was hearing. This was a chance of a lifetime for Azel, who had been recently knighted. Even if one was a skilled martial artist, it was hard to advance through the ranks without any background. 
that is why he needed to make his face known to the nobles. It was a precious opportunity where he would be able to build personal connections with those in high society. She was young, but Honora had worked for the throne. She understood how things worked here. She couldn't help but think Azel was being naive on how the world works. Please think about it one more time, Sir Azel. You won't be able to get this kind of opportunity even if you tried in the future. If you don't capitalize on this opportunity, it won't matter how many meritorious deeds you do in the future. You'll end up running around endlessly in a circle. Wow, Muzanora. I'm a little bit impressed right now. What? No, you really sounded like an adult, who had gone through all sorts of hardships. Please be serious when I'm talking about a serious topic. Honora's pouted once again. Azel laughed. It's a compliment. Muzanora is a noble, but you grew up in the country. You are still young, yet you understand how the noble society works in the capital. It's very surprising. Moreover, you've only been a royal maid for less than a year. Muzanora is very smart. Of course, you wouldn't have become the princess personal maid unless you were very smart and perceptive. Geez, you are making me blush with all the praises you are giving me. Azel's list of innocent praises made Honora's face turn red. Azel spoke. I know what you are worried about. However, I don't want to become successful through that method. At the very least, I want some freedom for a while. I don't want to go head first into troublesome businesses. Ha ha ha. Sir Azel is too weird. Well, as a royal maid, Ms. Honora would see it that way. Anyways, hurry up and pick what you want. The princess is probably waiting for us. Soon, Honora had picked a mountainous pile of female items, and she exited Azel's room in delight. Chapter 57. Dragon Demon Prince. Part 4. They were reunited after only a day, but Arietta looked completely different from the appearance Azel had known. She really looked like a princess in her feminine clothes. She had her hair up and was swearing a silver circlet with a gem embedded in it. She wore a white dress with silver and light blue trimmings. She was breathtakingly beautiful. Azel spoke after he stared at her absent-mindedly for a brief moment. I'm surprised. Him? About what? For a brief moment, I thought you were a different person. I didn't realize that this was such an unflattering dress. I suffered through two hours to wear all of this. Arietta tossed a joke toward him. However, the fact that she had suffered through two hours was the absolute truth. Azel queried, Do you always wear those kinds of clothes inside the palace? No way. I've worn more comfortable clothes than the ones I wore on the road. For two hours, I've been the subject of my two maids playing doll. I would never do this every day. It's been a while since His Majesty has asked me to breakfast. Moreover, he'll probably have various people gathered there so I have no choice in this matter. Yesterday, Arietta went through the trouble of dressing up, but her appearance had been an extension of what he saw during the trip. It was an outfit which allowed her to pull out and use her sword at any time. Today Arietta was perfectly dolled up as a lady of the royal family. The maids displayed their skills over two hours, and it wasn't an exaggeration to call the result a work of art. Azel grinned. I guess I'm lucky today. Yes, you are. This isn't something you can see every day. Arietta spoke as she lifted the teacup that had been filled by Honora. After she savored the scent of the tea, she asked her question. So your popularity exploded in just one day? Yes, I have a mountainous pile of invitations. The nobles of the capital have nothing better to do than whisper entertaining rumors. It can't be helped. I bet it's annoying for you. Yes, princess knows me well, unlike Muzanora. What did Honora say? She informed me how the noble society works like an adult. Azel told her what had happened, to which Arietta laughed. I see. Well, if you were someone capable of thinking in such a way, it would have been the right advice. The opportunity to showcase one's ability is quite precious for someone without a background. Honora's advice is correct. Honora's face became red at those words. Arietta enjoyed seeing Honora's expression, but she let out a bitter laugh when she looked at Azel. However, no matter how I look at you, you aren't someone who is driven by promotion of rank. If I was, I would have already given my pledge of loyalty to Princess. Hoo hoo. 
Well, if you want it, I can still give you a pretty decent position. I'll have to decline. That's too bad. Sir I heard you received a recruitment offer from Saiga. Yes, Saiga is greedy about gathering talented people. When he heard about you from me and teacher, I assumed he would go looking for you. Did he bother you much? Not at all. He cleanly backed off after I declined him once. Is that so? How unexpected. Ah, you might receive a similar offer from my teacher soon. He'll try to scout you to the Duchy of Taranto's instead of recruiting you for the throne. Of course, I'll also decline that offer. Of course, you should do that. Or else I'll be very miffed. However, I do plan on visiting the Duchy of Taranto's. Him, Arietta was puzzled. She couldn't fathom why Azel would want to go to the Duchy of Taranto's. Azel spoke. I have to go collect on the bet I won from the Duke. Now that I think about it, you are three wins ahead of him. You'll have to ask for something comparable. What are you going to ask for? I'm guessing it isn't money. I have something in mind. Moreover, that is the reason why I have a favor to ask of you. To me, Arietta tilted her head. After Azel started staying at the palace, spending most of his time at the palace's library, he had a chance to visit a place with so many books. He knew this was a precious opportunity, so he wanted to gather as much information as he could. The palace library held about 6,000 books that he was able to view. It was a huge task to even determine which book to read. There was enough books here to overwhelm his senses. The Nadic Empire's library he had visited before he went to sleep was of a similar size. It was the same now as the time before he went to sleep. The method of printing hadn't progressed much. One had to transcribe all the books by hand. Fortunately, there was a magic that would allow a single person to transcribe and produce several books at a time, but the books didn't really circulate into the public. Even a noble with a passion for books only had several dozen in their collection. This was why he couldn't help but be surprised at seeing 6,000 books in a single place. Moreover, there were over 100,000 books if one counted the books in the forbidden section. Well, these are mostly imperial record. I wouldn't mind seeing the forbidden texts. Most of the forbidden texts were literature that insulted the throne or the gods. From Azul's perspective, he wondered if he could find the information he wanted in those books. Azel received help from the librarian and he found the history books dealing with the era he was interested in. He also read the books regarding the current situation of the continent. This allowed him to clearly find out how the current seven kingdoms divvied up the Nadic Empire's territories. Unfortunately, the Marquisate of Kazakh wasn't in Rulan. It was within a different country. It would have been impossible considering where it was located at. He had already expected this. Unless the Rulan kingdom was much larger than the other countries and held a supremacy over the other countries, the Marquisate of Kazakh was too far away to be included in the Rulan kingdom. Azel decided to stop reading about the current information at that point and focused on the historical side. Poot. Wow. This is amazing. Eventually he ran across records of himself. As the person who had actually experienced the events, he found the stories embarrassing or funny. Normally, after discussing the techniques of the heroes, the history changed depending on the inclination of the historian and the inclination of those in power. There were different interpretations to the events, and the history became distorted. There weren't any negative distortion about Azel. Most of his deeds had been embellished. It was understandable, since he was the legendary hero who had defeated the dragon demon King Atain. Moreover, it was largely influenced by the fact that he hadn't gotten involved in anything after the war. Officially, it was recorded that Azel had suddenly gone into hiding. There were various theories and idle imaginings regarding his disappearance. It wasn't my intention, but my life as a hero transitioned into something of a mystic legend. His walk through life had turned into a legend. Moreover, his end was too mysterious that it evoked the romantic imagination in people. The record of himself was written by strangers. Since they analyzed and imagined their own versions of his life, he was unfamiliar with a lot of the stories. It really made him wonder if this was really about him. As he kept reading the books, the suspicion he held turned into a certainty. Those dragon demon king worshippers are amazing. 
they had manipulated the history from behind the scenes. The record regarding the Dragon Slayer's ritual and Dragon Demon Key was expunged from the records. As a member of the Guardian Shadows who fought the Dragon Demon worshippers, the legendary martial artist Chiron Tarantos had no knowledge about it. This was astounding as he was over a hundred years old. They aren't the ruling power, yet they were able to manipulate the history to this extent. From Azul's perspective, he had no idea how they had done it. If they had conquered the world to publicly use their power and change the history, he would have understood such a result. However, they had done this while hiding in the dark parts of the society. Was it possible to extinguish the knowledge that had been spread across the world? I get their intent. However, the problem is now figuring out how they were able to do this. He could easily guess why they attempted to manipulate the history in this fashion. A human had to go through the Dragon Slayer's ritual to create Dragon Demon Key within oneself. It was a necessary process. This was the only way a human could get strong enough to defeat the Dragon Demon King Atain. At the very least, Azel had earned transcendent power through this method. There had been no one like him. Did the Great Darkness affect the world that much? The Great Darkness made the world go crazy and it created cracks where the Dragon Demon King worshippers could worm in. Maybe this impossible task would have been possible during that time. So what were the Guardian Shadows doing during that time? According to Chiron's explanation, the Dragon Demon King worshippers had to hide from plain sight, even though they possessed great power. They had failed to conquer the world. However, the history had been manipulated and they had succeeded in severing the passage of knowledge. Wasn't that a bit strange? It was hard to accept that the confusion caused by the Great Darkness was the reason for all of this. Him. Azel fell deep within his thoughts. A familiar presence stimulated his senses. If anyone saw you, they would think you were a scholar instead of a martial artist. It was a handsome young man from the Dragon Demon race with long black hair, Chiron. The Royal Library wasn't accessible to anyone. However, no one would stop the Dragon Sword Duke if he said he wanted to read some books. He approached Azel and looked at the opened books. Do you have a lot of interest in history? Oh wow, you are even reading up on a hero with the same name as you. Ha ha ha, I became interested in the Dragon Demon King worshippers. This was the excuse Azel had given. The Dragon Demon worshippers ran at him without a regard for their lives, just because he had the name that was considered to be soaked in sin. I've also looked at the record about the heroes in the Dragon Demon War, but I couldn't take it seriously. There were too many absurd stories. Those who claimed to be historian were all filled with hot air. Please give me an example. What part was unbelievable? Him. For example, Chiron thought for a brief moment at Azul's question before he answered it. I think the account is in one of the books you have opened her. It's the part where they smashed apart the Dragon Demon Army's machination at the Lithia Lake. The famous general of the Dragon Demon Army, Encinder, was known for his meticulous control over his monsters. He was able to make the monsters move like a human army, and he had dealt fatal blows against the human army. Originally, the Lithia Lake was very deep, but Encinder had made a dam upstream to block the water flow. In time, the lake was shallow enough to walk across it. Encinder's troops acted as if they couldn't contend with the humans as they were being pushed back. The human army was baited into the lake. Encinder had broken the dam. He had tried to drown the human force numbered of over 3,000. Chiron couldn't help but laugh. If one uses one's common sense, it's obvious no one should be able to counter this tactic. According to the records, that wasn't the case. What does the records say? The might hero Azel Kazark parted the flood of water coming down on the army with a single cut of his sword. Then the archmage Carlos used his magic to disperse the current, and there were almost no casualties to the troop. Do you think that even makes any sense? Anyone, who heard the story would think the story was groundless. Chiron shook his head from side to side. The Lithia Lake isn't a small lake. If you actually see the Lithia Lake for yourself, you would realize how absurd that story actually is. Azel swallowed the words that had almost popped out at those words. He put on a bitter smile. No, that really happened. If one read it through the records, it sounded absurd. However, 
Azel and Carlos really pulled that off. If he wasn't a person who could do such a task, then he wouldn't have been able to win against the dragon demon king Atane in a fight. At the time, that bastard Encinder had a priceless expression on his face. They had broken the carefully laid out plan using such a ridiculous method. Encinder was a man ruled by logic. However, when his troops were in danger of losing, Encinder's mind broke. In the end, he couldn't run away from Azul's sword and he had died in that place. It had been a critical loss to the Dragon Demon King's army at the time. Chapter 58, Dragon Demon Prince. Part 5. Chiron continued to speak. He probably could never guess what Azel was thinking at that moment. This is why you should skip around half of the records regarding Azel Kazark. He was very popular, and he was considered to be a sacred hero. There are a lot of exaggerations regarding him. Do you perhaps dislike him? Me? Do I dislike Azel Kazark? Yes. No way. I also was a young man, who listened to his legendary exploits, and it made my heart beat faster. However, this makes me want to look at his exploits through strict standards. Even seeing his exploits through such stringent standards, he was really incredible. This kind of blatantly false stories devalues his legacy. These foolish bastards don't understand that. Ah, I understand. I'll take your word to heart. Azel quickly stopped Chiron from speaking any further. If Azel left Chiron alone, he would continue to give endless praise regarding him. The praises was akin to a mental attack. Him. Now that I think about it you do look similar to Azel Kazark. Do I? At the very least, your appearance is similar. There aren't that many portraits left, but his physical characteristics are almost identical as yours. Even your name is quite the coincidence. You even share his name. Wasn't that the last name of Azel, before he was elevated to nobility with the name Kazark? Azel could only let out cold sweat as he listened to Chiron. He hadn't expected Chiron to know all that. In the official records, the last name of Kazark should be the only one recorded. Was my other last name passed down through oral tradition? Azel realized he had been too lackadaisical. It was understandable. When he had woken up, he wasn't planning on coming up with some elaborate story to trick everyone. He had responded to his situation as if everything would eventually work out somehow. Truthfully, if he had told people he awoke from a 200-year sleep, who would believe him? This was why he didn't put too much effort into hiding who he was. Chiron spoke. Your parents probably was well acquainted with the knowledge regarding Azel Kazark. I feel as if they intentionally named you after him. If that's true, your real last name probably isn't Zestringer. That might be true. Him. Fortunately for Azel, Chiron was very practical with his reasoning. It was normal for the people of the world to have several names. Normally, a person had their name and family name. However, there were those who used their blood relative's name as middle name. This was why there were some really long names. For example, Arietta had one too. Officially, Arietta's full name was Arietta Essendria Tiaris Rianda Vile Rulan. When she was born, she was named by the elders of the royal family, and those additional names were just added onto her original name. This was also the reason why Chiron knew the Marquis Karazark's former last name was Zestringer. It also was the reason why he wasn't suspicious of Azul's identity right now. If someone suspected him of waking up from a 220-year sleep just because he had a suspicious background, that person was the abnormal one. Chiron spoke. Did Arietta tell you something unnecessary about me? She asked me whether if I had any interest in taking up a position in the Duchy of Tarantos. She said you will offer me a position. Hoot. Chiron snorted at those words. There was a meaningful pause. Sir Azel tilted his head in puzzlement. Chiron hesitated before he continued to speak. You kicked away a position prepared for you by my pupil. If I give a similar proposal and suffer the same result, I will lose face. I've prepared a more attractive proposal. What's the offer? Chiron started laying out his proposal, and the content was something Azel would have never guessed. Why don't you show me the Dragon Slayer's ritual in my territory? It had been five days since he started staying at the palace. Azel received an invitation from Bor. He was invited to the Marquis Zilred's mansion. 
Chiron had decided to leave with Chiron towards the dukedom of Tarantos, so his days of living at the palace was numbered. This was why he accepted Bor's invitation when he had time. They were on a carriage heading out of the palace, when Bor spoke. You must be very popular inside the palace. Even I heard all the complaints about you not accepting any invitations. If I stacked all the invitations, it would reach the ceiling. I'm an utter stranger, yet they are showing such fervor to meet me. I feel like some rare animal. Azel grumbled. The invitations kept coming in at a rapid pace. On the fourth day, he ordered the maids to gather them into a pile before delivering it to him rather than delivering the individual invitations to him throughout the day. Soon, the carriage reached the Marquis Zilred's villa. When Azel got off the carriage, the building was very large compared to the other luxurious buildings at the heart of the capital. He was a bit impressed by it. The front gate was so far from the villa that one had to ride a carriage to get there. What a stately mansion. It pretty much has everything one needs. It even has a practice yard. Hey, did you perhaps bring me here to spar with me? It is unnecessary. The dragon sword duke comes every day to bother me for that very reason. You really are monopolizing him. I might become jealous. If you were pestered every day by him, you wouldn't be saying that. Azel grumbled. He had a daily sparring session with Chiron at the palace. It really was. It's fun. I can't deny that. Azel was a martial artist by nature, so it was fun to match one's skill against someone of his own caliber. The numerous fights he experienced as he sparred gave him an incredible thrill. The best vacation in the world couldn't compare to this. Bor spoke. Anyways, you don't have to worry about him. He won't bother you today. Let's spend the night away drinking alcohol. I would welcome such an activity. During the trip, he was always on his guard since he had to worry about the presence of enemies. He hadn't been able to drink alcohol to his heart's content, since he awoke in this era. Just the mention of such an activity brightened up his day. When they arrived at the villa, Giles was there. Azel asked him a question. I was wondering where you were when you never returned to the palace. Were you here the whole time? Giles had been staying at the mansion as Bor's guest. When Azel saw Giles's attire, he spoke in a playful manner. Anyways, doesn't these clothes suit you more than your military uniform? You could probably become a popular man in the high society. Don't make fun of me. Giles put on a bitter smile. However, it was as if there wasn't any truth to Azel's words. When he took off his military uniform and armor, he looked like a young noble in his finery. He gave off such a delicate air that it was hard to believe Giles led a dangerous life of an enlisted man. Bor's family wasn't all living in the capital. There was the Marquis Silred, who worked for the crown, and his wife. There was also the second son Rewen, who was a second-rank administrator. At dinner, Bor's parents introduced themselves to Azel, and they showed a lot of interest in him. After sharing food and conversation, Azel and Giles was guided towards Bor's room. Bor was there, and he showcased a high-quality alcohol he had taken out from the cellar. Azel and Giles let out the praise. Bor spoke. It seems my father has a lot of interest in Sir Azel. He was lamenting the fact that he didn't have an unwed daughter he could introduce to you. He was thinking about introducing you to a relative. However, I stopped him by saying you won't make your debut in high society, and you will be leaving soon. So you can't stand seeing me being introduced to a pretty young lady. I'm happy you understood my true intent. Oh right, how come Sir Bor isn't in the marriage talks? At your age, it wouldn't be strange if you were a married man by now. Bor was 26 years old. He was the same age as Azel. As a son of a prestigious noble house, it wouldn't have been strange if he was married with a child on the way. Bor was ill at ease as he talked. Him, lot of things came up. It hasn't been too long, since I've joined the Royal Knights, so I told my parents to wait a little bit. I'm not that well known in the high society as a knight, so you don't want to be introduced to a lady by your elders. You want to look for a nice young lady for yourself. That's exactly it. I had to live through an occupation that was filled with burly men, since I wanted to climb the ladder of success. I want to experience the fragrant flowers the high society has to offer myself. Aha, you haven't even washed dishes before. 
so you shouldn't talk about hardships. Let's stop talking about that story now. Bor laughed during the journey, he had come to realize he had grown up without realizing what the real word was like. After his self-awakening, Bor had changed a lot. Giles queried, so how long do you plan on staying in the palace? I'm not sure. I'll probably leave a day after tomorrow at the soonest. At the latest, it'll be four days. That fast. Giles and Bor was surprised. Azel didn't have any place to go, and Arietta was showing goodwill towards him. They had assumed Azel would stay a bit longer in the palace. Bor spoke. I had heard you were leaving soon. I guess it's true. It's really bothersome to live in the palace. If I stay there any longer, I don't know what annoying work might follow me around. I don't want to even imagine it. I don't want to draw the attention of the throne to me. He could ignore the invitations of the nobles, but he wouldn't be able to turn down an audience from the throne. Since he had no desire to assimilate into the capital's noble society, it would be best for him to disappear before anyone showed too much interest in him. Bor laughed. You really are. You are different from any person I know. In my view, the lack of desire to advance in one station is a problem. Is that so? Maybe I'm saying this, because I was born into a noble family, and I'm working for the throne. Wasn't there an old saying that said a talented hawk hides its talons? It basically means modesty is a virtue. Why are you suddenly bringing up such a saying? It's a saying that shouldn't be followed in the noble society. It wouldn't be a problem if you don't have the ability. However, if you slack off, while having the capability of advancing, then the nobles will ostracize you. If one could use one's talons to further the name of the family, one should do so. This is how they think. This is why my second brother has had such a hard time. He's already a second rank administrator for the throne at a such a young age. Did he used to play around? He was very smart even when he was little, and he loved to play around. Father had to force him to gain experience by dumping work on him. Then he made my brother take the test to qualify for the administrator position. This caused a lot of hardship for me. My parents were very strict on me saying I shouldn't turn out like my older brother. I see. Bohr had the talent to become a quadruple master at a young age, but it seemed a lot of effort had been made to support him. His parents wanted him to maximize his potential for the family, and Bohr had tried hard to fulfill that expectation. There was a side of him that was like a naive young noble, but he had trained himself in earnest as a martial artist. Promotion. Honora and now Bohr was bring up such a topic, and it suddenly made him think about his past. It would be hard to imagine it by looking at the current Azel, but he had thirsted for advancement during the Dragon Demon War. There were two reasons behind this desire. First, he was merely a lowly mercenary, and he was angry that no one acknowledged his accomplishments. He had accomplished many deeds that was worth merit, but the nobles and knights claimed his meritorious deeds as their own. It deeply angered him. He had fought and fought in this unreasonable system. He fought until he was promoted. He became a knight, and he made personal connections that would shore up his background. He survived and fought through impossible situations, and his reputation spread far and wide. No one dared to cross him any more. The discontent he had in the past disappeared, but the desire to advance in rank consumed him as he kept fighting. The reason was simple. These bastards are unworthy. I have to seize a station of power. The sense of crisis continued. He felt helpless at the sight of his superiors, who were incompetent. He had to constantly risk his life, because of their incompetence. Moreover, the people with noble spirits were dying because of them. There were even those who had made traps to get rid of Azel, since he was advancing at a blinding speed through meritorious deeds. They tried to kill him even when it was a situation where the human race couldn't afford to fight with each other. Who? Azel laughed as he thought about his past. It was all an affair of a bygone age. He didn't have the burning desire to want to stand above others. He didn't have any reasons to do so. Chapter 59, Dragon Demon Prince. Part 6. Still, there might come a day when I might have to do it again. After consecutive battles with the dragon demon followers, the sense of foreboding was getting stronger. He had a premonition that the great darkness might descend on this peaceful era once again. 
Bohr asked a question. So where do you plan on going after leaving the capital, Sir Azel? For now I've decided to travel with the Duke. That's why I have to leave so soon. I have to match the Duke's schedule. Ah, the Duke is heading back. He hates the palace life more than me. Chiron hated making public appearances. It was a dislike that had been developed from his younger days. However, he was too important of a figure. Once people heard the news that he was in the capital, everyone made a big fuss in trying to see him. Even the royal family acted the same way, so Chiron had no choice but to be dragged every which way. It was normal for Chiron to drop by to spa and complain to Azel. Giles spoke. I envy you. I have a half a year vacation, but I have no idea what I'm going to do in the meantime. The western border guards are quite generous. They gave you a half a year vacation. Bohr interrupted the conversation with his words. Well, Sir Giles was chosen as the representative of the western border guards, and he was in charge of guarding the princess. Moreover, they probably wanted to give him a chance to visit his homeland. Wouldn't his family be happy if he suddenly dropped by after being gone for a while? In theory, yes. Giles's expression darkened after giving that answer. Bohr was taken aback, and he asked Giles a question. Ah, did I perhaps say something wrong? No, it isn't anything like that. Have I ever told you about my household before? You never did. There isn't much to say. Our family of the Viscount Vince isn't in a good situation right now. As if Giles was embarrassed, his face became a little bit red as he explained his situation. The Viscount Vince was a family in turmoil even though they held the position of Viscount. They were a noble family located in the countryside, so the family had been well off. However, the family started to decline in wealth during the time of Giles's grandfather. Giles' grandfather was a bit out of touch with reality, and he squandered away the family fortune through gambling. Then a famine had come and the monsters started to cause trouble in his territory. His grandfather couldn't deal with the problems, so in a flash, the family's fortune had nosedived. In the end, they had to sell most of their lands in the province. Basically, their province only consisted of a small town now. From the time I was young, my father kept drilling into me that I would have to go out into the world to build up the family name once again. Before he even hit puberty, a sword was put into Giles's hand. He swung it until several dozen blisters formed on his hands. His father had seen Giles's grandfather run the family into the ground, so he reared Giles with an extremely strict attitude. Giles had become a quadruple master at such a young age, because he had spent such harsh childhood. However, my family had fallen as far as it could, so what power did we have? Even if his house had fallen on tough times, he was still an offspring of a noble family. This was why he had the rights to become a knight. However, that was the end of the road. He didn't have any personal connections, since his irresponsible grandfather had severed all those connections. He had to gain experience, but he couldn't choose where he wanted to enter. After he thought hard on it, he decided to enter the kingdom's army. Since he didn't have the background to succeed, he had no choice but to earn it with his own hands. It's funny, but when I entered the army, it felt as if I could breathe once again. Do you know about observing the military discipline? It felt like a vacation compared to what I got at home. Giles's father required Giles to be the ideal noble. From an early age, he was put through a hell-like training regiment. He was required to learn martial arts, and etiquette. He even had to accumulate knowledge. He was trained, so he wouldn't embarrass the family no matter where he went. The royal army felt like heaven compared to his house. When he heard the story, Bohr let out a mumble as if he was letting out a groan. I never knew you had such circumstances. It was completely opposite of how Bohr was brought up. From the time he was young, he had victory after victory because of the power of his family. Bohr realized how advantageous his upbringing had been. I'm thankful to the princess. With my unremarkable background, I would have needed a very long time to build up my career in the Western Border Guards. I might have rotted there my whole life. As the representative of the Western Border Guard, he had been successful in completing his mission of accompanying Arietta to the capital. He even received praise from the king. Basically, 
he had done a meritorious deed that would be acknowledged in most circles. Bohr poured alcohol into Giles's cup. Drink up. You've sewed the most difficult first button now. From now on, I'm sure your fortunes will improve. The dragon demon princess remembers you now. I'm sure you will receive a good opportunity in the future. Thank you. Giles laughed in an embarrassed manner. The night deepened as they drank the alcohol. Bohr was heading towards the palace for work. Sir Azel followed after him the next day. He had drank a lot of alcohol late into the night, so he was basically half dead when he awoke the next day. Goo goo gook. I guess I have a hangover. It's been a really long time since I felt this pain. Bohr, who was riding in the same carriage, laughed. I'm actually marveling at this situation. Why? I'm surprised there is something you are weaker at than me. I thought you would be strong against the alcohol. I think I used to be strong against it. Well, my memory is a bit fuzzy on that topic. I'll just have to be careful from now on. Ooh. In Azul's prime, he never suffered from the effect of the alcohol. No matter how much he drank he would only get a small buzz. He never became drunk, and he never suffered from a hangover. The reason being his body had been too sturdy after going through the Dragon Slayer's ritual. He thought about those times as he continuously guzzled down the alcohol. However, he had become much weaker against alcohol than before. This caused his tongue to be tied into a knot, and his eyes started to close. He had experienced something new as he started talking nonsense. Fortunately, he hadn't blacked out. I should have used that technique early on. There was a spirit order one could apply to protect one's mind and body from the alcohol or any other drugs. When Azel realized he was quite drunk, he used the technique to avoid passing out. However, it had been too late to avoid the hangover. Ooh, I never realized how torturous it is to ride a carriage. This road has been serviced not too long ago. How can you say that? If we were on a dirt road, you probably would have thrown up by now. Bohr looked fine, since he didn't have any hangover at all. He enjoyed feeling the sense of superiority, and he continued to make fun of Azel. When Azel returned to the palace, he had went into meditation to try to escape his hangover. He wanted to use spirit order to expel the remnants of the alcohol out of his body. However, his head was spinning and throbbing even though he was standing still. It made him want to throw up, so it was very hard to fall in a meditative state. I can do it. I've bled from being cut by swords, so why shouldn't I be able to work through this? Azel gritted his teeth, and he focused his mind. However, it was harder to fall into a meditative state right now. It was harder than the time he had been stabbed and blood was pouring out of him. The progress was slow. Ooh ah, you smell like alcohol. Honora, who came to find Azel, blocked her nose as she furrowed her brows. Geez, how much alcohol did you pour into yourself that the smell of alcohol is this bad? Him, Azel, who had barely been able to enter a meditative state, let out a bitter laugh as he opened his eyes. His surrounding was most definitely thick with the smell of alcohol. It wasn't the smell of someone who had been drinking alcohol. It smelled as if he had sprayed alcohol all over the surrounding. I expelled the alcohol that had accumulated within my body. I feel a little bit like a living person now. You can do such a thing. Yes. I'll have to wash first. Is there some urgent business I need to know about? Not at all. Also, you'll be put in an awkward situation if you don't wash yourself. Hurry up and come back after you wash yourself. Honora pushed Azel's back, and she exited the alcohol-smelling room as if she was running away. After a wash, Azel came back looking somewhat tidy. However, his condition was still not too good. Ah ooh, it seems I'm going to lose today. Azel frowned when he thought about Chiron, who will surely look to spar Azel today. Honora spoke. The princess wants to have dinner with you tonight. Since Sir Azel is leaving soon, she would like to see you before you leave. All right, I'll have to recover until dinner time, so I could be passed as being normal. Ah, also, Moza Nora, a question suddenly popped up in my head. Do you mind if I ask you a question? What is it? It is about the conversation you had with the princess before we left the Western border guards. Honora tilted her head in puzzlement. It seemed she had no clue what he was talking about. 
Azel let out a bitter laugh as he asked the question. Didn't you argue with the princess that your prospect of marriage would be ruined if you couldn't follow after the princess? I didn't argue with her. How can I dare? Anyway, I don't know why that was relevant reason for you to travel with us. I think the princess felt the same way. It's common in my homeland. Ha! Huh, if a member of the noble family can't even carry out a single task given to her, then she would be told she wasn't qualified to be married. It was such a trivial reason. Trivial, you shouldn't speak so lightly about it, Sir Azel. It is a very important issue. Him. Still, Muzanora is still very young. Azel was speaking when he saw Anora's eyes draw down like a hatchet. He quickly changed his words mid-sentence. But you're a young woman at a blooming age. You shouldn't take on such a risk for that reason alone. But it's the same for the princess. Ha! Huh, the princess was born into the role of the dragon demon princess and it is the main reason why she has to put her life on the line to fight unlike the other royalties. I hadn't thought that highly of the princess when I first became her maid. Now I think the princess is an amazing person now that I've traveled with her. When she had been assigned as the personal maid of the famous dragon demon princess, Honora had been disappointed after seeing her. Arietta was dumbfoundingly beautiful, yet she was a sleepyhead. Moreover, she was too relaxed within the palace. However, when she saw Arietta fight on the battlefield to fulfill her own duty, Honora's view of the world went into a violent upheaval. There is a saying that my father always repeats. The nobles are treated with respect, because they are the first ones to put their lives on the line when tribulation erupts. It's their duty. The barony of Bear was located in the countryside, and her family didn't own many troops. Of course, Baron Bear and the men of the family led the charge when a threat appeared on their lands. People respected the Bear family, and it was a point of pride amongst their family. Arietta resembled the men of Honora's family. Arietta was young, yet she didn't complain when she was thrust into dangerous situations. She didn't resent the burden she had been born with. She didn't despair about her situation, and she used her power for others. Honora was impressed by her noble character. This is why I don't want to run away. Princess is fighting so hard, yet it would be very sad if there's no one by her side to even brush her hair. How sad would it be if everyone ran away from her side? Ha! Azel stared blankly at Honora for a brief moment. Ha ha ha! He couldn't help it as his laughter burst forward. As if she was embarrassed, Honora's face was blushing. I, I'm talking about a serious subject yet you are laughing at it. How rude. However, Azel's laughter wouldn't end. He was laughing so hard that tears started to well in his eyes. Honora let out her anger as she looked at Azel, who had been barely able to stop himself from laughing. You were so twisted, Sir Azel. Ah, I'm sorry. I had no intention of laughing at you. At least, say it like you mean it. I'm being honest. It reminded me of a memory from the past. Azel had a faraway look in his eyes, and he put on an empty smile. There was a child, who had spoken similar words to me. Arjushi is bleeding to save everyone. If there's no one to wipe Arjushi's face, it would be very sad. At the time, everyone ran away, since they wanted to save their own lives. When despair came to him, someone had stayed by Azel's side. She had spoken those words to him. Everyone had shunned the child for being unlucky, but the girl's words had saved Azel. If he thought about it, the girl had been a bit younger than Honora. She didn't have parents, so she had lived day to day by wandering around. However, she had a quality that made her shine brilliantly. It had been like that during that era. The darkness that covered the world was so thick that when one found someone that shone, it amplified their brilliance. For a brief moment, he was lost in his memories. Honora asked Azel a question. What happened to that child? She found a place to live. I don't know what happened to her afterwards. The girl was being shunned by the people, so Azel found her a place to live. He had never seen her afterwards, but he wanted to believe she had lived a happy life. Honora pouted as she spoke. Hong, I'll forgive, because of your story. Thank you for your generosity. If you don't speak, you might actually be lovable. Honora's lips curled. Chapter 60. Dragon Demon Prince. Part 7. 
He wanted his body to return as close to normal by tonight, but it wasn't progressing as he expected. It was always easier to ruin one's body. Recovery was always much more harder. Moreover, it was much harder, because there was someone interfering with it. As Azel had predicted, Chiron had come looking for him. Chiron immediately realized what kind of state Azel was in, so he didn't want to miss out on this opportunity. He insisted on a spa, and he won. Moreover, when both of them went to dinner with Arietta, Chiron was acting giddy. Azel hated seeing such a sight, so he spoke some words to Chiron. You feel good about winning against a sick person. Sick? Where's this sick person you are talking about? Are you perhaps calling a hangover a sickness? Er, uh, Azel made a resolve to get his revenge tomorrow. Arietta spoke. Even the great Sir Azel can't win against a hangover. I have nothing to say. That reminds me. I guess you weren't able to make it happen. Chiron let out a bitter smile at those words. Unfortunately, it turned out like this. Saiga is a bit busy. He's heading out towards a battlefield in four days, so it was inevitable. Moreover, Sir Azel is in this state, so I thought it would be better not to push too hard to make it happen. What are you talking about? Azel was confused, so he asked the question. Chiron started to give an explanation. Him. I wanted you to fight Saiga before you leave the palace. With the prince? Yes. However, Saiga's schedule is too busy. We'll look for another opportunity at a later date. You weren't even going to ask me if I wanted to. If I suggested it and Saiga agreed to it, do you really think you could refuse me? Well, I guess not. Since you already know this, what's the problem? Geez, you are a bit too much. Still, it is rare to see you turn down a fight. I thought you would want to have a go with Saiga. I really don't want to draw any more attention to myself from highly placed people. You said the prince covets talented people. This has a chance to turn into an annoying affair. That is the reason why I want you to fight him. What? Saiga looks down on humans. It had been a while since Saiga had met his teacher. This was why he told his teacher all the stuff that had been weighing on his mind. From his words, Chiron discerned that Saiga was overestimating his own abilities, and he also picked up that Saiga was dismissive of humans. Him. You are saying he is a bit extreme in his views. He considers humans to be weak. I think so, but it's a bit more nuanced than that. He knows humans are an existence that could fill his shortage of competent help. This is why he is looking for talented individuals. However, basically, he thinks no matter how great a human is, the human would still be weaker than him. Even Arietta and I acknowledge the child's excellence in terms of martial arts. Since one of you is a dragon demon and the other is a dragon magian, I can see why he would think that. However, isn't there a lot of people with sufficient skills in the Royal Knights? There are some useful people. However, if we limit the selection to human knights, there's no one who could beat Saiga. Is that so? Azel was a bit surprised. He was well aware of Arietta's skills. When he met Saiga, he could tell his dragon demon magic was on the same level as Arietta. However, he was young and he lacked real battle experiences, so Azel assumed he would be less skilled than her. So does this mean there aren't any knights that are stronger than the princess? He could guess the quality of the knights in this era by the information given by Giles and Bohr. Still, it was quite shocking to him. There should be a lot of veterans amongst the royal knights, and there would be those, who made their name through their martial arts. How far has the standards fallen? Or was it only the Rulin Kingdom's knights that was weak? Arietta was most definitely strong. However, during the Dragon Demon War, there were plenty of Spirit Order practitioners, who had been stronger than her. Chiron spoke to Azel, who was lost in his thoughts. This is why I have to break that line of thought before it settles into his mind. Dragon demon worshippers might take a shot at him. He might suffer a great loss if he didn't take them seriously just because his opponents were humans. However, this isn't something I can do. How about the knights under you? It isn't as if there isn't someone who could fulfill that role. However, I wouldn't be able to call Saiga to my lands without a special reason. I also don't want to ask a knight to abandon all his work to travel to the faraway capital just to spar with a child. 
I guess the knights of the dukedom of Tranatos is more skilled than the royal knights. I trained them myself. Isn't the answer obvious? Ah, uh, yes. Azel wasn't surprised at all at Chiron's shameless answer. Chiron snorted. Well, you can go judge their skills for yourself later. Anyways, that was the reason why I wanted you to spar with him. Unfortunately, the opportunity never presented itself. Him. Aside from the royal knights. What's the standard of knights in the entire kingdom? There are a good amount of skilled fighters. Aside from the knights in my territory, there are a lot of those, who are loyal to their territory. They aren't associated with the throne, since they aren't trying to advance their career. I see, there are some talented people on my lands that you might find interesting. You should look forward to it. It really does fill me with anticipation. Azel was expressing his true feeling. After he woke up up from his sleep, he had been constantly disappointed by the human spirit order practitioners he had met. He wanted to meet proper practitioners. Arietta let out a bitter laugh. If I had it my way, I would like to be trained by teacher once again. It is too bad I don't have the time anymore. It sounds as if you are blaming for my short stay in the palace. That's exactly it. Since you're already here, I wouldn't mind if you stayed here for a long period of time. It would be great if you could guide me. I don't want to. Do you realize how many people bother me just for the chance to speak to me? It'll be hard for me to train you properly in this environment. When Saiga starts getting serious about his activities, you guys can alternate getting some time off. You can come when that happens. If that could happen, it would be great. Arietta let out a sigh. As the dragon demon princess, her freedom was much more restricted than the members of the other royal families. The recent event made her realize the need to get stronger, but it wasn't something that could be solved in a short amount of time. She needed a teacher like Chiron to guide her, yet he was saying such words. Arietta didn't know this, but Chiron wasn't living a life of leisure. It was rumored that he didn't leave his territory often, but he actually traveled around various parts of the kingdom on guardian shadow business. Chiron spoke. Anyways, you should learn a little from Saiga. It isn't guaranteed that the dragon demon worshippers won't try to kidnap you again. You have to increase the number of your subordinates. I've been thinking about it. However, Sir Azel kicked my proposal away, so it's very unfortunate. I'm really sorry about that. Next time try saying that with a straight face. Arietta snorted. Until recently, Arietta hadn't thought about gathering troops directly under her. If she, the dragon princess, was kidnapped by the dragon demon worshippers, just because she was worried about others sacrificing their lives for her, then it would basically be putting the cart before the horse. This was why Arietta had a change of heart. Chiron spoke. I can't always be here. I'll send you some useful men from my domain. I have plenty of guys, who are ambitious. Those kinds of considerations will be accepted by me with thanks. It is hard to gather people here. As it had been expressed by Saiga when he met with Azel, it wasn't easy to gather talented people in the capital. The fact that Chiron would be sending useful people was a huge help to Arietta. Suddenly, Azel spoke. Isn't there someone close to the princess that fits the description? Him. There's someone like that. It's Sir Giles. Who? Arietta's eyes twinkled. Azel spoke. It'll be hard to get someone employed by the throne. However, Sir Giles is affiliated with the Western Border Guards, and I don't think there will be much pushback if you ask for him. Also, Sir Giles has been part of the Western Border Guard for a short amount of time. Him. I see. It's something worth following up on. What's your personal opinion on this? If Princess gives him the offer, he'll jump right over. Azel gave a short summary about Giles's family situation. Arietta nodded her head. Now that I know his situation I cannot overlook this matter. I'll give him an offer tomorrow. Thank you. Also, Duke Nim. Him. Can we delay our departure from the capital for four days? Why so suddenly? I have something I have to do now. Azel laughed as he spoke. Once Arietta made a decision she unhesitatingly went forward with her business. On the next day, Giles was called to the palace, and he was given the offer. He accepted the offer, and he gave his allegiance to the princess. Giles was struck dumb as he arrived at Azel's quarters. What just happened? 
He had just finished taking the Pledge of Loyalty to Arietta, but it didn't feel real to Giles. Everything felt like a dream, and he was worried about losing everything if he awoke from his nap. Azel spoke. What do you think happened? Everything worked out well. Sir Azel, you don't have to worry about the aftermath. She is going to give enough supplies to the Western border guards, so they'll be properly compensated. She'll give you a good salary, and you'll even be provided with a house in the capital. You'll have to be fitted with armor and uniforms befitting your new job. Him. I have no idea what I should say. First, I can only give my thanks to you. Giles lowered his head. Since he had traveled with Arietta, he had hoped to gain something out of it. Basically, he wanted to be noticed by someone in a high position. However, he never imagined everything would turn out so smoothly. Azel grinned. I spoke to her since I was at the right place. If the princess hadn't witnessed your prowess during the trip, this wouldn't have gone as smoothly. Therefore, you don't have to thank me. Azel raised his sword, and he flicked a finger against it. The blade rang out in a clear note. As I've said before, I'm going to leave here soon. Before I leave, I have something I want to accomplish, so I called you here. You said you wanted to borrow me for four days. That's what I heard. What's going on? I want to teach you something. You want to teach me? You are quite outstanding as a martial artist, Sir Giles. You were able to become a quadruple master at your age, and that is an amazing achievement. Moreover, you have excellent mastery over your abilities. However, after he watched Azel speak, Giles suddenly felt a suffocating feeling. What is it? Azel was starting to look much more bigger. It was as if he was shrinking away from a powerful enemy. Azel's presence dominated his sight, and Giles could hear nothing except Azel's voice. Before he knew it, his body shrank in on itself, and he was breathing hard. You don't know the essence of the spirit order. This is a problem. In the future, the danger faced by the princess may be much more sinister. Giles was half submerged in a state of panic. Azel's intricate mental wave was causing confusion to Giles's senses. In the next moment, the confusion disappeared as if water was flowing out at low tide. Giles's sense became less restricted. Giles spat out a false breath. Chapter 61. Dragon Demon Prince. Part 8. The essence of spirit order is in controlling the mind. I think the dragon demon worshippers called it the secret arts. You have to learn that. If you don't, you won't be able to stand up against them. Once he decided to leave Giles next to Arietta, Azel decided to teach him the secret arts he had accumulated over the years. The threat from the dragon demon worshippers wasn't over. Maybe the reason why he was awoken in this era was to once again prepare the world to face the great darkness. If that was true, then he needed comrades that will be capable of fighting against that darkness. Spirit order prioritizes the training of one's minds. Do you know why? If one doesn't train the mind into not thinking like how a normal person's mind operates, one won't be able to be cognizant of the magical energy. If one can't even register the presence of magical energy, one won't be able to use it. Basically, if one wanted to possess magical sense, one had to train the mind first. That was his answer. Azel shook his head from side to side after hearing Giles's answer. No, that is one of the answer, but it isn't a complete answer. Then what is it, Sir Giles? We aren't like the dragon demon race. We weren't born with fast movements nor can we exhibit incredible strength. Him, spirit order practitioners are supermen. This is why we are able to reach a state that can't be reached just by training the body. Azel and Giles moved like lightning in the eyes of normal people. They wore heavy armor, but they could take out a normal person before he could react or even become aware of their presence. Usually, a human's senses increases as one trains one's body. However, there is a clear limit one reaches. One can overcome this limit and obtain power through spirit order. However, we'll become too fast, and too strong. Our senses won't be able to keep up. The training of the mind was a preparation made to ready oneself for becoming a superhuman. One needed senses that could detect much faster than a normal human, and the incoming information had to be processed at high speeds. One needed to think at the speed of light to be able to properly use a superhuman body. 
If you don't have that basic foundation, you won't be able to use the ability you will learn later. It would be considered fortunate if you don't perish from being unable to control your abilities. In other words, a fast horse of great pedigree is the best mount for an experienced rider. For people who aren't expert riders, they won't be able to handle the fast and out of control horse. I've never thought about it from that perspective. Of course, you have to think about such things. You have to train your mind first to develop your magical senses. Once your body grows beyond the limit of a normal person, you won't have to worry about your mind not being able to keep up. However, you have to keep this in mind. Spirit order isn't something inherent to humans. It is a method that was developed using other techniques that dealt with controlling the senses. What do you mean by that? Humans aren't a race that can intuitively control their senses. Breathing and feeling is done instinctively, yet it can be trained. One could learn about how to utilize the senses and how to focus, but that is only scratching the surface. While training the mind, one has to find out the structure and principle behind the senses. Only then will you be able to use it in unimaginable ways. Moreover, through this exploration, one can also find out how to use the opponent's senses against them. For example, Azel could freely control his eyesight. Even if he had his eyes open, he could make it so that his eyes saw nothing. He could also eliminate certain colors from his vision. In darkness, he could ignore the darkness and light to see the contour of an object. Giles was confused. Is such a thing possible? Giles could control his senses. However, he couldn't set various conditions like Azel. He could either slow, quicken or focus his senses. Normal people could do what he could do to a lesser extent. He was able to do it more freely. Azel spoke. When I saw you and Sir Bore, it was quite shocking to see that you didn't know such basic truths, even though both of you are spirit order practitioners. Since you don't know such obvious truths, you won't be able to properly use your power. Look here, Sir Giles. Let's us first try to move our body without using our muscles. Is it like trying to move an item that has fallen off one's body? That's right. It is like manipulating a marionette. However, instead of an outside force making you move, you will need to be able to control everything from the inside. Your first step is to do this only through your mind. Azel spoke. Giles was wondering if such thing were possible. Azel explained further as if he was trying to hammer out the doubt out of him. Don't be suspicious. If you accept in your heart that what I'm teaching is impossible, then you will forever be surprised by what I can do. Him. All right. The light inside Giles's eyes changed. He had seen what Azel could do. If these were the core teachings of the spirit order, there was no reason why he couldn't learn how to do it. Four days is too short to teach you any advanced techniques. However, I can teach you the essential points. The progress your mind can make is all up to you. There wasn't much he could teach in four days. However, Giles had a very firm foundation. Azel would teach him the theories that had been erased in the past 200 years. It would give Giles a base he could build on. Giles asked a question. Sir Azel, what is your identity? Unfortunately, I can't answer that yet. However, I will tell you some day. Azel smiled as he spoke. He had a dream. It was about the distant past. He dreamed of a time when everyone was in a state of despair. As a mercenary in the Dragon Demon War, he traveled around various lands to fight the Dragon Demon Army. Azel had given up hope when he saw the state of the world. No matter how many times he swung his sword, or rescued people nothing really changed. He couldn't do it himself. He had to climb up to a position where he would be able to move a lot of people. If so, he needed to become a knight. After he learned everything he could from his second teacher Balf, his skills was nothing to be embarrassed about. The road to becoming a knight was wide considering his level of skill. However, another obstacle was waiting for him after he became a knight. As a low-ranking knight, he had to fight where he was ordered to fight. The harsh reality of this calamity was almost on top of people, yet the human organizations were continuously run in an irrational manner. What truly made Azel suffer was the fact that people's hearts were diseased. The humans were starting to get together to resist the great darkness called the Dragon Demon King. However, 
Not all humans were filled with noble sentiments as the people unified. The lives. No. Future of the race was being threatened yet humans weren't able to shake the darkness within their hearts. If that wasn't true, Azel wouldn't be in this situation. This castle held a significant tactical importance. The castle was built at a geologically advantageous location, so a small force could effectively defend against enemy forces. If this place fell, the enemies could easily access the heart of the Lord's land. It would be a much easier to advance if this castle fell. This was why if the lord of this region had his head on straight, he would invest a lot of soldiers and supplies here. Unfortunately, the lord refused to make the logical choice. When a castle owned by a relative fell, the lord recalled most of his troops in fear to protect himself. Of course, once the soldiers retreated out of the region, the place was exposed to the enemies. The people living in this region were about to be slaughtered, but the lord only cared about his own safety. What a trash lord. The moon was shining brightly in the night. Azel was leaning against the rail of the castle wall as he looked at the people evacuating. He cursed the lord. When the lord's order arrived, 80% of the troops defending the castle left. Those left behind, including Azel, were soldiers, who had ignored the lord's orders. The small number of soldiers stayed behind to buy time, so the people could run away. The people were busy running away with their possessions on their back as if their heels were on fire. None of the people volunteered to stay behind to sacrifice themselves. Azel, who was trying to protect these people, really felt bitter inside. However, what made him feel more bitter was. People were discriminating fellow humans even in such a situation. Aren't you going to run away, Arjushi? The one, who asked the question, was a dirty little girl. At a glance, one could tell she was a street rat. Azel spoke as he saw the people exit through the castle wall. Even if one views other people as trash, someone has to do what's right. Wah! Arjushi speaks in fancy words. People might think you are a noble. I'm a low-ranking knight, so that means I am a noble. Also, stop calling me Arjushi. Azel grumbled. Azel had just turned 20, and he was just entering his prime. He hadn't shaved or washed for several days, so he just didn't look the part. You should go. No. I'll watch Arjushi fight here. Then you might die. I'm staying behind so children like you may survive. How would I feel if you do stayed? If Arjushi didn't save me, I would have already been dead. So it's okay. Anyways, if I do go, they'll just tell me I'm cursed again. This girl had been labeled as a cursed child and she was treated with contempt. The child possessed abilities that made other people afraid of her. However, the incidents weren't anything nefarious. When the child got mad, objects moved on its own. There were times when a fire started where she stayed or someone nearby got sick. Any sane and knowledgeable person shouldn't be afraid of this child. This happened often with people, who were born with magic. However, once a negative image was associated with the child, Every bad thing that happened was blamed on the child. One could tell this was what had happened. As despair washed over the people, they needed someone they could abuse. They blamed everything on the child, and they funneled their hate and fear onto the child. Azel had rescued the child from being killed by the people, who was filled with madness. You aren't cursed, little kid. How do you know? I know. You were just born with a bit of a unique physical constitution. You might be able to become a good magician one day. That is why you shouldn't care about what other people say about you. You have to live. You should value your life more. But, Azel could no longer listen to the child's words. The dragon demon army was here. Hurry up and run away. Azel stroked the child's head then he ran across the castle wall. From that point on, the remaining troop fought a long battle. They showed great fighting spirit as they were ready to throw away their lives. The soldiers fought as they overcame the numerical disadvantage, and a mountain of corpses was starting to form. Seven hours had passed. From the distance, the sun started to rise, and the surroundings started to brighten. The dragon demon army was mostly composed of nocturnal monsters, so they pulled back. The soldiers, who barely survived, got ready to retreat. Azel was one of the survivors. In the darkness of the night, 
He had cut down his enemies like an evil spirit, and now he was tired. The numerical disadvantage was so vast that random cuts from enemies had injured him. If he wasn't a high-level spirit order practitioner, he would have died from the loss of blood. It felt as if he was about to fall over, but he dragged his body off the castle wall. A person approached him. Despite the continuous battle throughout the night, the female child hadn't left this place. You, why didn't you leave? When Azel asked the question, the child brought out water she had acquired from somewhere. She started laughing as she wiped the blood off Azel's face with a clean cloth. Arjushi is bleeding to save everyone. If there's no one to wipe Arjushi's face, it would be very sad. Azel absent-mindedly stared at the child for a moment. It hadn't happened when he was fighting in a hopeless situation, but now he felt tears well up in his eyes. He was barely able to push down his emotions. Azel discreetly avoided her gaze as he mumbled. I told you I'm not an Arjushi. Chapter 62. Those who follow the prophecy. Part 1. The plane of darkness was located north of the continent. There was a magical barrier placed there that prevented humans from getting close. Even in the past, it was place of brutal coldness. There were dragons who weren't friendly to humans that lived here. The place was overflowing with monsters. On top of that, after the dragon demon king worshippers were defeated by the humans, they had also settled in the plains of darkness. Everyone knew this location was the nexus of evil yet no one was able to mount an attack against this place. For the dragon demon worshippers, this place was basically their holy land. Niberus had returned to such a place. This place. Regina couldn't help but feel surprised after she arrived at the field of darkness. She had gone through the process of coming to the, the northern end of the continent. It was a place where human feet had never treaded. It was completely different from what she had imagined. If they had traveled here by normal means, they would have had to travel an incredibly long and treacherous road from the Rulan Kingdom to this place. However, they were able to significantly cut down on the travel time. So this place is the Plain of Darkness. Regina's emotional eyes took in the surrounding. There was a circular structure made out of metal behind her. It was decorated with magical adornments. The circular structure was slowly rotating, filled with darkness that made it look like a bottomless pit. This was a great magical artifact left behind by the dragon demon king Atain. It was called, the Road of Emptiness. They had used this to jump several thousand kilometers in an instant. It was an artifact no one in this era could replicate. It was the reason why the beings that called the Field of Darkness their base was able to travel to various places on the continent. It was their secret. Niberus spoke. Think of this as an honor. Usually, a minor being like you isn't allowed on this land. Yes. Regina looked around her surrounding. There was a majestic castle made out of cold bricks in front of her. During the Dragon Demon War, it was a place built by the Dragon Demon King as a fallback position. It was secret base named the Dragon Demon Castle. It had been over 200 years since it was built, but it was still in perfect shape. When Niberus and Regina exited the room where the Road of Emptiness was installed, someone was blocking their path. You've returned safely, Niberus. He was a young man of the dragon demon race with gorgeous blonde hair. His two horns curved backwards. It looked as if his horns had been carved out of ice, and the color had been seeped in afterwards. The dark green color of the horns was the same as his eyes. Also, a bright gem on the back of his hand was letting out light. The dragon demon stone also held the same color as his eyes. Niberus looked at him with cold eyes. You worried over nothing. Did you perhaps think I would be killed by the enemy? No. I just. My intentions are pure. I was just worried about you. I heard this mission was very dangerous. Kieran. I thought you received the same mission as me. How did it go on your end? My target wasn't a member of the royal family. Whatever. Him. So. I did succeed. The youth of the dragon demon race called Kieran avoided her gaze as he spoke. Niberus' endlessly cold attitude made the young man uncomfortable. His answer made Niberus' eyes grow colder. I guess I should congratulate you. Could you get out of my way now? Unlike a talented man like you, I am incompetent. I have to tell the queen of my failure. Niberus. 
Get out of my way. Him. All right. I know you are tired. I'm sorry for bothering you right after you've returned. Kieran got out of the way as he felt sorry for himself. Nibiru's cold attitude brushed by him. Regina peeked a glance at him, then followed after Nibiru's. What's the relationship between those two? The organizations of the Dragon Demon King worshippers were moving all the time, so Regina didn't know much about her superiors. The Plane of Darkness was bestowed as a holy land by Dragon Demon King Atane, and everyone who lived here ruled at the top of the organizations. They were the backbone of the Dragon Demon worshippers. Regina only knew Nibiris was an important person from the Plane of Darkness. She had no further information regarding her. Regina wondered what kind of power structure existed here. Regina, Nibiris, who had been in front of her, called out her name. Regina instantly broke out of her thoughts and she answered Nibiris. Yes, follow this servant to my accommodation, and stay there. Nibiris had already called for a servant. He looked like a normal servant from a noble's household. Regina looked at the human servant and she was shocked once again. What is Miss going to do? I'll have to go see my grandmother. I'll be back by dinner. If I'm going to be late, I'll send you a message. Understood. When Nibiris walked to the end of the hall, the human servant tried to guide Regina away. However, Kieran was already there next to the servant. I'll be borrowing this person for a moment. You go do your chores. The servant immediately obeyed his words. Regina looked at him with a shocked expression. Kieran spoke. What's your name? My name is Regina. I'm affiliated with the Dragon's Shadow. Dragon's Shadow. Him. It seems it is one of the lower organizations. Are you working directly under Nibiris? I'm sorry, but I do not know. When Miss came to the Rulin Kingdom, I was just ordered to help her. Well, we keep everything as need to know basis for the lower organizations. Then I guess you don't know much about this place. I know nothing except that this place called the Plains of Darkness, and it is considered to be our holy land. Him. You weren't born here, and the information restriction hasn't been lifted yet. So you shouldn't have the qualification to be here. No. Nibiris brought you here so there must another reason. Kieran mumbled as he introduced himself. I'm Kieran Baldazark. Regina was surprised by his words. Baldazark. He was one of the four dragon demon generals, who had served under the dragon demon king Atain. The blood shed by a star, Baldazark. The hammer that swallowed the scream of the land, Ragus. The sword that parts a storm, Almeric. The goblet containing the heaven's tears, Ornsaurus. They were of the dragon demon race, and each of them had the strength of a thousand men. They had made their enemies quake just by stepping onto the battlefield. The dragon demon race was known for the outstanding power they were born with, but there were those who were exceptional even amongst the dragon demon race. Moreover, these four beings had been acknowledged by the dragon demon king. Their strength was at an earth-shattering level. Kieran spoke. You are thinking about the right Baldazark. I'm a direct descendant of Duke Baldazark. Of course. This meant he was on a different level as the dragon demon worshippers. He possessed a noble background. Cold sweat started running down Regina's body. Kieran spoke softly to her. You don't have to be afraid of me. Since Nibiris brought you here, I have no thoughts of harming you. I just want to listen to your story. Which story do you want to hear? I heard a report saying you were with Nibiris all this time. Yes, I want to know exactly how she failed. I would like you to give a more detailed account. At that time, Nibiris arrived at the center of the Dragon Demon Castle. This place had been built as a safe haven for the Dragon Demon King Atain, so a throne had been built in this place. The throne remained empty for his eventual return. The audience chamber ended and a split hallway appeared. At the end of the hallway, the room of the queen who had mingled her body with the Dragon Demon King existed. It was the living space for the queen, who had borne his children. The room was sunken in darkness. There were windows in the room with curtains that hadn't been drawn. The sun was still in the sky outside, yet this room was ruled by pitch black darkness. In the middle of all of this, a woman was buried in the cushion of a large chair, and she had her eyes closed. Like Nibiris, 
She had long black hair and was a woman of the dragon demon race. She had an aura of calmness and elegance. In terms of human criteria, she looked to be around early to mid-thirties. The horn above her ears were black and her dragon demon stone was the color of gold. I'm back, grandmother. She was Nibiru's grandmother, and she also held the highest position in the plane of darkness. She was the dragon demon king Atine's first wife, Ainsera. This was the reason why Nibiru's was treated like a treasure. She was a direct descendant of the dragon demon king Atain. Ainsera opened her eyes at Nibiru's greeting. She had golden eyes, which was the same color as her dragon demon stone. At the same time, the darkness surrounding her disappeared and the natural light filtered in. Nibiru's, you came back unharmed. I'm happy. Unlike the content of her words, her expression was cold. However, it wasn't as if she was intentionally putting on a cold expression. Her face was like a finely made sculpture and her face didn't show any emotions. Nibiru's lowered her head. I'm embarrassed. I failed to carry out my mission. Don't blame yourself. We gave you too dangerous of a mission when we knew you were short on experience in the first place. The reason for this result is our lack of preparation. But, Kieran succeeded. Kieran's mission was not as difficult as your mission. Moreover, Kieran has much more experience carrying out missions compared to you. He also tasted plenty of defeat. You shouldn't feel a sense of inferiority over this. It is good that you have the desire to improve yourself. However, if you get fixated on a small mistake that occurred in the past, you will lose your future. You should never forget this point. I understand. I want to ask you one thing. I'll get the detailed report from you later. I have something I have to confirm with you before all of that. What is it? I heard a human with the name seeped in sin had interfered with you. Nibiris bit her lips at those words. When she thought about Azul's face, she felt humiliation surge up inside her. Ainsera asked her a question. Did that person perhaps possess the dragon demon key? Dragon demon key? How can that be? Nibiris was taken aback. No human in this era possessed dragon demon key. The field of darkness had used all their resources to eliminate those who had dragon demon key. Then they had cut off any information regarding it from being passed on. Ainsera asked her a question. Are you sure? I'm sure. If that man did have the dragon demon key, why didn't he use it when his life was in danger? Moreover, if he did possess it, I couldn't guarantee that I would have come back here alive. Him. What she said was true. Nibiris had great confidence in her talent and strength, but Ainsera had hammered into her the fear of the dragon demon key. Moreover, Nibiris had also experienced it. They had erased the existence of the dragon demon key from the world, but it existed in the plane of darkness. Nibiris spoke. However, the man with the name seeped in sin had knowledge of the secret arts, and he knew about the dragon slayer's ritual. He knew about the dragon slayer's ritual. Really, there was a change of expression on Ainsira's statuesque face. There was a slight expression of surprise on her face as she waited for Nibiru's answer. Yes. Moreover, I suspect he had killed a dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual. Such an event had happened. Ainsira's expression became serious. He knew about the dragon slayer's ritual. That fact in itself was shocking. However, he had also killed a dragon through the dragon slayer's ritual. Nibiru's spoke. Of course, this is all a conjecture. The eyes were missing from the dragon's corpse, so I think there is a high chance that the dragon slayer's ritual had been carried out. However, there are too many holes in that conjecture. Why do you say that? The man with the name seeped in sin wasn't strong enough to defeat a dragon by himself. Nibiru's still didn't have the answer to this question. What method did Azel use to kill the dragon? Ainsera calmly listened to Nibiru's explanation. His magic was weak and he didn't possess any dragon demon key. Yet he knew about the dragon slayer's ritual and he had carried it out. It is a set of circumstances that we can't ignore. I believe we need to keep an eye on him from now on. All right, I'll arrange it myself. Grandmother, please let me. No, Ainsera spoke in a small voice but Nibiru's body shook as if she had been whipped. Nibiru's had failed, because of Azel. She wanted her revenge. 
This was why she wanted to volunteer herself for this job. However, Ain Sarah expressed her disapproval before Nibiris could speak. You've already been exposed to the Dragon Sword Duke. You will have to lay low for a while. I'll allow the release of a new magic manuscript, so you should behave yourself and learn the magic. Yes, Ain Sarah had made her resolute intentions known, so Nibiris didn't dare to push any further on this issue. Ain Sarah closed her eyes again, then spoke as she called the darkness back. You can go now. Chapter 63, Those Who Follow the Prophecy. Part 2. Normally, the nobility moved with a big party that denoted their station. This was especially true for those with the rank of duke. There were numerous retinue that would do the miscellaneous work. However, Chiron was starting the fire and drawing the water from the stream by himself. Azel spoke, I never thought I would see the sight of you starting a fire, and drawing water. Of course, Azel wasn't fooling around, while Chiron was doing the miscellaneous work. He ran around the forest to hunt down the birds and the rabbits. Since he was a high-rank spirit order practitioner, he was able to use his mental wave freely. It felt like cheating using those skills to hunt. Chiron responded in a calm manner. If there is no one to do it, then I have to do it. It isn't as if these tasks will finish on its own. Do you want to do all of it, since you are my junior? I'll decline. Azul's skillful hands skinned the rabbit's leather, and he worked with the meat. He grumbled, while doing this. Would it have been better if we packed some provisions from the palace? Him. I never expected you to run so poorly. It was my mistake in overestimating you. Azel pouted. The two of them were traveling from the capital to the dukedom of Taranto's by, running, it wasn't a figure of speech. They were running. Chiron had refused the horses given by the throne, then he cut down as much luggage as he could. Then he made a straight line towards the dukedom of Taranto's. It might sound crazy to other people, but it was the most logical method for Chiron. That is the fastest way. He could run faster than a galloping horse and he was able to ignore the terrain as he ran straight towards his destination. This was why he could travel much faster than traveling on a road. However, he had misjudged Azul's stamina. Tisk tisk. We traveled at such a slow pace, yet you are tired after running a mere 20 kilometers. If someone overheard us, they would think you were talking in wrong units. When Chiron clicked his tongue, Azel grumbled. They had traveled at a much higher speed than a normal person could sprint, and they had covered 20 kilometers. They cut straight through mountains, forests, and prairies. It was a much rougher journey compared to traveling the same distance on a proper road. It had been only one month, since Azel had awoken in this era. During that time, he had rebuilt his body by a little bit, and he had increased his magic reservoir. However, it paled in comparison to his prime. When one continuously moves across a long distance, stamina was more important than technique. There was no know how that would make this easier, so Azel tired pretty fast. Chiron spoke as he chewed on the cooked bird. Since your swordsmanship was so outstanding, I might have overestimated you. I'll have to adjust my view of you. I planned on arriving there by tomorrow night. If one measured the distance from the capital to the dukedom of Taranto's in a straight line on a map, the distance was over 500 kilometers. I guess we will target one week as the travel time. Are you going to say you can't travel a mere 70 kilometers a day? Are you trying to kill me? Who? I really like the sound of you sounding weak. Er, uh, we should at least find a town to rest tonight. Chiron was humming as if he was in a good mood, and he opened up a map. The two of them really traveled 70 meters every day in a straight line. As each day passed, his body was screaming out in pain, yet Chiron kept complaining that he was too slow. Just wait until I recover my strength. I'll definitely show you a bitter taste, old man. At such a young age, he never expected to pine for the old days. He grinded his teeth. Azel cursed Chiron inside, but he covered the fixed distance they had set as a goal. He went to sleep completely exhausted. Four days had passed. Him, suddenly, Chiron's brows furrowed. They were climbing a mountain when he noticed smoke rising in the distance. Azel. Yes, I see it. Azel also saw what Chiron had seen. The two didn't speak any further, and they started heading towards the location. 
One would need a professional gear to descend the mountain slope, yet they ran down as if they were running across flat ground. They stepped on trees as if they were flying, and they head towards the source of the smoke. They arrived at the foot of the mountain, and they saw the fields of the village being raised by fire. A band of bandits that included orcs were plundering a village. Him, the two of them had been heading towards the village at high speed, yet they suddenly stopped when they detected a different kind of being. A person was on top of a tree. This being was hiding himself with a concealment technique as he looked down at the village. A magician. No, something is off. He wasn't using a high-ranked concealment technique, so Azel and Chiron could easily sense his presence. This person had an old hat on his head, and he was surrounded by a voluminous traveler's cloak. They couldn't see his face. While this person was small in stature, they could sense a significant amount of magic from this being. Dragon Majin. No, it doesn't seem like it. Perhaps. Azel detected the smell of dragon demon magic from this person. Unlike those from the dragon demon race and dragon Majin, this person only had a partial aspect of the dragon demon magic. Basically, he felt like a human, who had gone through the dragon slayer's ritual like him. He doesn't look to be in the same group as those bastards. It didn't seem plausible for such an unusually gifted magician to be part of a bandit group attacking a farming village. Still, how could he calmly look at what's going on unless he was part of the bandits? Let's go. If he is an enemy, we can face him at a later time. Chiron had already come to a decision, so he spoke to Azel through whispering. Then they immediately ran towards the farmer's village. An orc was on top of a female child ripping her clothes away. Chiron descended like a bird of prey. The orc's head was separated from its neck at the same time Chiron raised his sword. Azel was following right behind him. When he arrived, a geezer of blood fountained into the air as Azel severed three necks. Who are these bastards? The two of them had attacked so abruptly that the bandits were a step slow in reacting. However, Azel and Chiron didn't care if they reacted or not. They just approached any bandit they saw, and they swung their swords. The bandits had already killed a lot of farmers, and they were in the process of gathering women and children. The bandits thought they had already won, so they were focused on looting. They hadn't expected an ambush, so the bandits were being mowed down. Who the hell are you bastards? A large man, who looked to be the leader, asked the question in shock. Azel spoke as he walked towards him. Why should I answer your question? You guys are already dead, so there is no point in answering your. At the same time, Azel's form disappeared. Question. The sentence came to an end from behind the man. The man tried to turn around in surprise. Something was wrong. He was just turning his head, yet his vision was rapidly dimming. Afterwards, the neck that was turning was cleanly sliced. His head slid to the ground and a fountain of blood erupted from the wound. The bandit fell in front of a woman, and she let out a scream. Azel flinched. Geez, I made a mistake. Your lack of consideration for others is troubling. Chiron clicked his tongue as he approached Azel. There had been about 30 members in the bandit group, but it didn't even take five minutes to kill all of them. Maybe, if they were fully armed and ready to fight, the fight would have lasted longer. However, most of them had their pants down as they were about to violate the women. This was why everything ended so easily. They released the people tied up by the bandits, and they extinguished the flames burning up the houses. The surviving farmers all bowed their head towards the two men. I go, thank you very much. While they were doing this, they looked at the two men with fear in their eyes. These two men had overwhelming power that allowed him to kill the bandits in minutes. Moreover, they could overlook Azel, but wasn't Chiron of the dragon demon race. Moreover, he wore black armor that covered his entire body. He was dressed like a knight, and the villagers could tell that this being was a noble. Him. There is a farming settlement in such a rural area. Does the local lord here have a bad personality? Chiron asked with his head tilted. He correctly guessed that these workers had run away from the rule of their lord to live as farmer inside the mountain. If a lord was merciless in his rule, one would occasionally come across such a situation. If there was a famine or a problem causing a poor harvest, 
these farmers couldn't meet ends meet if the taxes were high. Those who couldn't pay taxes and even criminals sometimes ran away to form a village. This was why such a village didn't have the power to protect themselves, so they were subject to being attacked by bandits. They had escaped from being plundered and killed. However, the problem was the fact that their savior was a noble. However, Chiron thought outside the box regarding such issues. Well, you don't to be scared. You aren't a resident of my domain, and I'm not part of the bandits. I don't care what you say. You are very heroic in your temperament. However, is it okay for a great lord that holds the respect of the throne to be speaking this way? Who cares? No one will overhear me here. Moreover, I have a more urgent business right now. After saying those words, Chiron glared at the magician atop the tree. The next moment he used his instantaneous movement to appear right in front of the magician. Ah, the magician was so surprised that he jumped off the tree. It seemed he hadn't expected to be found, since he was using his concealment technique. Chiron dropped in front of him. The magician was taken aback, so he asked a question. Why are you being like this? Chiron and Azel was amazed by his words. Doesn't he realize how suspicious he looked? The two of them were a bit surprised when the hat half fell off the magician's head. He looked to be only 14 or 15 years old. He had curly blonde hair and blue eyes. This youth was looking up at Chiron with an expression that indicated he didn't understand the cause of Chiron's action. Azel was especially surprised. This little shrimp completed the dragon slayer's ritual. No way. Soon, Chiron put on a cold expression as he asked a question. What's your identity? It doesn't seem like you are in the same group as the bandits. Are you perhaps the mastermind behind this attack? I have no ties to those people. Then why were you hiding there as you looked on? I was traveling nearby, and the bandits suddenly appeared. I hid, because I was afraid they would harm me. By the look of it, you look to be a proficient magician. Didn't you have any thoughts about helping the people being pillaged? The teen tilted his head at the question. I might die if I did. Am I required to do that? His attitude was so matter-of-fact that Chiron and Azel got angry for a brief moment. The teen put his hat back on. He stood up, and he dusted off his clothes. I know why you are asking me those questions. However, am I bound by duty to do what you suggest? It isn't as if I brought the bandits here. I don't know these people, so I don't have any sense of obligation to these people. That is true. Chiron spoke as if he didn't appreciate the young man's attitude. The teen's words were very selfish, but he wasn't wrong. Even if this young man was a magician with strong magic, it wasn't guaranteed he would survive against bandits that numbered over 20. He made a cold decision to prioritize his life over others. It was hard to berate him for that. He could criticize the youth on moral grounds, but it wouldn't be productive to do so. Chapter 64. Those who follow the prophecy. Part 3. While he was thinking this, Azel couldn't help, but ask the question. Still, the people were suffering yet you didn't think about helping them. Azel expected the youth to feel tormented by the guilt he felt, but the youth was extremely unperturbed. It was a face that said he didn't care if people around him was raped and killed. The youth spoke. I did. You did. Yes. Azel and Chiron looked at each other. His answer was unexpected, since he said it so matter-of-factly. The youth's expression was so nonchalant that his word didn't have a ring of truth. The youth kept speaking. However, it was more important for me to save my life instead of helping them. Are my answers sufficient? Azel Zestringer. In a flash, a line of silver light appeared in front of the youth's eyes. When he realized something had flashed, Azel's sword point was already aimed at his neck. How do you know my name? The tense sense of danger swept over the youth. The youth spoke with a slightly shaky voice. I can easily give you the answer. Can we do that after you put away your sword? Do you want me draw a bloody line across your neck? You are much more scarier than I imagined. The young man spoke in an awkward manner. I'm here to test whether you are the prophesied person. I am the guardian shadow's keeper of prophecy. My name is Leon. Will that be sufficient for my introduction? You are part of the guardian shadows. Azul's brows furrowed. Chiron asked a question as if there was neither rhyme nor reason about it. A kid like you is part of the guardian shadows. 
Age isn't that important when becoming a guardian shadow, Dragon Sword Duke. The youth was letting out cold sweat as he retreated backwards. Azel decided to sheathe his sword for now. The youth named Leon spoke with a bright smile on his face. The only important thing is what one can bring to the cause and effect. Anyways, I was chasing you down, but this meeting was unplanned. Originally, I planned on visiting you both at night. You are overflowing with the sense of justice, Azel Zestringer. I'm overflowing with the sense of justice. I have a mountainous amount of things to say on the subject, but I'll omit it for now. Did you just say you were chasing after us? Yes. For how long? It's been a while. However, it was only today that I knew I would be able to catch up to the both of you. Basically, you always knew where we were located. Yes. Azul's eyes held disbelief. I wasn't able to feel their sight on me. This meant Leon had tracked down Azel using magic of farsight. Azel couldn't accept the fact that he hadn't been able to sense the gaze that would have been upon him. Was there a technique within the Guardian Shadow that was able to avoid Azel's detection? If I think about the time the Guardian Shadow first appeared, that could be a possibility. Azel was confident in his sensing ability, but he didn't consider it to be absolute. The detection technique and concealment skills had a biting or being bitten relationship. One couldn't predict which techniques might gain the upper hand. When he thought about the first meeting where he saw the Guardian Shadow, he hadn't been able to sense it until it got within 20 meters of him. Azel asked a question. How did you track us? That's easy. I just had to ask for the Dragon Sword Duke's location from the Guardian Shadows. Since you two were traveling so fast, I had a hard time following the both of you. Ah, so that's how it is. He could now understand why he didn't detect any gaze on him. They hadn't been monitoring Azel. Leon spoke to the slightly dejected Azel. I'm sure you are a human, yet you are a vessel for the dragon demon magic. You aren't a dragon magian, yet. Dragon magian was the offspring between a human and a being from the dragon demon race. As the line becomes more mixed with humans, the special characteristics of a dragon magian disappeared, and a regular human was born. At that point, any trace of the dragon demon magic disappeared. However, Azel held the scent of the dragon demon magic. This was caused by him absorbing a dragon's power through the dragon slayer's ritual. Leon spoke in an interested manner. I have no idea why you would have the scent of the dragon demon magic. However, I've been told there hasn't been a human like you in hundred years. Bullshit. What? You are saying that, but you are human. This undermines the credibility of your words. Ah, 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 I am. No, I should be seen as exception to the norm. We are looking for the being from the prophecy. He can't be one of us, yet he has to satisfy certain conditions. The prophesied being, what are you talking about? Unless I can confirm that you are the being foretold by the prophecy, I won't be able to tell you. This is also the first time I've heard about this. Why wasn't I informed? Chiron spoke. He had shown dedication in his work as a member of the Guardian Shadow, yet he wasn't informed of this fact. He was displeased that a young man knew more about this situation than him. Leon spoke. The prophecy isn't known to all the members of the Guardian Shadows. The Keeper of the Prophecy knows it. The Keeper of the Prophecy are beings who willingly dedicates one's life to the prophecy. Sacrifice. Keeper of the prophecy. Only those who gives up on one's own future to protect and aid in the prophecy can become the keeper of the prophecy. This doesn't apply to you, Duke. So being a dedicated member of the Guardian Shadow is insufficient. It seems secrets I don't like keeps popping up as time passes. Well, it isn't as if I like my current situation. Still, the arrow has been shot and it can't be withdrawn. Leon had a bright smile as he spoke. Azel asked a question as if he found it objectionable. If you are a member of the Guardian Shadow, don't you have the duty to protect the population from the Dragon Demon King worshippers? Yet you didn't stop the bandits in front of your eyes from pillaging the village just because you valued your own life more than theirs. Truthfully, I cannot trust your words. You are severely misinformed about us, Azel Zestringer. What? Leon spoke with a sour expression on his face. We aren't particularly burning with the sense of duty to protect the population. Moreover, 
We aren't doing carrying out the cause of justice. Then what are you fighting for? We want to eradicate the dragon demon worshippers, and the final goal is to kill the dragon demon king once and for all. That is our goal. If one wants to save the people dying in front of one's eyes, it is the prerogative of the individual. However, it has nothing to do with the goal of the guardian shadows. By your expression, it seems you have a great misconception of us. I'll be clear. The Guardian Shadow isn't an organization that upholds justice. We fight against the Dragon Demon King and his worshipper. We just safeguard the human race from them. Him. Azel realized disappointment and anger was simmering within him. Leon smiled as if he had a mask on his face. He had a bright smile, but his words didn't match his expression. He gave off a very eccentric feeling. If one had to choose between the duty towards humans and shutting down the dragon demon worshippers, I would willingly choose the latter. That is what the guardian shadow is all about. I'll admit I misunderstood the intentions of the guardian shadow. Azel fought to push down his anger as he admitted he had a preconceived notion of the guardian's shadow. They only want to stop the dragon demon worshippers. Azel had gone through the dragon demon war. He had the noble idea of wanting to carry out justice for the people. However, the Guardian Shadows and Leon moved to a different standard. Leon spoke. It is a relief that you understand us now. From now on, you won't look favorably at what we have to do to you. It'll be awkward if you misunderstand our intentions. What? You will find out once the night comes. Please be patient until then. If you don't mind, may I travel with you guys? I'll be following you anyways. Azel and Chiron had big frowns on their face. Leon was still smiling as if he had a mask on his face. Azel and Chiron departed the farming village, and they traveled to their destination at high speed. The two of them moved at a pace unimaginable to a normal person, yet the youth was unexpectedly keeping up. Magicians were able to fly through the air. This mode of travel was very advantageous, since terrains didn't bother the magician. The youth flew at high speeds for a long time, yet he had enough energy to spare. Who, when they reached a town, Azel rented out a room at an inn. He washed his tired body, then he fell into meditation within his room. Before he went into his mediation, Azel gathered a magic aggregate in both hands, and he drank it. Chiron asked in surprise, What are you doing? I'm recovering my magic. I've never seen such a method. Is it worth doing? When one is trying to immediately recover one's exhausted magical reservoir, it is better than a calm meditation. If one wants to fill up one's energy pulse with dense magic, the normal way would be more effective. Basically, Azel was implying that he might need to use his magic soon. Chiron asked a question. Do you think we'll have to fight that child? There is no guarantee. However, when I heard his tone of voice, I don't think this meeting will be pleasant for us. Him. The Guardian Shadows is becoming more bizarre as I learn more about them. You are a member, so you shouldn't speak like that. However, I am angry that I was kept in the dark until now. They dared to use me, yet they hid the important information from me. Chiron looked to be in a very bad mood. He was called the Dragon Demon Duke, and he was revered by the people. In regards to information, he was always first to be informed. He was the one, who kept important information from others. He had never been on the other side of the equation. This was why he didn't like how this organization called the Guardian Shadow was being run. Azel was recovering his magic when he slowly opened his eyes. It's here. Him. Can you feel something? Chiron still couldn't sense anything. Azel spoke. I can't feel its energy. However. I can most definitely tell that it is, watching me. At that moment, someone was watching Azel from afar. Moreover, it seemed this being realized he was compromised. The being let out a ominous magical wave, and it stimulated Azel's senses. Chiron's expression hardened. This is. It has the stench of black magic. It's probably an undead. A being, who had used forbidden magic to overcome death, was making his presence known. This being let out his presence from afar. The presence was very dim, yet it was enough for the two of them to sense it. Chiron asked a question as he watched Azel arm himself. Will you be okay? For the past couple days, Azel had been on a forced march, 
and he had accumulated a lot of fatigue. His body was exhausted, and his energy pulse wasn't in a good condition. Azel spoke, in any fight, my opponent won't be considerate about what kind of condition I am in. The probability of finding a fair fight is the same as finding an opponent, who has lost his mind. It is very rare. The person expecting a fair fight, while a sword is pointed at one's throat, is the stupid one. Sometimes, you say words that I really like. It puts me in a tough position. Chiron grinned as he followed after Azel. The two of them erased their presence, and they secretly exited the inn. They stretched their senses into the surrounding, and they heard the whispers of restless spirits. They detected an ominous energy. This was an invitation being sent by their opponents. Azel spoke. There are three of them. What? There are three of them including the one following us from the back. Azel pointed backwards. Leon was following them in plain sight. Chiron spoke. The other two. Did you find this out through your ability to sense other people's gaze? Yes, that is a very desirable technique. I can feel a very dim sensation, yet I can't pinpoint it for sure. I'll teach it to you later. Of course, I'll have to receive something in return. Just don't overcharge me too much. It'll depend on how you act from now on. While they were speaking, the two of them arrived at a hill that was about two kilometers away from the town. There was a being standing there with the moonlight shining down behind his back. His opponent spoke. Azel Zestringer. The voice that asked the question was very bleak. One got goosebumps just from listening to it, and the voice invoked an instinctive fear within oneself. The sound wasn't formed by the vibrations of a living being's vocal cords. It was evidence that this undead being was using black magic to produce sound. Azel queried. Before you ask the other person for his identity, shouldn't you should reveal your own first? It seems you are him. I'm Zeta. That is all you need to know. If you want to know more. The undead being billowed his cape that had been covering his body. Beneath the moonlight, a skeleton knight encased in a dark metal with an ominous red-black line running down the armor appeared. Too strong light was shining within the helm where the eyes should be. Acquire your qualification by surviving against my sword. You are only an undead yet you are blathering about such nonsense. Bring it on. Chapter 65. Those who follow the prophecy. Part 4. Azel deployed his magic. His three rings of life, which had gone through dual banding, vibrated, and an enormous amount of magic was emitted. I'll hit him with everything I got from the beginning. He put on a strong front, but Azel's instinct was warning him of danger. The undead in front of his eyes was dangerous. A bizarre armor covered its entire body, and the sword was a powerful magical artifact. Moreover, the soul controlling these items were quite formidable. At that moment, another undead's voice rang out from the dark. There were two more of them. Is this? Are you giving me an order? Chiron bared his teeth as he laughed. The two undead within the darkness looked to be a magician, and an undead swordsman wearing similar armor to Zeta. The undead swordsman's face was covered with a dark mask. The helm had two horns that looked like the horns of the dragon demon race, and it looked fierce. Don't think of it as an order. It would be great if you thought of it as a request from a fellow member from the same organization. What if I don't agree to it? Doesn't that sound more fun? I don't care if we are in the organization called Guardian's Shadow. I'm not tolerant enough to be ordered around by undead bastards. Chiron unsheathed his dual swords, and he deployed his dragon demon magic. The air around him responded to his intent, and the sound was loud and resonant. The undead magician, who saw this, spoke. Well, when I was alive, these kinds of things happened quite often. This is the temperament of a swordsman. The undead swordsman spoke with laughter in his voice. It sounded as if wind was escaping through the holes in his skull. It seemed the undead tried to laugh like he used to when he was alive. The undead swordsman spoke. Kids these days, are you old enough to speak so insolently in front of me? Then you are old enough to be senile. Why don't you leave behind your disgusting obsession and return to your grave? Chiron ran in like a ray of light, and he clashed with the undead swordsman. Light exploded and the earth shook. Chiron was taken aback. What's the identity of this bastard? 
His first strike was a surprise attack where he put his full power into the strike. If it was a human, any defense would have been meaningless. It would have evaporated in an instant. However, his opponent didn't move an inch, and it blocked his attack. It stood atop the shaking earth, and it let out an overwhelming amount of magic. Chiron had exterminated a lot of undead before, but the amount of magic emitted by this one was on a different level. It is almost on par with me in terms of magic. Amongst the dragon demon race in Rulan Kingdom, Chiron was the strongest. Surprisingly, the undead swordsman in front of his eyes was emitting dragon demon magic that was on par with Chiron. The undead swordsman spoke. Don't interfere, Theta. The sound of wind flowing out came from inside the undead swordsman's mask. The undead swordsman named Delta probably had the habit of snorting. It sounded like it. It's my turn, pup. I haven't heard someone call me that in such a long time that it doesn't seem like you are alluding to me, old man bones. Delta stomped on the ground as he dashed forward. Then the sword covered in darkness clashed with Chiron's dual swords. Currently, the sounds of explosion rang out in the surrounding, and the air was getting much hotter. Azel and Zeta glared at each other as they circled around each other. However, it wasn't as if they were standing around doing nothing. At that moment, a fierce battle was occurring in a domain that couldn't be seen by the eyes. This bastard is only an undead, but he is quite extraordinary. Azel felt a sense of confusion. At that moment, they were controlling their mental waves, and they were engaged in a high-speed battle. They emphasized certain parts of their body to attract the gaze of each other, and both of them tried to hide their attack stance. However, their sense of distance became messed up as they kept following the movement of each other's stances. Both of them shifted their balance, and they kept changing the rhythm of their breathing. They were trying to mess up each other's timing. This wasn't being done only by what one could see and hear. They used magical energy to directly limit the opponent's senses. Zeta was already dead, so he didn't have the senses that would be present in a living being. This was why Zeta used a very sophisticated technique to face Azel. His skills were not inferior to high-level spirit order practitioners. It's probably tough for a dead bastard to do this. A magician loses a lot of capability when one becomes an undead. However, a spirit order practitioner had more to lose as an undead. At first, one would think an undead would have no problem as a spirit order practitioner, since the technique dealt with the mind. However, Spirit Order practitioners controlled their mind with the rings of life as their anchor. This could only happen with a living body. When one became an undead, one lost all the standard techniques one cultivated previously. Everything had to be relearned as one had to match the standards of an undead. How could such a thing be easy? Che e h n g. At some point, Azel and Zeta determined each other's timing was off, so they charged. However, the two only reaffirmed that they were both wrong. So the dragon demon worshippers were really behind the spirit order practitioners of this era being so deficient in handling their mind. Zeta reacted in a sensitive manner. Azel knew he made a mistake, but he didn't let that show outwardly. What do you mean by the prophesied being? Why does an undead want to fight me without giving any explanation? I can't see you as a someone good. Zeta charged as if he was skipping across space. As a living human, it was hard to predict its movements. The undead didn't breathe, and one couldn't read the undead's muscle, since it wasn't there. There were much less clues one could use to predict its movement compared to a human. Sparks flew. It appeared behind a zell, not in the front. It used an illusion to appear as it was jumping from the front, but it had curved the trajectory of the instantaneous movement to slide around to the back. You were surprising. How are you able to predict an undead spirit order moves? Zeta rubbed at the chest region of his armor. Azel's sword had left a scratch on its surface. Azel had seen through Zeta's movement, and he had counter-attacked. Azel snorted. This isn't something special. You made your key too obvious in the early stages. Anyways, that armor is very sturdy. Azel had struck with the intention of slicing through the entire armor. However, the armor was so hard that he could only scratch it. 
It seems it'll be quite difficult for me to harm him. His opponent was on a whole different level as the undead dragon demon king worshipper named Jackal, who he had faced before. The armor itself was a powerful magical artifact. Azel felt unease wash over him. Cold sweat was running down Azel's back. Zeta ran forward. It wasn't instantaneous movement, but the attack was so fast that it looked as if Zeta had jumped across space. Light and darkness intersected. Azel's eyes had narrowed from surprise, yet the exchange continued before he could blink his eyes. The arc of light and the arc of darkness clashed with each other in a dizzying manner. Azel's expression crumpled. Shit, why is this bastard so fast? Zeta's speed kept increasing. Azel was keeping up with his speed, so Zeta kept increasing his speed as if it was telling Azel to keep up with it. The speed increased more and more as if there was no limit. The shoulder region of Azel's leather armor was sliced. Blood flew from Azel's arm. Fuck. It was too fast for Azel to keep up. He purposefully opened up a weak point, so he could try to counter-attack. However, it was useless since Zeta was too fast. His eyes followed its movement. Azel had accelerated his senses to the extreme, and he was able to process all the information he was taking in. However, his body couldn't keep up. He used the least amount of movement to block, and he used Zeta's previous movements to predict the next moves. He was defending against it, yet there was a limit to what he could do. Zeta was so overwhelmingly fast and strong that he couldn't cover up his deficiencies with his techniques. His balance was broken. Azel had been stepping to the side in a circle to resist the onslaught, but he had just taken a step backwards. Then he kept being pushed back as the dam had been broken. The undead didn't need to breathe. While they still had magical energy, the undead could attack endlessly without rest. It didn't breathe, so it didn't have the weakness of slowing down from muscle fatigue. Also, a high-level undead like Zeta had the cursed power of being able to steal energy from whatever its power of darkness touched. Azel was consuming his magical energy to defend against this. He couldn't use his mind to create an opening. Zeta was way behind in terms of techniques dealing with the mind, but Zeta was good enough. The difference in magical energy was used to overwhelm Azel. Moreover, the physical fight was so intense that he didn't have the time to use any advanced mental attacks. As if Zeta was far from done, he kept increasing his speed. Zeta's strength was several times more stronger than Azel. Zeta's speed was several times faster than Azel. Moreover, Zeta's magical reservoir was so vast that it couldn't be compared to Azel's magical energy. There was too big of a difference between Zeta's full strength and Azel's full strength. The fact that Azel hadn't been crushed in an instant was the evidence showing Azel was much superior in terms of techniques. Suddenly, Azel's clone appeared. Zeta didn't pay any attention to it. Since he already homed in on Azel's true body, any act of trying to distract him was a waste of magical energy. However, Zeta had been too arrogant. What? Azel suddenly appeared from his side, and Zeta was hit with a single strike. Zeta, who had been charging like a hurricane, was sent flying sideways. Then, Azel used this opportunity to, to strike Zeta as he generated thunder with his sword. Azel mindlessly took in his breaths. Since he had moved without regulating his breathing, he had almost reached his limit. His heart was pounding uncontrollably, and he felt dizzy in his head. Chapter 66, Those Who Follow the Prophecy. Part 5. I'm absolutely flabbergasted. What technique did you use? I believe you used the extension of the astral projection technique. Is it really possible to use it in this manner? Zeta walked out of the cloud of dust unharmed. Azel didn't answer him as he tried to regulate his breathing. Astral projection. This was a highly difficult training method used by a spirit order practitioner when one is in the process of training one's mind. The mind and the body was completely separated from each other. The body moved in such a state. Moreover, one had to imitate and conceptualize the various organs of the body. This was how one could still keep the sensation of being alive, while one was separated from one's body. This process was so hard that not many spirit order practitioners succeeded in achieving this state. Zeta was an undead yet he was able to use his spirit order. 
Zeta was also using an variation of this technique to achieve this result. This was also true for Azel's cloning technique, Dance of the Shadow, which gave his clones substance. It was possible to imitate the sensation of being alive through the astral body. However, what Azel was doing was on a whole different level. The clones that had been completely separated from the body was able to physically influence the material world. Zeta had been a high-level spirit order practitioner in his previous life, and he had maintained his level of skill. However, the technique shown by Azel was inexplicable to him. If you won't answer me, then I'll have to find out the answer. However, there is something that doesn't make any sense. You have all these techniques, yet. Azel didn't give Zeta the chance to finish his words. When he determined his breathing was under control, Azel used the instantaneous movement to rush forward. Four of Azel's clone appeared near Zeta. Accompanying the sound of an explosion, Zeta was sent flying. Each of them possessed detailed and clear presence that one couldn't tell which one was the real body. This was why Zeta chose to pierce three of them at the same time. He pierced one with his sword, and the other two with his darkness magic. However, the last remaining one had hit Zeta's body. Then the one that Zeta had thought he had defeated pierced through his darkness magic. The one he considered to be a clone struck out at Zeta. I have to decide the victory right now. At that moment, Azul's heart started beating crazily as it poured out the magical energy. Even when he was mindlessly panting, he hadn't let even a second go to waste. The fact that his heart was racing meant he was vibrating his rings of life. When one's body craved oxygen, the painful moment could be used to extract a vast amount of magical energy. Currently, he was swirling with magical energy that was much higher in quantity than his body could contain. Star's breath. He created a white-hot flame to eradicate the undead. The flame followed the trajectory of his sword, and it exploded when it reached its target. The storm of white flame lashed out. Azel had accelerated his sword past his limit. He pierced through Zeta's defense, and his sword energy showered down at Zeta. No matter how sturdy this bizarre armor was, there had to be a breaking point. If he could use his entire strength to break it. How unfortunate. Zeta had been taking a beat, yet a genuine sound of regret was heard in his voice. A blood-colored darkness exploded forth with Zeta at its center. Azul's white fire was swept away in an instant. It was like a candle being snuffed out by a storm. For a moment, Azul's movement stalled, and Zeta didn't miss taking advantage of this moment. How can you possess such wondrous skills, yet? How do you not have any power? Zeta's sword flew towards Azel. The curse of darkness had dug into his mind. He had stiffened as he tried to resist against the curse of darkness that had dug into his mind. It caused Azel to be a step slow. This small pause proved to be fatal. Azel hadn't taken a direct hit from Zeta's sword energy until now. There was too much of a difference in physical strength, and Zeta's sword was a demonic sword with powerful magic dwelling within it. Azel had received the attacks obliquely as he let the attacks slide off of his sword. This had protected his sword. However, he wasn't able to do so this time. Azel's sword broke into pieces. Before Azel could do anything, Zeta hit Azel's body. Accompanying the sound of explosion, Azel was sent flying. Fuck. Azul's body hit the ground, and his body took a high bounce. His body lodged into a tree. If he was a normal person, he would have died immediately from the impact. However, Azel had used spirit order in an instant to reduce the shock. It saved his life. No. Azel forcefully grabbed onto his fading consciousness. The situation he had been worried about had come true. If Azel and Chiron fought at full strength with the intent to kill each other, the result would be something similar to now. However, he was fighting against Zeta, not Chiron. Still, his prediction had been on point. If one was an expert, one could deflect strong attacks through techniques. However, techniques wouldn't be able to hold back a flood. He was short on power. If a three-year-old child developed the greatest technique in the world, the child wouldn't be able to beat a trained adult, who was fully armed. This was how vast the gulf was between Azel and Zeta. What do you think? Azel was trying his damnedest to stand up when he heard the voice of a youth. 
It was Leon, who had been observing the situation. I have no idea. So what the hell was the point of all of this? We just bought unwanted enmity with this. However, he is worth watching a little bit more. Him. Is that so? Maybe. Someone else should test him right now. We should give him more time. Well, he does need time to recover from his wounds. No, we have to give him more time than that. Only then will he find out about his true worth. Do you have any evidence to support this opinion? No. However, my feeling is telling me it is so. Him. Even if someone else conducts another test right now, it would be difficult for us to get our confirmation. Well, you are the one who tested him. Since that is your opinion, we will do as you say. Let's retreat for now. We've been out for too long. Wait, you dirty bag of bones. Azel glared at Zeta as he panted. Zeta returned his gaze. I'll give you a chance to avenge yourself next time. You should rest right now, test taker. You will have plenty of opportunities if you stay alive. The darkness emitted by Zeta swallowed Azel. Ah, annoying, bastard. As this thought ran across Azel's mind, he lost consciousness. Azel's consciousness traveled to a time long before. He returned to a time when he had still been young and inexperienced. It's a dream. Azel knew this to be true. He hadn't meant for this to happen. But his sense of desire before he fell unconscious had guided him to this point. What is needed for the humans to win against the dragon demon race? A middle-aged man, who possessed a large body, asked the question. Azel was a tall man, but the other man was a head taller than Azel. Moreover, the man possessed brown skin color, and a black beard. From Azel's perspective, the man had an exotic appearance. He was Azel's third teacher, Liglan. He was a dual swordsman, who used two curved sword. He was a frightening high rank spirit order practitioner, who was greater than anyone Azel had known at the time. He was royalty from a desert kingdom. After his kingdom was exterminated by the dragon demon army, he became well known in the Nadic Empire for his bravery. At the time, Azel had been an unaffiliated knight, and he had decided to fight alongside Liglan. Azel had been awed by his courage and righteousness. Liglan carried himself like royalty as he possessed boldness and dignity. He was a brave general, who struck fear into the dragon demon army. Moreover, Liglan considered Azel to be the one to bring hope to this era of darkness. This was why he had taken in the unaffiliated knight, who had wandering from place to place. Liglan taught Azel techniques that hadn't been taught to him by his previous masters. Azel spoke. I guess one needs the dragon demon key. The dragon magic key was the ultimate weapon. It was made using one's soul as ingredient and it required the use of refined power of a dragon. This was a miraculous tool that was available to the spirit order practitioners, who were standing at the zenith of their ability. It was rare to find someone, who possessed this miraculous tool. Moreover, each of these men held enough power to be able to contend against the strong players of the dragon demon army. Liglan was one of them. Up until now, he had fought eight dragons to the death, and the result of his victories was the dragon maken in the form of two swords that made up a pair. Liglan shook his head from side to side. No, then what is it? The answer is more simple than that. It's power. The dragon demon race was born with a powerful body at birth in comparison to humans. Even a frail-looking woman possessed enormous strength to be able to rip a wild beast in half with her bare hands. Moreover, those from the dragon demon race was lightning fast even if they hadn't cultivated. If they decided to kill a normal person, one wouldn't even be able to see their movements. The dragon demon race had extreme perception that allowed him to control their abilities. They also possessed special magic called the dragon demon magic, which exceeded the magic of a high-rank human magician. Even if a being from the dragon demon race never learned any battle techniques, one of them had the power to take on a hundred humans. Yet those beings cultivate their own martial arts called the dragon ridge arts, and they research about magic. Humans are like practice targets they could kill at their whim. Techniques were insufficient in being able to contend against them. One needed power. Who cares if one could hit them if they were unharmed afterwards? What was the point in being able to block their attacks if one's entire defense would be blown into pieces? If you want to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them, 
you have to move past the so-called limits of a normal human. That's the minimum requirement. You have to become as strong as a monster, and fast as a lightning. Then you will be able to stand at the starting line. Is there an alternative answer to the Dragon Slayer's ritual? If one was victorious in the Dragon Slayer's ritual, one could strengthen one's body through the dragon's power. It was the magical key that freed one from the limit one reached through cultivation. Liglan had performed the Dragon Slayer's ritual eight times, and he had moved past the limitations of a human. However, that wasn't the entire story. Didn't it mean one had to already have enough power to be able to fight and kill a dragon in the Dragon Slayer's ritual? If one already had the power to kill a dragon, one already had the power to contend against the dragon demon race. Liglan spoke. Azel, your teachers were very outstanding. I can tell just by looking at you. I wish Balf was still alive. I would have liked to meet him. He taught you about the extreme senses. However, he probably wasn't able to pass on everything he wanted before he died. It is now my responsibility to fill in that gap. Balf's mad teachings allowed Azel to possess superhuman senses that was superior to most spirit order practitioners. However, a young man like him wasn't able to overcome a high-level spirit order practitioner with just his potential in hand. The techniques were too strong and profound. You've done well in learning ways to strengthen your mind. I have nothing to teach you regarding that topic. I can only give you some knacks to help you. However, I can teach you a lot about strengthening your body. The problem is this can't be achieved in an instant. If you want a powerful body, you have invest enough time into it. You are basically saying I have to stay alive for me to achieve this. Yes. A horn rang out far in the distance. It was a signal that alerted everyone that the enemies were coming. The soldiers within the fortress moved busily as they got ready to face the dragon demon army. Liglan climbed the stairs to the castle walls as he spoke. We don't have the luxury of isolating ourselves to grow our power like the cultivators of old. However, I don't want you to kill hundreds to thousands of people to grow your power. I never wanted to do such a thing. Please stay alive until you are able to learn everything I have to teach you. As your teacher, this is the only promise I want from you. Can you give me that promise? Well, of course, I'll do that. Azel laughed. However, the promise hadn't been kept. It was Liglan, not Azel, who had broken the promise. Chapter 67. Dragon Demon Weapon Producers. Part 1. When he opened his eyes, Azel realized he was crying. The rims of his eyes was wet, and tears flowed across his cheeks to land on the pillow. You are awake. He heard Chiron's voice. He raised his hand to wipe away his tears, but Azel flinched. Don't be rash in moving. I've been told your ribs and arm bones are broken. Ah, I'm in such a state from a single blow. It makes me resent my feeble body again. The healer had a differing opinion. Your internal organs hadn't ruptured. He was surprised at how sturdy you were. Chiron spoke in an apathetic manner. Azel turned his head to look at Chiron, and he couldn't hold back his laughter. Duke, your eyes. Er, uh, Chiron's eye was swollen blue. Chiron spoke as he covered his eye with his hand. That corpse bastard was quite formidable. I've never seen an undead from the dragon demon race. He was of the dragon demon race. I confirmed it when I broke his helm. I had split his head open, and for a brief moment, I let my guard down. His sword had sliced through the undead skull, and his sword had lodged in its body. Chiron thought he would have some respite, but Delta had punched Chiron in such a state. This made his eye swell up. Chiron had never suffered such humiliation. After letting out a laugh, Azel was racked with pain. I can't even laugh like I want to. That's what you get for daring to laugh at my expense. How long was I out? You were out a little bit longer than your normal sleeping time. The healer found it very interesting that your body was in a mess yet your condition was very stable. I'm used to maintaining my body, while I'm hurt. The habit is engraved in my bones. Azel let out a bitter laugh. During the Dragon Demon War, he had frequently escaped from the throes of death. When he received a wound, he used a technique to minimize the effect of the wound. His harsh experiences allowed him to reach the zenith of this technique. It was nothing for him to maintain his body even when he was unconscious. 
Chiron spoke. You are no worse for wear. My body is a mess. What are you talking about? I meant your state of mind. You were crying in your sleep. I thought you were crying so much, because you were enraged by your loss. When you see a man's tears, it is courteous to act like you never saw it. Is there really such a courtesy? Somehow, my mouth feel itchy, and I feel like telling Arietta about this next time I see her. Well, all right. Anyways, how are you doing? I'm not doing so great. My inside is boiling. I thought you were a daredevil, who wasn't afraid of anything in this world, because you've never experienced any loss. I'm a little bit surprised that this wasn't true. Azel had passed through death's door after experiencing a sudden defeat. However, he hadn't been consumed by the shock. For those with incredible potential, they put a lot of faith into their power. This means the shock of defeat is that much larger when they lose. Azel spoke. I've never had the luxury of doing that. When one fights, one could lose, get hurt or die. The important part for me is to stay alive. Then I can use my sword for revenge next time. Sometimes you say things I really like. That's a problem. Chiron stood up. Azel asked a question. What happened to them? When you fell, they ended the fight then they retreated. The annoying kid went with them. I see. They said they'll be back. I don't know when. Chiron spoke as he was about to exit the room. I'll ask them to bring your meals here. We'll be staying here for four more days. Don't think about moving and just rest. Your schedule is going to be delayed, because of me. I apologize. Stop it. The doctor recommended that time frame. Also, you were beaten by an organization I am affiliated with. I'll be very embarrassed if you apologize to me. Anyways, I left the capital, because it was too much work there. It isn't as if I'm in a hurry, so don't worry about it. Rest. Chiron exited, and Azel was alone. For a brief moment, he blankly stared at the empty air, and he had a thought. Should I trust those bastards? There were too many suspicious aspects to their story to just blindly trust the Guardian Shadows. He had no idea what the ghost-like member of the Guardian Shadow was, but undeads could only be born through the use of evil black magic. First, I have to break that test or whatever they were suggesting. Then I'll be able to get some more information. Unfortunately, he was a weakling right now. He couldn't catch the dragon shadows and extract the truth out of them. He had no choice, but to be pulled by their machination. It had been a long time since he felt this feeling of powerlessness. Azel showed a face he kept hidden from Chiron. His face crumpled, and he grinded his teeth. Azel was still weak after four days. Even if they spent a lot of money on a healer, there was limit on how much a human body could heal. There was a limit to one's recuperative powers. Still, it wasn't as if Azel couldn't move. This was why the two of them went back on the road. Chiron asked him a question. Are you really okay? Well, my bones have somewhat mended. If I don't overdo it, I'll be fine. We'll travel 30 kilometers per day. Are you trying to kill me? Then how about 20 kilometers? Let's try it first. Azel grumbled as he traveled across a mountain, lake, and the plains. Azel was able to power through 30 kilometers of travel in a single day. After a week, he had made a full recovery even though his body was being abused daily. They were finally able to enter into the Dukedom of Tarantos. However, the Dukedom of Tarantos was so large that it took them two days to arrive at the castle. Even though, he was a lord that ruled over such a large domain, Chiron refused to reveal his identity. Everyone knew he was of the dragon demon race, so he had disguised himself as a human. This was why no one recognized him. Their incognito traveling lasted until they reached the Tarantos castle. When the two of them were in the immediate vicinity of the Tarantos castle, Chiron asked a question. What do you think? It's wonderful. Azel had expressed his honest opinion. The Tarantos castle was surrounded by a wonderful city. This place was the heart of the Tarantos dukedom. The castle couldn't be compared in terms of grandness to the other lords' castles Azel had seen on his travel here. With the ancient castle at the center, the city was very well landscaped. Moreover, a large wall surrounded the city. Chiron spoke. My parents were very artistic. I didn't inherit that particular trait. You were quite honest. I've lived a long time, 
but I don't have any profound knowledge about the arts. The people of my domain should be thankful that I hadn't been burdened with making this city. I have no opinions on Duke's artistic sense. However, I'll admit your ancestors had excellent artistic sense. You always add in an insolent phrase. Chiron took off his disguise before he entered the Taranto's castle. The Duke is back. The guards yelled out in surprise when they saw him. The news spread quickly, and there were commotions in various parts of the castle. Chiron asked the guard to bring two horses, and they got on the horses. Azel asked a question. I thought you said running is faster than riding. I have to put up a front of dignity in front of the my people. If I don't, they'll nag me about it. The people below me always tell me what to do. Sometimes I wonder who is really in charge. Azel watched the streets as he rode on his horse. The people lining up on the streets let out a fervent cheer when they saw Chiron. It's the Duke. Look over there. The Duke is here. Chiron waved their hands towards them. The women looked like they were about to faint from the pleasure of being waved at. Azel spoke. Your popularity is almost as high as the princess. I've done well in my role as a lord. Do you admire me a little bit more now? I'm just surprised the residents of your domain aren't reserved around you. When the lord's authority becomes stronger, it manifests itself on the attitudes of the residents. When the lord's party passes by, wasn't it normal for residents to lower their head in silence? However, they weren't showing any signs of acting that way. They just showed their love for Chiron. I hate being stuffy. I'm of the dragon demon race, and I really won't be popular if I acted that way. Ah, the human society was united now, but the scar left over from the dragon demon war was still present. Those of the dragon demon race still had to be cautious on how they treated humans. This was the reason why the dragon demon princess and dragon demon prince still existed. Even if he was called the living legend, Chiron was also one of the dragon demon race. Moreover, he was in a position where he had to rule over humans as their lord. This was why he didn't like coming out to official events. He was well aware of his situation as a lord belonging to the dragon demon race. Azel suddenly asked a question. Do you like humans, Duke? It's a question with a set answer. Well, you can tell me a little bit of your true feelings to me. I'll do so if you answer my questions truthfully. You are being cheap trying to make such a deal. You don't like it? No. I'll agree to it. All right. I like humans, Sir Azel. I was born in a noble family affiliated to a human country. I've never hated the responsibility of a lord. Is that a satisfactory answer? It's enough. Chiron's answer made Azel think about his old comrades. During the Dragon Demon War, his comrades had opposed the will of the Dragon Demon King, who wanted to dominate the humans. They received gazes filled with hatred and mistrust. From humans they were pitiable existence, who put their lives on the line for their love of humans. His comrades had wanted to save the humans. Azel suddenly asked a question. There is something I am curious about, Duke. What is it? I think it's my turn to ask you a question. Why are you being like this? Amongst the dragon demon race in this country. At that moment, Azel stopped speaking. Azel was so surprised that he didn't even feel Chiron staring at him with a quizzical glance. Rogan, servants were lined up in front of the entrance to the Taranto's castle. At the center, a dragon magen in a butler's garb was standing there. Normally, people would be surprised at the fact that a dragon magen was being employed as a butler. However, Azel's brain wasn't even thinking such thoughts. He's still alive. His face looked like someone Azel had known. Chiron asked a question. What's wrong? That person. Him. Who? Ro. Ah. Nothing. Azel suddenly came to his senses. When they arrived a bit closer, his memory and the present overlapped, and he started seeing discrepancies. The dragon magen butler looked surprisingly like Rogan, but it wasn't him. He's a dragon magen. Rogan was of the dragon demon race. He wasn't a dragon magen. Still, he looked surprisingly like Rogan. Even his age range looked to be around what Azel remembered. This dragon magen was in his late 30 or early 40s. His skin color was a bit dusky. His eyes were blue like the clear autumn sky, and his hair color was a faded blonde. His ears were slightly pointed, 
and he had small gray horns curving atop his ears. It looked like a ram's horn. On the back of his hand, there was a somewhat murky blue-colored dragon demon stone. Azel was acting strange. Sir Chiron spoke. Him. Are you surprised by Havans? I guess I can understand why. Since he is acting as a butler when he is a dragon magian. I guess such a thing can happen. Azel replied as he couldn't tear his gaze away from Havans. They weren't the same person, but they were almost identical. Rogan. He was from the dragon demon race, and he had fought alongside Azel in the dragon demon war. He had fallen in love with a human woman, and they had produced a young child. Azel remembered Rogan bashfully showed a portrait of his wife and child. Azel considered him to be more human rather than a being from the dragon demon race. Azel spoke with faraway look in his eyes. I remember it now. What do you mean? I thought he looked very similar to someone. In the beginning, I thought he was someone I knew, but I was mistaken. Do you perhaps know Rogan of the dragon demon race? He had an active role in the dragon demon war. Sir Rogan was Havan's grandfather. I see. He looks exactly like the portrait I saw. Ah ha. Is that why you were so surprised? The memory suddenly popped into my mind. Azel tried very hard to give the impression that everything was fine. The existence of Havans, who made him think about the past, gave him a huge shock. He had accepted the fact that he had been thrown into this era on his own, and he was trying to live with this fact. However, he couldn't erase the loneliness he felt. Chapter 68 Dragon Weapon Producers. Part 2. Azel asked a question. I'm having a hard time remembering the content of the book I read. Do you perhaps know what happened to Rogan? He passed away. It happened before I was born. Even for the dragon demon race, 220 years was a long time. They lived much longer than a human, but their lifespan was between 300 to 500 years. I see. Azel put on a bitter smile at the answer. His foolish anticipation had made his heart pound, and he found it to be ridiculous. At that moment, Havans spoke. You were late, Duke. We were worried about you. I ran into an accident in the middle of the trip. It would have been great if you could have sent word ahead. I wasn't in the right frame of mind. Moreover, I'm late, because my friend here is weaker than I had anticipated. You are using a guest as an excuse. That is beyond lame. It is very rare for you to bring a guest. I am the one in charge of managing the household of Duke Tarantos. I am the butler, Havans. I welcome you to the Tarantos Castle. My name is Azel Zestringer. I'm a knight. It is a pleasure to meet you. Azel's voice shook slightly. Havans's voice also reminded him of Rogan. Havans spoke. You possess the same name as the legendary hero. It seems your parents were very well versed in history. They named you as a Zestringer. Do you know about that name? I know it quite well. My grandfather had fought alongside the hero Azel Kazark. Havans put on a smile. Azel looked at Havans with a complicated expression when Chiron spoke. Let's head in first. Please ready a room for our friend, Havans. Please show him that the dukedom of Tarantos isn't lacking compared to the capital. If I infer from your words, it seems he was a guest of the throne. Understood. Also, we've stocked your office. We readied it for your return. Him. Did you put a lot of effort into it? You can probably look forward to it. I don't know why my steward is so insolent. It is thanks to the Duke relaxing the family customs. Now, now. Many people are waiting for the Duke. Those are unwelcoming news. Azel couldn't suppress his laughter when he caught sight of Chiron's expression. He looked like a child, who didn't want to do his homework. However, his expression changed at Havans's next words. Count Michael is here. That old fart is already here. You are of the same age as him. He'll feel very disappointed if you spoke that way. I'm still young, so it's okay. Chiron snorted. Azel was able to meet Chiron once again at dinner time. A servant appeared to deliver the dinner invitation, and Azel followed the servant to the dining room. Chiron wasn't waiting alone in the dining room. After waking up in this era, this magician was the oldest dragon magian he had encountered. Chiron spoke. Sit. Today's dinner is something the chef wanted to boast for a fortnight, so you can look forward to it. 
I look forward to it. This is Count Bjorin Michael. He is a foul-tempered old man. He also likes to be called Rulan Kingdom's Eastern Guardian. However, you don't have to remember the latter part, since it is all empty reputation. It'll become tiresome if you humor him. I admit my temper isn't that great, but there is no way my temper is bad as yours, Chiron. Biorin let out a snort. He looked at Azel as he spoke. Young friend, this is the first time I've met you, but I can already tell we will get along very well. My name is Azel Zestringer. I am a knight. It is an honor for a high-ranked magician to speak to me like this. If you don't mind me asking, what basis do you have that we will get along? I heard you gave the inner old geezer a good fight. I'm glad you punched that old geezer, who is always on his high horse. That's the only reason I need to like you. The inner old geezer is. Azel was able to suppress his laughter through great effort when he heard the expression. Chiron counted with his words. Isn't it better than looking old on the outside? If you aged gracefully, you won't hear such words from me. This is why I like this friend, who got one over you. I'm like this, because you speak like that. Also, the fact that he gave a bitter taste to Niberus of the dragon demon race is a bonus in his favor. You know her. I'm also part of the Guardian Shadow. Do I need to explain more? Biorin Michael was a powerful magician, and he was a person of interest to those in the field of darkness. He was known as the best magician in the Rulan Kingdom, and he had the title of Archmage. Biorin spoke. I chased after them before they exited our country. Unfortunately, I lost them. I was able to kill two underlings. Their runaway skill were exquisite. Maybe your skills were lacking. Chiron spoke in a sarcastic manner. Biorin furrowed his eyebrows. Why do you always have to talk like that? Also, didn't you fail to catch them, when you had them in your sight? My aim was to save Arietta. My goal wasn't to catch them. Well, the excuse is no surprise, coming from you. Biorin clicked his tongue. Chiron spoke. This conversation is making me lose my appetite. Let's talk after the dinner. How's our hospitality? It is on par with what I experienced at the royal palace. Azul's compliment was the truth. The Taranto's castle had treated him incredibly well. The guest room that was given to him was nice, and the servants were incredibly meticulous in their work. Chiron was satisfied with the answer. You'll soon find out about our chef's skill. His words were true. The Taranto's castle's chef brought out his secret new item for the main course. Azel felt very happy as he ate his meal. After the dinner, the three of them retired to Chiron's office. Biorin asked a question. Are you really going to make a dragon weapon for that young friend? I meant what I said. Well, the ingredients are all prepared, so we can do it. This is the first time I've seen you show favoritism to someone. It isn't as if I want to show favoritism to him. He isn't one of my people, but I lost a bet with him. I have no choice. You are making him a dragon weapon just from losing some sparring matches. If this fact was spread, swordsmen from all over the country would come here to find you with their torches lit. Biorin was talking about the dragon sword Chiron used when he spoke about the dragon weapon. He was one of figures, who had come up with the method of producing the dragon sword with Chiron. Moreover, he also had a dragon weapon of his own. Azel had asked for a favor that was equivalent to all the matches he had won against Chiron. Azel wanted Chiron to make him a dragon sword. This was related to the request he had given to Arietta. Azel had asked Arietta to gather all the ingredients need to make a dragon weapon from the dragon's corpse located at the Balan Forest. Arietta gladly granted his request, and the ingredients listed by Chiron had arrived at the Taranto's castle. Chiron spoke. However, I think it is worth investing in him. I want to verify if what he says is true. Are you talking about the Dragon Slayer's ritual? Yes. Him. Well, if you don't like this idea, you can always test it out yourself. A Dragon Magian can also be the beneficiary of the ritual. If it is you, you'll be able to come out victorious against a one-on-one -on -one battle with a dragon. It isn't as if it is impossible. If you are successful, you'll earn the power of a dragon. Isn't that a gamble worth doing? I'll decline. I can't believe you are suggesting me to do such a crazy thing. It seems you are itching to push me into my grave. 
Biorin was called the strongest magician of this kingdom. Yet he wouldn't fight one on one against a dragon based on an unreliable information. He grumbled. I like this guy. But why does he want to do such a crazy thing? Of course, a spirit order practitioner probably has a better chance of winning than a magician. This is assuming the magician and the spirit order practitioner are of similar quality. Dragons were a very bad opponent for a magician. A dragon's magic was something that couldn't even be compared to what the dragon demon race used. A dragon had a direct control over nature. This was why their resistance to magic was incredibly high. Even a magician like Biorin wouldn't be able to use elemental magics like flame, cold air or thunder. It wasn't effective at all against a dragon. Moreover, Azel spoke. Dragons can steal spells, and it can be used against a magician. Him. You are very knowledgeable about dragons. Biorin was surprised. Dragons showed an extraordinary amount of intelligence when they faced humans. The dragons understood the language of humans. They even comprehended the techniques used against them, and they adapted to it. The problem was the huge disadvantage a magician possessed when fighting a dragon. When the magician used an element controlled by the dragon, the dragon could mimic the magician's magic. The dragon would send back the mage's spell. This was why there was a prevalent theory amongst the magicians that dragons had the ability to read a human's visual cue. Azel spoke. It isn't too different for a spirit order practitioner when facing a dragon. If one uses a technique that can be mimicked by a dragon, spirit order practitioners can suffer the same fate as magicians. This is why one has to make preparations from the beginning. Preparations. What kind? If we consider the theory spoken by the duke to be true, one would have to guard one's visual cue from being read. When Azel fought the earth dragon, he had a set of rules he followed strictly. Even during the dragon demon war, the ecology of the dragon had a lot of holes. However, the hypothesis of a dragon reading a human's visual cue existed back then too. However, Carlos had confirmed this theory. This was why when he went through the dragon slayer's ritual, he used several techniques that allowed him a measure of defense against the dragon. Biorin asked a question. Then one will will be able to win against a dragon if one uses such methods. It isn't a guarantee. However, it is the minimum criteria one has to follow to win. Him. I ask the wrong question. I'm talking about you. If you gain a dragon weapon, will you be able to win against a dragon? I can't win against a dragon. Azel gave a firm answer. Biorin was taken aback, and he looked towards Chiron. Isn't this incongruous with what you told me earlier? He isn't done talking. Why don't you just listen to what he has to say until the end? This is the problem with old farts like him. He's impatient. Chiron made fun of Biorin, and Biorin's face crumpled. Azel let out a bitter laugh as he asked a question. Have you heard from the Duke about our travels? The person called the Keeper of the Prophecy and the undeads showed up in the guise of carrying out a test. That's what I heard. Do you have any knowledge about them? I don't have much information about them. However, I've seen the undead named Delta before. He's the one, who fought with Chiron. Do you mean the dragon demon undead? Yes. Him. Biorin searched through his memories. It happened around 20 years ago. I was trying to catch a dragon demon, who had stepped out of the field of darkness. The dragon demon was very strong, and to tell you the truth, I was barely handling him. The fact that you are speaking about it in such a manner means he was that strong. Chiron asked in surprise. Biorin nodded his head. First, shall I tell you about the woman named Niberus? I was in the position of advantage when I was chasing her. However, the result of a one-on-one -on -one battle with her would be a coin flip. If one considered only the dragon demon magic, she was almost on par with you. She performed advanced magic, but she was still very inexperienced in how she used him. I've already heard you tell that story. I thought that woman had nothing to do with the incident 20 years ago. This will be easier if you have a reference point to compare. The dragon demon I was chasing was much stronger than Niberus. She couldn't hold a candle to him. If one considered his dragon demon magic, he was almost on par with a dragon. Can you comprehend what I'm trying to say? What? You are surely over-exaggerating it. It isn't an exaggeration. It was as I said. He fought me, 
my disciples and thirty other guardian shadow members. He was actually prevailing over us. At that moment, a being appeared, and it was Delta. To be precise, the Keeper of Prophecy contacted the undeads from afar. After being contacted, three undeads appeared. It was Beta, Gamma and Delta. The three undeads had left an indelible impression on Biorin. However, even they couldn't gain an upper hand against the Dragon Demon, who was surrounded by ominous Dragon Demon magic. In the battle, Beta and Gamma was exterminated. Delta was the only one that survived, and he returned to the Keeper of the Prophecy. That is all I know regarding them. Basically, I crushed the skull of your benefactor. To make up for it, Duke's eye was. Stop right there. Shut your mouth. Who? It seems you left out something in your story. It sounds very interesting. Don't try to find out more about it. Azel, if you say anything, then I'll talk about the time you were sleeping. You get what I'm saying. Chet. The blackmailed Azel clicked his tongue as if it was unfortunate that he wouldn't be able to tell the story. Biorin snickered. Well, I don't know the whole story, but it seems my friend here suffered some kind of indignity. Well, all right, even as someone inside the Guardian Shadows, I knew that the Keeper of the Prophecy and his associates were a bit on the weird side. Moreover, you are one of the candidates that they consider to be important. I don't know why. They kept referring me as the person in the prophecy, but I don't know the content of the prophecy. I do not know the content either. That is a problem. If I had my way, I would shake them by their neck to get him to talk. I feel the same way regarding that point. Their curtain of secrecy is a bit too strange. It's been several dozen years for me. Biorin grumbled. Chiron was also unsatisfied as a member of the Guardian Shadows. Azel spoke. It seems our conversation got sidetracked. Him. The reason I spoke about that. In the end, the reason I lost at the time is the same reason why I won't be able to win against a dragon. If one wants to win against a dragon, one needs more than techniques. One needs strength. For a spirit order practitioner, one had to go through the dragon slayer's ritual to truly break past one's limit. However, one had to have the power to win against a dragon without the benefit of the dragon slayer's ritual. If one was at that level, one was already at a stage where one would be able to win against a dragon demon. This was the dilemma faced by the high rank spirit order practitioners of Azul's era. To earn the absolute power, one already had to possess what was considered to be absolute power by human standard. With my current strength, there is no way I can go through the dragon slayer's ritual. I'll most definitely die. Him. So this won't be solved by you gaining a dragon weapon. No. So what are your plans? I have to focus on my training for a short amount of time. I'll continue until I reach an acceptable level. That's all you need to do. It isn't that easy to gain the power you lack. Biorin started to give counsel to Azel. He was a magician, but he had a lot of knowledge about the spirit order. He knew that the quantity of magical energy for a spirit order practitioner couldn't be increased dramatically. However, Azel was full of confidence. I'll prove it to you through the result. Currently, that is all I can say to assure you. For reference, Azel had done a lot of things after we woke up, but it had only been two months. In such a short amount of time, Azel had made three rings of life. Moreover, with his own secret technique, he was able to add the dual banding. Of course, this had been possible, because he went through the dragon slayer's ritual. Moreover, he had absorbed the dragon demon key left behind by Carlos. Still, he hadn't had the time to really train, and build up his body. His progress had been amazing considering the amount of abuse his body had suffered in battle. It was inevitable, but anyone who had fought Azel had wondered why he had so little magic. As a spirit order practitioner, one's magic was proportional to one's skill. It increased in a rising curve. When one moved up the stages of spirit order, it meant one's ability to control magic had gone up. It allowed one to be able to control more magic in marvelous ways. This allowed one to strengthen one's energy pulse, strengthen the bowl holding one's magic and increase the number of ring of life. In the past, Azel had eight rings of life. He had been an octuple master. If given enough time, 
He was confident he would be able to exceed his former self, even without the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Biorin spoke. Him. All right. I'll put my trust in you for now. This was how they decided to manufacture the Dragon Sword for Azel. Chapter 69. Dragon Weapon Producers. Part 3. The Dragon Sword wasn't easily manufactured. It was also something that couldn't be done with only Chiron and Michael. Chiron had to gather all the qualified individuals in his domain, and he would have to begin his preparations. Chiron asked a question. So when are you going to entertain my knights? I'm interested in fighting him, but I would like to train on my own for now. All right, I have a lot of work backed up, so I'll leave you unattended. Unattended sounds a bit. When I'm done with my work, you better play with me often. Duke, if someone overhears you, they might misconstrue what you are trying to say. Azel spoke sarcastically. Chiron ignored him, and he spoke. Anyways, I won't be able to do anything else once I start making the dragon weapon. This is especially true in the beginning. How long will it take to complete it? It'll take around half a year. I could do it faster, but I'm not in that much of a hurry. Then I'll finish my training within that time frame. You do that. If I do drop by in the middle of your training, don't forget to play with me. I can do that at the very least. Azel smirked. Chiron spoke. If you need anything, don't hesitate to speak up. If my budget allows it, I will help you in any way I can. Him. How big is your budget? To my regret, the Dukedom of Taranto's is very affluent. I have so much stuff that even if I half-ass my work and focus on my training, my wealth would expand. I see. Then, Azel thought for a brief moment, then he asked for what he needed. In the end, this is for your benefit too, so I won't turn down your help. If possible, please provide me with as many weapons, armors, magical recovery potions and healers assigned to heal me. Also, I need a location where I can make a lot of noise without causing any problems. I'll lend you one of my villas I retreat to when I train. Why do you need weapons and armors? I have a use for them. Also, the healers. Do you need more than one? I would like as many as possible. Why do you need them? I plan on getting hurt a lot. It'll probably be a bit too taxing for a single healer. I have no idea what you are trying to do. Well, if you are curious, you can come visit me. Also, you can assign someone to observe what I'm doing. Since you are investing in me, I can tolerate that. That's. Chiron put on a smile. That's an attractive offer. So does this mean you aren't worried about others stealing your secret? Spirit order practitioners were like the magicians. They were very sensitive about the training methods they used. No. Anyone would be wary about revealing secret techniques that was related to one's survival. If one kept that in mind, Azel's offer was unprecedented. Azel spoke. I won't stop you. All right. I'll give you servants, and I'll stick someone to you that'll steal all your secrets. Since you need some time to get ready, you can leave for the villa tomorrow morning. I require your presence when I'm making the dragon weapon so I'll notify you when I need you. Understood. Azel would be leaving the Taranto's castle, and he would travel to Chiron's villa, which was located near the Lance Mountain. There were several locations designated as places where Chiron would train, and this was one of them. It was deep within the mountain, and it was far from prying eyes. The Lance Mountain was the closest one, and this was why it was prepared for immediate human habitation. Moreover, Azel was a bit surprised at the person that had been assigned to him by Chiron. I'll be by your side for a while. During the night, Havans had come to Azel to speak to him. Azel had her expression as if he had been struck a blow. Aren't you the steward of this household, Mr. Havans? Yes, I am. Yet you are going to attend me. Even if I am not here, the castle will run pretty well by itself. This was true when the Duke wasn't here and it will still be the case now. There are a lot of talented people in the Taranto's castle. Him. Moreover, I don't want you to pay attention to my identity. I'm a dragon magian and a noble, yet I have spent a long time waiting on human guests. I don't feel any resistance towards it. Moreover, it isn't as if I'm going to serve you alone. How many people are you bringing? I'm thinking about bringing around 30 people. Please don't look at me like that. Those personnel are needed to maintain the country villa. 
I guess the place is quite big. Amongst the training locations used by the Duke, it is the ideal spot if you want to live in the wild. It is the closest location to the castle, so we spent a lot of effort in maintaining it. Still, if you don't like the place to be crowded, I can bring around 15 people. That still seems like a lot. You aren't the only person we have to serve, Sir Azel. Three healers will be staying with us. Understood. Azel acquiesced. It would have been different if he was going alone. However, he didn't want to inconvenience the healers, because of what he preferred. Azel spoke. I guess you are the spy the Duke is sending, Mr. Havans. I feel like I've been pulled into a game, and it'll be quite fun. The Duke didn't have anyone else suited for the job, so he sent me. Since it has been a while since he had to listen to my nagging, I think he needed an excuse to send me away for a bit, Havans had a wide smile on his face. When he saw his smile, it reminded Azel of Rogan, and he became distracted. Azel tried his best to hide his reaction as he spoke. Well, you seem to be quite skilled. I can tell from looking at your dragon demon magic that you've tempered it at some point. Those from the dragon demon race and the dragon magian was like the humans and their magic. There was a huge difference between those who trained their dragon demon key and those who didn't. Havans had the profile of someone who had trained his dragon demon key. Do you mind if I ask why a person like you is working as a steward? You seem to be in your prime as a dragon magian. Isn't it too early to retire from being a knight? As you have surmised, I was a knight until ten years ago. Dragon magians were different from the dragon demon race. They matured at the same speed as humans until their secondary sexual characteristics developed. Still, the early stages of their life was longer than the humans, Sir Azel guessed Havans was in his late fifties or early sixties. However, the work wasn't right for me. It didn't matter if I had the talent or not. As I lived my life as a knight, I found myself more interested in how an organization was run instead of the battles. Moreover, I found I liked fixing odd problems. This was why I told the Duke my intention to retire and become a steward. The Duke made me the heir to the previous steward on the spot. That's the truth. If the Duke makes up his mind, he'll immediately act on it. He definitely does that. Azel let out a bitter laugh. At the same time, he thought about Rogan. It seems appearance isn't the only thing that is similar to him. Rogan had been a powerful warrior from the dragon demon race. Rogan had won the confidence of his third teacher Liglan as a comrade. However, Rogan always focused more on preparation and planning rather of a battle rather than stepping forward to fight on the battlefields. In truth, he was more talented at it. Azel remembered him grousing at times. Azel, what are you going to do when this shitty war ends? I've never thought about it. You are young, yet you are speaking that way. You need a dream. I'm sorry, but there can be no dreams bigger than defeating the dragon demon king. What about you? I want to go to my wife's homeland, and I want to become a merchant. I'll become a great merchant that everyone will look up to. Geez, it is a dream that is very befitting you. If someone else heard it, they'll say it is a dream that doesn't suit someone from the dragon demon race. It was as Rogan had said. He had returned to his wife's homeland when the dragon demon war ended. Maybe, he did become a great merchant as he had once dreamed. The only thing thing he could confirm was the fact that Rogan had descendants. Even after 200 years, the descendant remembered how Azel and Rogan had fought together. Azel was lost in reverie when Havan spoke. This is the first time I've been tasked to spy on someone. However, I'll give it my best. Please don't get uncomfortable if I stare at you too much. I don't really like receiving such a hot gaze from a man. However, it was something I suggested, so it can't be helped. Please look after me. It was the afternoon of the next day. Azel and Havans climbed the Lance Mountain. Azel was shocked when he found out 70 people would be ascending the mountain. However, Havans was unperturbed. There are a lot of porters here. They'll descend afterwards. You requested too much luggage, Sir Azel. Azel had requested as much weapons, armors and magic recovery potions that could be spared. Chiron had gathered all the items within the castle. It was so much that it would be impossible for 15 people to transport it. 
The Lance Mountain was pretty large. They reached the summit where a villa was built next to a valley. By then, the sun had almost set. The workers were busy moving and organizing the luggage. Azel was surprised by the villa's facilities. Which era was is this ruins from? The estate on the Lance Mountain was about as big as one would expect from a noble. However, the surprising part was the fact that the estate was connected to a relic built towards the inner mountain. Havan spoke. I've heard it was made around four to five hundred years ago. After excavating it, all the dangerous elements were cleared out. While building this estate, part of the ruins were renovated. It was meant to be a place where one could evacuate to in case of emergency. However, around 30 years ago, the Duke added another facility where he could train by himself. I see. Azel had thought there would be an estate inside an untouched mountain. So what the hell was this? This was a training facility connected to a ruin. Even if the training facility hadn't been built, there was a very useful magical solution here. It'll be hard to destroy this place, since it is equipped with a magic circulation device. It would have been really expensive to build all of this. This is much better than what I expected. If one expended magical energy within the training facility, it'll be absorbed and circulated. It would create an ideal environment for a spirit order practitioner. When he asked Havans about it, he was told the amount the facility could absorb could be increased. I've never even thought about these kinds of methods. I'll have to thank the Duke again next time I see him. He was honest in his admiration. This facility would be very useful for Azel. If he wanted to recover a great deal of magical energy in a short amount of time, it would require drinking magic recovery potions. However, if he used this facility, he would be able to progress much faster than his previous estimation. Havan spoke. I don't know about other things, but he is very meticulous about his training. The problem is he doesn't spare any expense when he builds these facilities. People made a big fuss about organizing the villa, and since the sun was already set, the employees had to stay over for the night. However, Azel started his training immediately. He wasn't in a state where he could use the facilities available at the estate. The mountain was a good enough training ground for him right now. I have to build up my body. Azel was going to prioritize doing that instead of expanding his magic reservoir. He had been awakened two months ago. He had been a skeleton, but now he was healthier than a normal person. Still, it wasn't enough. Magical energy had to seep into every part of his body or he wouldn't be able to exceed limitation of a human. The spirit order practitioner used magical energy to amplify one's physical ability. However, the amplification would be more effective if one's basic capability was high. Moreover, it would be easier to cope with bigger amplification when one had a sturdier body. He had to eat, train like crazy then rest. If he didn't eat, he couldn't remake his body. No matter how much he trained, his body would be slowly ruined if he didn't eat. There were those who had become strong through live battles, but that was the experience side of becoming strong. If a martial artist received a wound in a live battle, there was a possibility of regression. In the past two months, Azel didn't have the time to recover and train. He didn't have that luxury. He had to fight powerful foes with a lacking body and he had to repeatedly squeeze out every ounce of his capabilities. He hadn't made as much progress as he wanted, and it was a wonder that he had taken any steps backward. He had made an astonishing amount of progress in the two month, but it paled in comparison to his former self. Azel was thankful for the environment he was in, and he exhaustively went through what he had learned in the past. Chapter 70. Heroes Training. Part 1. Keepers of the Prophecy. The Guardian Shadows was an unidentified organization that was trying to eradicate dragon demon worshippers from the lands ruled by humans. They were beings shrouded in secrecy. We are no longer alive, so isn't it strange to use expression used by the living, Kid Epsilon? A youth, who gave off an arrogant impression, had spoken. He had light red hair, and his appearance was very glamorous. He had on a twisted smile that was a bit creepy. He was looking at the Taranto's castle from a long distance away. I don't know why I have to tell you every time I see you, but I'm older than you, Kid Zarez. Leon was the one, who had replied with an ambiguous tone. 
His words fluctuated from being respectful and insolent. He looked like a 15-year-old, yet he had lived for a very long time. His time had frozen when he made the contract with the Guardian Shadows to become a Keeper of Prophecy. Epsilon. It was Leon's name as the Keeper of the Prophecy. It was a codename for the fifth seat of the Keepers of the Prophecy. It was the same for Zerez. He held the fifteenth seat of the Keepers of the Prophecy. His codename was Omicron. But you are a kid. Also, our designated names have meanings behind them. Why do you insist on calling me by my name? Just call me as Omicron. I don't want to, big kid Zarez. If you want to treat me like human, shouldn't you be respectful towards the station I held as a human? I was someone of great importance before I became a keeper of the prophecy. You wouldn't have even dared to speak to me. It's quite fortunate for us. You have enough humanity left to blather on about your old glories. Hong. Leon replied without showing any signs of being angry. So Zarez lost interest. He turned his head away. After a brief silence, he spoke. What about the others? They aren't here yet. It is unfortunate, since I would have preferred to see the others before I saw you. I really have no idea what the criteria is for picking a keeper of the prophecy. I have no idea. No one amongst us knows. This is way beyond keeping secrecy. Why do we have to work in ignorance? The reason is very obvious. Anyways, since you've called me out here, just tell me your business. I thought you have a lot of free time. I'd rather observe the ants marching near the road. I don't want to waste my time listening to your sarcastic remarks. All right, I'll have to test that guy named Azel Zestringer to see if he is the prophesied being. I've already tested him. Didn't we arrive at a conclusion to give him more time? I don't remember agreeing to that conclusion. Moreover, your testing method was too soft. How will we be able to tell if he is the prophesied one, who could bring an end to those dragon demon king's damn organization? What are you going to do? It isn't as if you are going to fight him. I'll guarantee you'll cut off his head within three seconds. You have the eye to make such a judgment. I know how poor your skills are. How long do you think you will last when fighting Zeta? I think five seconds will be possible. It'll be hard to last past ten seconds. You are unexpectedly good at not overrating yourself. That is your sole strong point, Zarez. It isn't a strong point. It's just that I won't be able to do this job if I overrate myself. Still, I believe I have a better method to discern if he is the hero we have been waiting for. Zarez had a meaningful smile on his face. Leon really didn't like his expression. Please do not cause harm to the Dragon Sword Duke. He is one of the pillars of our organization and he has a fiery temper. He'll probably crush you before you can tell him about your own self-importance. Then he'll make you a corpse after you give an explanation. I like the sound of that. However, I have no plans on squandering my time here in this domain. Moreover, it would be a problem if the Dragon Sword Duke stepped forward to interfere. I will also partially respect the decision you and Zeta came up with. When I was coming here, I heard the Dragon Sword Duke is preparing a fun event for Azel Zestringer. He is going to order Azel Zestringer to do what those bastards at the Field of Darkness like to perform. You are talking about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. There was taint of insanity in Zarez's smile. Dragon Slayer's ritual. It was a knowledge that had been completely wiped off the world after the Great Darkness. However, the Keepers of the Prophecy still had the information in their custody. This was possible, because some of their members had been born before the Great Darkness. However, they didn't possess all the knowledge, and this was true about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. A ritual to gain the power of a dragon. This was all the information Leon and Zarez knew about the Dragon Slayer's ritual. Even before the Great Darkness, the knowledge about the Dragon Slayer's ritual had been scarce. At times, High-ranking Dragon Demon King worshippers exited the Field of Darkness. They carried out the Dragon Slayer's ritual away from prying human eyes. However, they didn't do the Dragon Slayer's ritual just because they wanted to get drunk on power. They did it to form the Dragon Key. However, even the Keepers of the Prophecy didn't know about the Dragon Key. Moreover, the Dragon Demon King worshippers used the Dragon Slayer's ritual to coerce the dragons into do their bidding. The dragons thirsted for the wisdom possessed by the humans, 
so the dragons never refused the dragon slayer's ritual. This was why the dragon demon king worshippers promised the dragons that they'll attempt the dragon slayer's ritual if the dragons grant them one boon beforehand. Zarez spoke. The earth dragon that attacked the dragon demon princess probably moved, because of that method. Chiron had reported what Arietta went through to the guardian shadows. The keepers of the prophecy shared this information amongst themselves. They suspected the dragon shadow used the dragon slayer's ritual as bait to get the earth dragon to act. Leon spoke. If it is as the dragon sword duke suspects, as El Zestringer completed the dragon slayer's ritual. It is good news, since he basically stole the dragon from under the dragon demon king worshippers. It is praiseworthy. However, if he did succeed in such a test, we have to confirm it with our eyes. Even if we don't do anything, wouldn't the dragon sword duke create a proper spectacle for us to observe? That won't be enough. We have to prepare a more flashy tribulation for him. If we use the humans, we'll be able to prepare a suitable stage. Him. You do as you please. You won't listen to me even if I try to stop you. You have to take care of the aftermath. You know me well. You can look forward to it. After saying those words, Zarez turned his body away. Havans had become a spy, who observed Azul's training. He was tasked to sending a report every week. In truth, he contacted the Taranto's castle more frequently than that. He had to attend Azel, and he had to manage the estate located in the Lance Mountain. Havans had a lot of things he needed to request. There was a magical communication array set up between the estate and the Taranto's castle. It was quite easy to contact the Duke. However, it had been 15 days since Chiron had heard Havans's report personally. Problems had cropped up in the early stages of manufacturing the dragon weapon. Chiron hadn't had the time to listen to the reports. The communication equipment was made out of glass and water. An enspilled bowl was filled with water, and the other side's image appeared when the magic was activated. When Havans's figure appeared on the surface of the water, Chiron asked a question. So how is he doing? You ask about him the instant you see me. Of course. He was the reason why I sent you there. I knew you would do that. Him. In my opinion, Sir Azel is a bit insane. What did he do that made you come up with such an assessment? He is great at coming up with weird methods to harm himself. I'm kind of worried that a rumor might start up about the methods he is using to try to kill himself. Him. Give me the specifics. He is fighting with himself. I'm guessing you don't mean it as figurative expression. Then I wouldn't have called it him trying harm himself. First, I'll tell you about the easiest one that you will be able to comprehend. He is self-sparring. Self-sparring. What is that? I didn't know what else to call it, so I made up the name. I don't know what method Sir Azel is using, but he is making clones of himself. He equips these clones with armors and swords, then he fights them diligently. Ha! Huh. Did I hear you wrong? The clones are using armor and weapon to fight the real body. I'm still having trouble believing what I saw, but it is really as I have said. It was as the word, self-sparring, implied. Havans continued to speak. I've continued to observe him, and the clones made by him are quite strong. In truth, they are at a level where I'm thankful I don't have to fight them. Sir Azel also has to fight them with all his strength. At the end of the session, he needs healing by the healers for the numerous wounds he receives. Him. Then there is the dance of the swords. What is that? This is something crazier. Even I'm able to use psychokinesis to move swords from a distance. But Sir Azel is able to move 20 swords at the same time. If one is allowed to use magic, it shouldn't be considered such an amazing task. Of course, one has to consider the amount of magic he has. I am willing to bet 100 gold that you aren't fully comprehending what I'm trying to say. I'm starting to get a little bit displeased. If a misunderstanding occurs after reading the regular report, then the report itself wasn't clear enough. This is why I implore you to be patient until I can give you a clear explanation. From my observation, the 20 swords moved as if each of them had a will of their own. Their movements was very sharp as if it was being swung by people. He was able to maintain it for 10 minutes. Basically, each sword moved as if the sword was being swung by different people. 
Each of the swords had a will of their own. Yes. It is scarier than twenty swordsmen charging at you. The tireless attacks are fearsome, and Sir Azel dodges them with bare hands. Moreover, he isn't pulling back on these attacks. He is a bloody mess at the end, and once he suffered a really deep cut. The healers are on their toes, because of all the wounds being taken by Sir Azel. I hope you aren't telling me to believe this nonsense. I'm a bit sad that you aren't trusting my words. You should come see it for yourself. Him. When he heard the stories, he felt dejected that he couldn't see it for himself. He was so curious that he felt jealous of Havans. That Azel. His skills seems to be boundless. Did he perhaps not even show half of his capabilities when sparring with me? The thought suddenly made him angry. The impudent kid dared to fight him without showing his entire capability. Moreover, he won numerous times despite doing this. Let's see what happens when his training ends. Chiron was very petty, so he made a firm resolution. Havans continued to speak. Duke, I have something I want to ask you. What is it? You said Sir Azel is short on magical energy. Is this really true? It's the truth. There is no room for doubt. Him. What is it again? For now, your assessment has been proven correct. Sir Azel falls over quite frequently from exhausting his magical energy. Every time that happens he drinks magic recovery potions like he's drinking water. I want to talk to you about the total cost of the magic recovery potions used by Sir Azel. I don't need to know about that kind of stuff. Just tell me what I want to hear about. He broke the training facility. It was only a wall on a single side, so the magic itself wasn't shattered. What? Chiron became surprised. Chapter 71. Heroes Training. Part 2. When the place was built, he had driven Biorin Michael hard into making this training ground. A powerful magic was placed, and most expenditure of force shouldn't even leave a dent. Of course, if Chiron made up his mind, he could destroy the place with his power. However, it was an impossible task if one considered Azul's level of magical energy. Havan spoke. To be more precise, lightning fell. Lightning strike. Are you saying he did this with an electrical attack? I don't mean it like that. Rain came down last night, and lightnings were falling. Sir Azel was hit by a lightning. Havans had on an expression that indicated he knew his words sounded preposterous. It was after Sir Azel's training session had ended. He was getting treatment inside the estate. However, he excused himself when the rain and wind started to rage outside. In the distance, the sound of lightning rang out. After a while, Sir Azel stood in the middle of the training grounds with his sword raised into the air, and the lightning struck him. So, I thought Sir Azel had died. I ran to him in surprise. Please don't ridicule me by saying I'm crazy. The lightning was surrounding Sir Azel's entire body. Then he expelled the power in one go, and it parted the wall open. You can come see it for yourself. It sliced open the wall, and the trees on the other side was all demolished. It left behind a huge wound that's about several hundred meter in length. That's impossible. Chiron let out a moan. There was a technique that allowed one to receive, control and emit the power of a lightning. A human who could do this existed. The more surprising part was the fact that he had read a historical account of a human doing a similar feat. Havan spoke as he observed Chiron's expression. I'm sure you are having the same thought as me. In fact, Sir Azel confirmed my suspicions. What did he say? Sir Azel named the technique as, Thunder Dragon's Horn. Chiron let out a low moan. Thunder Dragon's Horn. It was a trump card technique used on the battlefield by the hero Azel Karzak, who had defeated the dragon demon king Atain. His single strike had been something more than a lightning sent down by nature. The lightning was amplified to a much stronger strike. In the records, it was said he cut several thousand of the dragon demon army in half using this technique. Of course, Chiron hadn't believed the record to be true. He thought it was an exaggerated legend. He had also thought the part where Azel Kazark called down the lightning to use the thunder dragon's horn was a falsehood. Such an event happened right in front of my eyes. In truth, I thought the stories of my grandfather's exploits told by my parent were mixed in with idle boasts. However, the thunder dragon's horn 
shown by Sarazel was as it was described to me. That bastard. I really am curious as to what his real identity is. I'm also very curious. If someone told me Sir Azel was the reincarnation of the missing Azel Kazak, I would believe it. That's how I feel right now. This is not going to work. I'm going to immediately. If you are going to say you'll come here immediately, then please don't. It is the middle of the night right now. You will cause a lot of inconveniences. Up until a moment ago, Sir Azel was using another fresh method to torture himself. He fell over from exhaustion. I'll tell him you'll be coming here tomorrow morning. All right. If you want me to be patient, you'll have to give a detailed account of what this fresh method of torture entails. I'm getting thirsty from talking so much. I feel like drinking some good alcohol. I'll bring some tomorrow. Stop getting cute with me. Hurry up and talk. Understood. Today he, Havan spoke so much that he was worried he would have a hoarse throat afterward. However, he faithfully gave his report as a spy. Azul's life at the Lance Mountain estate was regimented. He woke up in the morning at six, and he carried out meditation and light training. Then he had breakfast at seven. After a brief break, he trained until lunchtime where he took a brief break. After lunch, he trained until the evening when dinner was served at six. After a brief break, he went out for a night training session. He finished all his training before 10, and he returned to eat a night snack. Then he would receive treatment. Afterwards, he did some light training before he went to sleep at midnight. He slept for six hours daily. If one considered Azul's superhuman capabilities, the amount of time he slept was long. If Azel was leading a normal life, he only needed two hours of sleep to get similar benefits. However, he was pushing himself to the edge, and Azel decided that was the minimum amount of sleep he needed. It had been about two weeks since he started this plan, and he was satisfied with the result. Havan spoke. Basically, he spent about 14 hours a day training. Moreover, it is a harsh training where he pushes himself within an inch of his life. He does it for seven days a week. It is impossible for normal people, but it isn't impossible for a spirit order practitioner. Chiron replied. A superhuman could handle a much more demanding schedule compared to a regular person. Still, he is keeping up such an unforgiving pace for 14 hours a day, and seven days a week. It is frightening. Moreover, when Havans told Chiron about Azul's training method, it was so difficult that Chiron was suspicious as to whether the information was true or not. The level of difficulty in terms of technique and intensity was almost unbelievable. So where's the young fellow at? The person, who posed the question, was Biorin. He couldn't sit on his curiosity, so he had followed after Chiron. Havan spoke. He is probably running through the wild mountain like a madman. He is probably conducting his self-many-to-one mountain warfare. Self-many-to-one mountain warfare. What the hell is that? He equips his clones with weapons and armors then he scatters them. As he runs through the mountain, he fights a many-to-one battle. Before the two of you arrived here, I confirmed his activities. The self-sparring had evolved into self-many-to-one mountain warfare. It felt as if they were listening to some fantasy. Chiron and Biorin looked at each other, and they shared a strong empathetic feeling with each other. Havans took the two of them towards the training facility. First, he wanted to show them the remnants of the destruction caused by the Thunder Dragon's horn. My god! Biorin almost let out a moan as he mumbled to himself. The training ground was made by cutting into the side of the mountain. It had a diameter of 50 meter, and the training ground was steeply terraced. Moreover, it was surrounded by walls that was over 10 meters high. It was made akin to a castle wall. Moreover, this sturdy wall had been reinforced with incredibly powerful protection magic. The wall had been split. Chiron attentively looked through the uneven gap that had been created, and he mumbled to himself. That guy did this. The impression was made two days ago, but they could still feel the trace of a strong magic. Biorin spoke. If you told me this fellow was a magician disguised as a spirit order practitioner, I would believe it. It seems magicians aren't the only ones that can create destruction on a large scale. No, I'm not talking about that. Try focusing on the flow of magic in the immediate surrounding, 
An unbelievable event is occurring. Him. Chiron gave a quizzical look, and he did as he was told. Then his eyes widened. What the hell? The magic of the training grounds is being drawn outwards. It seems it is the work of our friend. If one thought about it, the self many to one mountain warfare isn't something he could maintain with his own magic. He used his authority over this facility's control magic to draw out the magic towards outside. Is that supposed to be possible? Until now, I didn't think it was possible for a spirit order practitioner to do what he did. It makes me want to immediately get a hold of him and ask him how he did it. Chiron and Biorin elevated their bodies to get on top of the wall. They observed the remnant of the attack that stretched far beyond the wall. The two of them became speechless. Chiron, I want to ask you something. What is it? Can you do this? Chiron didn't have an immediate answer to the question. Across the split wall, evidence of large-scale destruction continued along the ridge of the mountain. The trees that had been within the attack's trajectory had been uprooted as it was destroyed and burned. Their furrow about two meters deep. The more surprising fact was that the mark of the attack ended at around 500 meters. However, they presumed the attack had traveled much farther than that distance. Biorin gave an estimate. If we assume the attack had followed across the terrain, the energy was released towards the sky. It split the peak in half. The peak of the mountain had really been cut in half, and one side had collapsed. Chiron observed the vestige. Him. If we are talking about pure destructive power, I could probably do it. Really, however, the attack was very focused. I can't guarantee it. In what way could a lightning be harnessed to be able to leave behind such a trace? Chiron had studied martial arts and dragon ridge arts for a span of a human lifetime. He wasn't a magician but he had become very adept at changing various elements into magic. He was able to cause a natural disaster in a very limited area. Did a lightning really have enough power to leave behind this remnant? Was this really the power of this element? He didn't have an answer. Biorin spoke. I can see why he wanted a training ground where no friends and humans are nearby. Anyways, shall we go observe this thing called self-many-to-one mountain warfare? Havans led the two people towards Azel's location. Huck. Huck. Azel was a bloody mess as he leaned against a tree. His heart pulsed roughly, and it was sending a signal that his body had almost reached its limit. However, Azel ignored this warning. He used the vibration caused by the pulse of his heart to generate a massive amount of magic. He filled the magic into his energy pulse as it bolstered the vitality of his body. This wasn't really a smart thing to do. If he overloaded the system like this, he could use a great amount of power in the short term. However, it would ruin his body in the long term. However, this was all within Azul's calculations. He had to use various methods to push his body towards its limit. At that moment, he heard a rustle from above his head. Azel moved his body without even looking up. The sword clashed against sword and a sound of an explosion rang out instead of the sound of steel. The blue light exploded, and the surrounding trees shook noisily. Azel was a beat late in finding his ambusher. His enemy was himself, who was wearing a mishmash of armors. The clone was a perfect replicate of Azel's appearance. However, it didn't have any injury or blemish. The clone gave off a very inhuman aura. The clone immediately adjusted its stance, and it attacked him. It hadn't just run towards him. It used a mental wave to confuse Azel's senses, and a powerful lightning sword strike was swung towards him. Right when Azel parried the attack, another clone ran out from the rear thicket. It had perfectly hidden its presence, so Azel didn't realize it was there until it had approached a certain distance. However, he was able to use his vision and sound to pick out its presence. Azel's body moved fast like a streak of lightning. Then the ownerless swords and armors fell to the floor. Azel maintained his pose for a brief moment, and he suddenly spoke. If you do that, there is a chance you might be attacked, Duke. Him. I wanted to get in a blow, but you really have a nose of a dog. Chiron had hidden himself on top of a tree. After observing the situation, he was inching forward when Azel became aware of him. I'm not done with my training yet. Well, I guess I'll have to end it here. Azel sheathed his sword. 
Then a magical wave started to flow out from various places inside the forest. Biorin, who had been hiding at some distance, exclaimed in surprise. There are so many of them. Twelve clones walked towards Azel. They all looked like Azel, but they all had a perfectly expressionless face. They were becoming blurry now, and they were semi-translucent. One could see the surrounding through their bodies. Azel spoke as they approached. It is tiring to carry around all these equipments. Let's head on back first. Azel ordered the expressionless clones to pick up all the equipments left behind by the defeated clones. Then they returned to the estate. Biorin had on an expression that was akin to someone wanting to run towards the restroom. He wanted to ask questions, but Azel had said they would talk when they reached the estate. This had been turned into a trial of patience for him. Chapter 72 Heroes Training. Part 3. Are you perhaps the reincarnation of Azel Kazark? Azel couldn't hold back his laughter when Chiron threw the question towards him after they arrived at the estate. Why would you think that? I researched it once I came here. Your appearance is very similar to the portrait of Azel Kazark. When he was staying at the capital, Chiron said there weren't that many portraits of Azel Karazark left in the world. Before Azel went to sleep, he had despised letting someone draw him. He hadn't given any permission for artists to draw him, so it was understandable why his portraits were scarce. It was probably a portrait made by someone, who had met him in real life. It was based on the artist's memory of him. Do you think I can see that portrait? I am curious as to see how closely I resemble him. I'll show it to you later. Of course, I came here for another reason. I got a report saying you used a technique called the Thunder Dragon's Horn to cause a massive amount of damage to my property. I'm sorry about the destruction. Still, I was sure you wouldn't ask me to pay for it. Azel spoke as laughter escaped from his mouth. Let's see. Him. Would you believe me if I told you this particular story behind my identity? Go on. Azel Kazark went missing two years after the Dragon Demon War had ended. There's no record on his continued survival or death. Isn't that so? Yes. What if the Archmage Carlos devoted himself to creating a magic that induced Azel to go into a long hibernation? What if this magic stopped the aging process? What if I told you that Azel Kazark was placed in a location away from public notice and a place where humans had never settled? What if he slept for a long time like a dragon in hibernation, and he woke up in this era, and that person is you? Is that the gist of the story? Yes, it is a very amusing story. Of course, I hope you don't expect me to believe such a story. Of course, I didn't expect it. Azel let out a bitter laugh. In the past, he had worried over whether he should tell other people about his real identity. However, he always struggled to come up with a way to prove the truth behind his story. Nothing was more frustrating than trying to convince the other to believe an outrageous story even if it was the truth. Azel spoke. There is an answer that is a little bit more easier to digest. What if I am a descendant of Azel Kazark that had been unknown to the world? You are. Yes. Him. Chiron furrowed his eyebrows. If it was someone else, he would have called it a lie. However, Azel's words sounded plausible. They do look like two peas in a pod. The burning red hair and blue eyes wasn't the only physical characteristic that matched up. His overall appearance matched up with the portrait of Azel Kazark and the information gathered by Chiron. There were too many similarities. Until now, he had been suspicious of Azel's identity. He was sure Azel was an enemy of the Dragon Demon King worshippers, but everything else brought up more questions than answers. He was willing to let go of the partial memory loss. He had heard a detailed account from Giles about how they had found Azel. Chiron admitted that complications like memory loss could be explained by the state Azel was in. It would also explain why his magical energy was so small compared to Azel's skill as a spirit order practitioner. This wasn't Chiron's conjecture. It was the Archmage Beorain's opinion. It is an interesting story. If I had to speculate, it sounds likely. Let's say his life had been in danger. To be precise, if he was wounded in a way where a normal person wouldn't be able to survive, he might have acted to preserve his life. In the process, his energy pulse might have dried up then his magical energy would have been swept up. 
Since he isn't an undead, the magical energy would have combined with his life force to maintain the vessel. Even if one took those two speculations to be the truth, it still left the question of Azul's origin. There was the question on how he became so skilled at a young age, and he knew techniques no one should know about. To be precise, he knew about the lost knowledge only known to the dragon demon worshippers. Azel spoke. The knowledge about Dragon Slayer's ritual and the Spirit Order special techniques was passed down from generation after generation. Will you be able to accept that fact? I'm also having a very hard time believing that story. However, Chiron looked at Azel with a serious expression. It was as if he was trying to read the truth from Azel's expression and eyes. Indifferent eyes looked back at Chiron. It was as if he didn't care if Chiron believed him or not. This attitude got on Chiron's nerve a little bit. You should try a little bit harder to convince me. I have no intention of doing so. What? Chiron's brows twitched. Azel spoke. No matter what story I tell you it'll be hard for you to accept it as the truth. I understand that. In truth, I don't have any reasons to pour my heart and soul into convincing you. If you believe me, then that's great. If not, it is all well and good. However, the important part is already resolved. What do you mean? We aren't enemies. Ah, now that I've talked to you about it, this is a bit disappointing. That's right. You aren't my enemy. Moreover, I'll state that you are my comrade in battle. If a dragon demon worshipper threatens the duke, I'll willingly stand by your side with my sword raised. Isn't that enough? Who? Chiron let out a laugh in spite of himself. He was happy. The irritation that had taken a hold of him was completely gone. He was happy at Azul's words. Chiron leaned back into his chair as he spoke. It would have been dangerous if you had been a woman. Why? I probably would have fallen for you. You are impudent and shameful, but you keep saying things I really like. I'll just take solace in the fact that the duke doesn't swing that way. Ah, with that being said, Mr. Havans begs of you to meet with young ladies who sent in their marriage proposals. It is enough that I already have my household worrying about me dying alone in my old age. So please shut up. There is still a very long time before my prime marrying age ends. Those of the dragon demon race lived for over 300 years, so he wasn't wrong. Michael spoke. Still, you are the head of the house, and you have been living a life of bachelorhood for over 100 years. Of course, they would bug you about it. You don't even have siblings, so shouldn't you be more worried about who you'll entrust with your affairs in the future? At the same time, I don't want to be like you. You had children during your prime, yet you refuse to give up your post as the head of the household even at your age. Isn't that also a serious problem? It isn't as if I wanted it to be like that. Actually, I've finally managed to settle my affairs, and the succession ritual will happen at the end of this year. You have nothing to say. Right. Chiron had a betrayed expression on his face as he quickly changed the subject. Anyways, if you are really the descendant of Azel Kazark, it is an inspiring event. The hero's bloodline, which was assumed to have ended, stand unbroken in this era. Wasn't Azel Kazark officially unwed? That is true, but Azel Kazark had adopted several children. There had been some speculation that they were his illegitimate children. Azel really wanted to plead his innocence regarding the issue, but he held himself back. Apart from my adopted children, I can't guarantee I hadn't sired any children. Him. In truth, Azel had slept with a lot of women during the Dragon Demon War. It wouldn't have surprised him if someone had Azel's child without him knowing about it. It was the reality of the era he had been living in. He didn't know if he would get to see the next day, so he had been true to the passion of the moment. It was an era where one was running through the darkness, and one's lifeline was always pressed up against a blade. We'll never know if that point of view was real or not. The household of Marquis Kazark was exterminated, so this conversation is pointless. What did you just say? Azel raised his voice in spite of himself. It was as if someone had delivered a blow to the back of his head. He lost his composure from the shock. Azel asked with a shaking voice. Did you just say the household of Marquis Kazark was wiped out? Is that really true? You didn't know about it. I didn't know. The history books didn't mention any. 
him. Chiron was taken aback as he looked at Azel. He had never seen Azel outwardly display his shock before. If one received the education of a noble family, this should have been common knowledge. So why was he showing such a reaction? He wondered about Azel's upbringing. Chiron was puzzled as he spoke. The household of Marquis Kazark was exterminated, and his lands were designated as the devil's territory. It happened at the twilight of the great darkness. I can see why the books you read didn't have that story in there. It isn't even part of our country's history. Azel was at a loss for words. The shock was so large that he felt his head spin. They hadn't been related by blood, but he had truly loved the children like his own family. He had asked Carlos and his friends to look over them. He hadn't expected them to be prosperous, but he had thought their lines would still be alive to this day. He had planned on searching the descendants of his adopted children. He had been planning on reminiscing after finding them. This small hope had been inside his heart. Wait a moment. This isn't the time to become limp from the shock. Azel slowly took a deep breath. He used spirit order to control the mental shock, and he slowly calmed his heart. After a moment, Azel asked a question. Do you perhaps know what caused it? I heard the land of Marquis Kazark was designated as the Devil's Territory, because the dragons went berserk there. The dragons went berserk. Over ten dragons went on a rampage, and the monsters moved in afterwards. If you want a more detailed account, I'll send you books that describe the event. Please. After giving his answer, an uncontrollable fire started to burn deep with Azel's eyes. Chiron and Biorin left only after they drowned Azel with questions throughout the night. Biorin still had a mountainous amount of question he wanted to ask, but he wistfully parted ways when Azel asked to end the meeting. He promised to answer their questions at a different date. After sending the two people away, Azel immersed himself back into his training. He kept up a rigorous schedule that exceeded the boundary of human limitation. He had been doing this for exactly a month since he arrived at the Lance Mountain. After that point, he started slacking off as if the severe training had all been a lie. He slept eight hours from night to morning, and he slept four hours in the middle of the day. He slept for twelve hours every day. Aside from sleeping, he only did light exercise, and he focused on meditation. When this continued for the fourth day, Havans couldn't hold back his curiosity as he questioned Azel about it. I know this isn't a great attitude for a servant to have. However, as a spy, it is hard for me to overlook this. A spy is someone who observes the target in secret. You have plainly revealed your intentions and role to the one you are supposed to observe. You are now asking direct questions to gain more information. I don't think you are supposed to do that. My situation is a bit unique to be following the common approach. Isn't it? I guess so. Well, it isn't some big secret, so I'll tell you. I'm still training very hard right now. Rest is training. Is that what you are trying to say? It is a bit more nuanced than that. I've pushed my body to the brink for 30 days. I need to rest 10 days. It'll allow me to be able to digest what I gained. This is my training cycle. So that is why you are passing the time in this fashion. I've stimulated every inch of my body, and now I have to regulate everything. I'll stop my explanation here. Him. Sir Azel has a lot of secrets. It is your job to mine for my secrets. I believe I've given you enough hints. Azel grinned. Chapter 73. Heroes Training. Part 4. He trained to the extreme for 30 days, and he rested for 10 days. This was his optimal training cycle, but he didn't have to keep to the schedule. The important part was the ratio. If he wanted to reduce the training time, he could train to the extreme for four days, then he would need only a single day of rest. The training he performed up until now had stimulated every single inch of his body. This was true for his bones, muscles, nerves, blood vessels. Every single one of his cells was stimulated as he drove them to move. As he became more aware of his own body, the job of consolidating his body occurred. At the same time, the stimulation would cause the creation of extra magic, and he sent it into his energy pulse. He worked on expanding his energy pulse. This resulted in his magic being able to flow to every inch of his body, and his body was strengthened. 
The act of recovering from injury was also part of this process. An injured body worked differently from one's normal body, and Azel even put this phenomena to use. This was the true worth of the body strengthening technique that had been passed down to Azel by Liglan. When one trains the mind, one has to find out the basic anatomy of the mind. Usually, one used one's body without doubt. This process allowed him to understand his body, and it brought his body under control. Half a year's time should be enough. He felt endlessly thankful toward Chiron. Azel suddenly asked a question. I have some questions I want to ask you, Mr. Havans. What is it? I would like to ask you about you grandfather. It is about the dragon demon Duke Rogan Aladdin, who fought with Azel Kazak. He had lied to Chiron about seeing Rogan's portrait. The books Azel had read had only brief passages describing Rogan as one of the heroes. This was why he wanted to hear about Rogan from his descendant. He wanted to hear what kind of life Rogan had lead after the Dragon Demon War ended. I'm guessing Mr. Havans never met him personally. Yes. He passed away long ago. He passed away long before Sir Azel was born. Ha ha ha. Of course, that wasn't possible. Azel let out a bitter laugh inside. Havans asked him a question. How old do you think I am? Him. Let's see. I'm guessing you are in your MID-60s. Havans had a surprised expression at his words. You are amazing. I've never met someone who guessed my age so accurately on the first try. People get confused whether I am a dragon demon or a dragon magen. A dragon magen's age is hard to estimate just based on their outer appearance. However, I formulated my guess based on your occupation. No matter how talented you are, you would need more than 10 years to be trained as a steward. This was why I guessed that age. I thought you couldn't be older than MID-60S. Sometimes, Sir Azel doesn't act like a young person. Your insight is amazing. Havans continued speaking as he burst out into laughter. These are words I heard from my father. Grandfather was someone who lived for over 300 years, so he was like a living history book. He loved telling stories. My father and the elders of my household relayed many of his stories to me. Like what? After the Dragon Demon War ended, he had started a business. He lost all his fortunes in that venture, and he had gone into bankruptcy. Ha! Huh. Azul's eyes turned round. Rogan was quick and facile in calculating profit and loss. He had been very efficient in managing the army's supply. A person like that drove his business into bankruptcy. Havans spoke. Grandfather had started his first business after the Dragon Demon War had ended. At the time, he had thought the world was his oyster. Or that was what he had said. However, the aftermath of the Dragon Demon War resulted in humans holding animosity towards the Dragon Demons. Even though my grandfather had fought for the humans, he wasn't free from receiving their scorn. Ah, unlike his management of the army in the Dragon Demon War, he had to act ruthless against his trading partners. At times, he would have to act like a demon, but that was easier said than done. There were also some high-profile figures, who held ill feelings towards the dragon demon race. In the end, he lost all the money he had saved up, and he had gone into debt. At the time, he said his future had looked very bleak. He hated the humans enough where he had thought about killing them all. He had put his life at great risk to save the humans in the Dragon Demon War. If another Dragon Demon War broke out, he thought about siding with the other side. Azel was speechless as he felt an ache inside his heart. Azel had thought Rogan would have lived well as a hero of the Dragon Demon War. However, reality wasn't that kind. It was common to see many wartime heroes fall into being useless humans when time of peace arrived. It seemed Rogan held similar risk factors that lead to the downfall of the former heroes. Havans continued to speak. However, humans were also the ones who had saved him. Even during those tough times, my grandmother never left his side, and she supported him. Then there were the humans he had befriended during the Dragon Demon War. He was able to get back up on his feet with the help of the people who received his help during the Dragon Demon War. Then he came to an understanding. What was it? He shouldn't dream about becoming a great merchant unless he was prepared to become a demon. Basically, 
he couldn't bring himself to become a demon. Yes, I feel the same way as him. I wanted to be in a position where I'll be allowed to run an organization. I can invest my feelings into each member of the organization. In business, one have to see the people making up one's organization as interchangeable parts, or a number. If one can't do this, it would be best to stay clear from being a merchant. One would have to find a different path. Grandfather found the different path. He passed on the family's business to his children after making sure it would run adequately. When my grandmother died, he lived a very busy life. Busy? Yes. He was our Duke's teacher, and he also played the game of being a hero as he traveled to various regions. He played a game of being a hero. This was how grandfather described it with his word. He didn't like putting humans in difficulty through his business dealings. It would cause the humans to hate him. Instead, he preferred saving people in trouble. He'd rather hear gratitude from humans after saving them. So he took up saving people as a hobby. He traveled far and wide. So you'll be able to hear stories about my grandfather from various parts of the continent. Ha ha ha. Azel couldn't help but laugh. It was really a story befitting Rogan. This was really like the Rogan Azel had known. Rogan had been very talented at running an organization, but he was very compassionate. He had a bleeding heart. Even as the army was running short on supplies, he gave food to the children of the refugee groups the army ran across. He would say he could do without food for a while as he gave the children his portion of the food. How could someone like him become a great merchant, who were like cold-hearted devils? It seems you lived a merry life, Rogan. It was unfortunate that he'll never meet Rogan again. However, he felt consoled by the fact that Rogan had lived a rich life. He was someone Azel had trusted to protect his back in a fight. He was also a friend, who shared nonsensical stories with him as they shared drinks. He was also Azel's savior. Rogan had been at the site of his teacher's death, and he allowed Azel to put his life on the line for the future. Don't act like a child, young human. A great man like him just entrusted you with the future. Even if it feels dirty, live on to become a hero. If you don't, you will despise yourself for the rest of your life. Azel remembered wrapping himself in those words as he charged into the hailstorm of arrows and magic. After that day, Azel took time at odd intervals to hear about Rogan from Havans. Azel buried his memory of Rogan in his mind until he would be able to look back and see his smile. Biorin spoke in a tired manner. The shape has somewhat taken form. They were in their third month of dedicating themselves to manufacturing the dragon sword. The process of making the dragon weapon was strictly a magical process. Even the act of carving the dragon bones into the shape of the desired weapon wasn't done by hand. It had to be done by magic. Chiron spoke. Still, I'm more comfortable at doing this compared to the first time we tried this out. It had been a long time since we made the first one. Of course, the production process has been much improved. Moreover, if the maker has a dragon weapon at one's disposal, the process become that much easier. Geez, we have to pour in dragon demon magic as if we are pouring in water. The dragon weapon was seeped with dragon demon magic. Even a human would be able to use dragon demon magic with this weapon. This was why a dragon demon or a dragon magian had to pour in an incredible amount of dragon demon magic from the start of the manufacturing process. Currently, the production of Azul's dragon sword had gone smoothly, so they were at the halfway point. However, the unfinished dragon weapon floating atop the magic circle didn't look anything like a sword. It looked like a stone had been half-half-heartedly chipped away. It had the rough shape of a sword. Chiron spoke. Is it okay for you to vacate your seat for too long? I thought you would travel back couple times during the process. My friend, isn't it a bit too late to ask that question now? Well, I'll admit I am a bit late in asking the question. Anyways, it isn't a problem. Biorin had already appointed his successor to the title of Count Michael. He had created a great system where everything would run smoothly even if he was absent. It isn't a problem as a lord or a member of the guardian shadow. Him. Were your disciples entered into the guardian shadow? Yes. The number of guardian shadow members have increased drastically with our country. 
Archmage Biorin had seven disciples excluding his descendants. He had entered four of his most trusted and talented disciples into the Guardian Shadow. For the near future, it would alleviate the shortage of manpower. Biorin spoke. It took a long time. It really, it was quite odd for him to be so active in the affairs of his land. He should have succeeded his title of count to his descendant already. Dragon Majin lived longer than humans, but their lives were short-lived compared to the dragon demon. At Biorin's age, he should have been retired from the Society of Nobles. Even those of the dragon demon race retired after an adequate amount of time passed. They married a little bit later than humans, but the title of nobility was passed on, unless there was a special circumstance that prevented it like Chiron. There was also an unusual circumstance behind Biorain's long reign as the Count. Around 30 years ago, Biorin had lost all his heirs to this title. He had lost all his children and grandchildren to the dragon demon worshippers. Everyone's sympathy towards Biorin lasted for a brief moment. Every one of his relatives came at him for his title of count, so his household and lands was put in a very bad spot. At the time, Biorin didn't even know who he should blame for the deaths. Even as he fell into despair, the dragon demon worshippers continued their work to destroy him. It was at that point when the Guardian Shadow appeared in front of Biorin. The Guardian Shadow repelled a trap set by the dragon demon worshippers, and Biorin had willingly became a member of the Guardian Shadow. It took a long time to stabilize his domain, and he had groomed another successor. For a brief moment, Biorin had fallen into his old memories. Biorin spoke. Let's put the issue of marriage aside. You should try a little bit harder to grow the membership of the Guardian Shadows. I'm actually eyeing some of my more competent subordinates. I'm also thinking about entering Arietta and Saiga into the organization. I'm sure the Dragon Demon Queen will oppose it. Moreover, those two have too much burden on their shoulders. We need members, who can travel around freely. Princess Arietta and Prince Saiga are tied to the throne, so they aren't suitable candidates. That is true. But, the Dragon Demon Queen was a member of the Guardian Shadow. Her children and the King didn't know about this fact. However, she had basically retired when she entered the throne as the Dragon Demon Queen. Biorin spoke. Do you really believe the words spoken by our friend, Azel? My friend, isn't it a bit too late to ask that question now? You turned my exact words against me. I believe him. I'll admit there are a lot of dubious parts to his story but in spite of those facts, I still believe him. You were completely taken with him. Tisk tisk. This is why you are still a bachelor. How are those two things related? I've never seen you completely taken with anyone. Your tastes are so eccentric that it is too hard to find a woman that you'll be able to live your life with. It would have been great if Azel had an older sister, or a younger sister. Biorin smirked as he changed the subject. Well, okay. You are blind to love, but I'll agree that you have a discerning eye for humans. Anyways, he is endlessly fascinating when seen through the eyes of a magician. Biorin was in awe of the various techniques displayed by Azel. He spoke to Azel deep into the night, and he was gaining so much from those conversations. If that friend really the descendant of Azel Kazakh, I'm really curious about that fact. What are you curious about? I wonder why Azel Kazakh hit himself in the latter years of his life. Moreover, what is the his descendant, who inherited all the techniques forgotten in this era, trying to accomplish? I can't help, but wonder. Maybe, he foresaw a danger in the future. He prepared a descendant for the trouble that'll come in the future. Isn't that likely? I sincerely hope not. However, if that does happen, do you think our friend will be the vessel to stop the threat? I believe in him. Somehow, I feel as if he'll pave a path into the future no matter what happens in the future. He generates such belief in me. Azel had never tried to dazzle Chiron with his words. It didn't matter if Azel's words were believed or not. Azel proved his worth through his actions. He liked that attitude, and it had moved Chiron's heart. Biorin smirked. As a dragon magian, you are considered young, but you have gotten older. You are talking about entrusting the future to the young. I really do sound like an old man. Shit. Chiron frowned. Chapter 74. Heroes Training. 
Part 5. He had a dream. It was a dream about the era when despair of darkness hung over the world. It was during the heyday of the Dragon Demon War, and the human coalition was careful in how they dispatched Liglan. He was able to subdue most Dragon Demons and Dragon Magians inside the Dragon Demon King's army. He was one of the hidden cards that was able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the four Dragon Demon Generals. Everyone knew how big of a problem would be created if they lost him. The human coalition didn't put him in harm's way unless it was a critical situation. Unfortunately, the Dragon Demon King's army also treated Liglan as if he was someone important. Such a large trap, Liglan mumbled to himself in disbelief. He was someone with a righteous character, but he had the capability of keeping the whole picture in perspective. He was well aware of his own worth, and this knowledge caused him to feel guilt. He always had to make cold-hearted decisions where he had to take as little risk as possible. This caused him to shed tears of blood. Unfortunately, Liglan could have never predicted that the Dragon Demon King's army would sacrifice 10,000 of their own to kill him. I never expected the day when we would have to use him as a bait to catch a human. The one who spoke was, the blood shed by a star, Baldazar. He was one of the, the four Dragon Demon Generals. He had beautiful blonde hair, and his two horn looked like carved ice infused with color. He was a youthful-looking dragon demon. Unlike his young noble appearance, he was a dragon demon, who had lived for several hundred years. He was a walking history book, and he possessed a level of power that was on a different level than the regular dragon demons. Moreover, he wasn't the only special dragon demon present here. I never expected to receive an order to attack a human from both sides. This is so humiliating that I will die in a fit of rage when I go to sleep. You should think of this as an honor. He was one of the other dragon demon generals called, the sword that parts a storm, Almeric. He growled as he spoke. He had messy white hair that hung low. He had tumultuous red eyes, and his thick horns were like volcanic stones. He looked like a middle-aged man with a ferocious face akin to a lion. He was also someone, who had surpassed the limitation of a dragon demon's life expectancy. Baldazark spoke. Honor is important. However, the king even put his child's life on the line for this. That is how much he wants us to kill this human once and for all. We have no choice, but to follow the order. I already know this. You don't have to lecture me, Duke Baldazark. Aldric shot back with his words. Dragon Demon King Atine's second son Sybane had been used as bait to attract Liglan. Sybane had been full of drive as he lead forth a large army. However, he had been thoroughly defeated. Sybane had received a severe wound, and he was at death's doors. His surviving army was fleeing with him in tow. Liglan had lead his forces into a fierce pursuit. However, Liglan had never expected that Sybane and his 10,000 troops was a trap placed to entice him into attacking them. Baldazark spoke. You shouldn't expect any backup. Currently, a series of attack is occurring against the your fortress. Ornsaurus is facing off against that impudent child named Carlos. So three dragon demon generals were mobilized to kill a single person. That's right. You should think of it as an honor. He had to give up two regions under our control, and another region where we had the upper hand. We had to completely give up three battle fronts to be able to kill you. We are showing you this respect since His Majesty's best disciple was defeated by you. The battle happened the time before the last one. Liglan had killed one of Atine's disciples. The disciple had thought no human would dare to face him. However, Ligilan had overwhelmed the disciple in one-on-one -on -one battle. Liglan had delivered a significant blow to the army after he killed the disciple. His dazzling performance had curdled the blood of the dragon demon king's army. Baldazark spoke. We have to kill you in no uncertain terms, Sir Liglan. Let's start this before all of your underlings die. Liglan grinded his teeth. His subordinates were dying on every side. When they had entered this basin, the hidden dragon demon king's army appeared to bombard them in a savage manner. It was as if they didn't care if the enemy killed the critically wounded Sybane. The attack pretty much decimated the troops that had joined Liglan in his pursuit. Liglan exclaimed, 
do you think I'll let you bastards do as you like? At the same time, Liglan planted his pair of dragon Macon into the ground. The ground shook as if an earthquake was occurring. Surprisingly, the seismic wave exploded as it avoided the locations where Liglan's comrades were present. Qua Baldazark was astonished when he saw this. Ha! Huh, amazing! The dragon demon army had been attacking from an advantageous location, yet this attack had put the two sides in a more even ground. Before Liglan could move, a red-haired knight suddenly appeared. He struck at Baldazark with his thunder sword. The attack violently shook Baldazark's magical barrier. Baldazark was astounded. Who the hell is this shrimp? Surprisingly, Azel had ambushed Baldazark even though Baldazark had layered multiple detection magic around himself. Azel had gained dragon demon magic not too long ago through the dragon slayer's ritual. Azel let out a frightening level of energy as his consecutive attacks were let out like a storm. Qua Baldazark was surrounded by his barrier as he was being pushed back. At the same time, Azel's clone appeared, and it ambushed Almeric. The clone has substance. A human learned how to do the incarnation. Almeric was astounded. The clone had substance, and it also was able to display offensive capabilities that was almost on par with the real body for a brief amount of time. This was one of the highest class of skill in dragon arts. It was the incarnation. Azel let out a shout. Teacher, get out of here. Azel, I can't hold out for long. Shit, you cannot die in this place. Hurry up and go. Azel had already taken a significant amount of damage as he tried to save his comrades from the ruthless bombardment. He had come to save Liglan. He had charged through the, the dragon demon king's army with his body in such a state. His heart was beating like crazy as Azel used magical energy that far exceed what his body could hold. The magical energy swirled around like a hurricane. If it was someone other than Azel, the person wouldn't have been able to handle the excess amount of magical energy. However, Azel was steering the runaway magical energy as if it was a bucking bronco. He let out fierce attacks towards the two dragon demon general. How dare you, you little shrimp. He had been caught off guard. Sir Baldazark was being pushed several dozen meters backwards. Baldazark raged with fury. He pulled back the barrier that had almost been shredded into rags, and at the same time, he let out a storm of magic. However, Azel was indifferent to the attack. Blood fountained forth from Baldazark's shoulder. His arm was halfway severed as it hung loosely at his side. His face crumpled from the pain. Azel had increased his body's defense as much as possible. He just received the magical spells with his body in exchange for delivering a strike against Baldazark. Azel let out a shout as if he was vomiting blood. You cowards. You can't even defeat my teacher without setting up a trap. Do you really think you can stop me with these weak magic? Azel was a bloody mess as he continued his fierce attack. Azel's fighting spirit was incredible as he had committed his life to the attack, and Baldazark was in danger. However, Azel wasn't fighting a single opponent. Azel was flung away as the sound of an explosion rang out. Almeric had defeated Azel's clone and he had attacked Azel from the side. I never expected to find someone like this. It seems our people in the intelligence department are blind fools. You won't get any answers from me. Die, you filthy bastards. Azel gritted his teeth, and he pulled up his remaining power. His body was already at its limit. It was almost beyond his ability to stand and raise his sword. His consciousness was becoming fuzzy from the blood loss and his muscles were screaming in protest. His internal organs had been damaged, and his entire body was begging for him to stop. However, there was nowhere to run. He was facing the two dragon demon generals, who were known as being the strongest in the dragon demon king's army. Azel decided to burn all of his still immature power. Ha ha ha. Still, isn't this a great stage for my last stand? He wouldn't hesitate to do this again if he could save Liglan's life. Liglan was a hero. He was like a lantern that could shine light to the people lost in this chaotic times. He couldn't die here. It happened when Azel was having these thoughts. Azel. He heard Liglan's voice. He was grabbing Azel's shoulder. Azel stared dumbfoundedly before he let out his anger. What are you doing? 
Why aren't you running away? Unfortunately, I'm not the one who should be running away. As he spoke, Liglan raised one of his dual swords. When he let go of Azel's shoulder, Azel felt dizzy. No way. Liglan had subdued him. Liglan laughed as he saw Azel fall over. You are the one that has to live. What kind of nonsense is he? Azel wanted to let out a string of swear words. However, he wasn't able to. Someone picked up his fallen body. I'll leave the rest to you, Rogan. Does it have to be this way, Sir Liglan? Dragon Demon Rogan asked the question. Liglan spoke. I am sure of it now. He is the only one I can entrust the future to. How could I ask such a person to die in this place to save a burnt-out husk like me? You are crazy, Liglan. Rogan, don't listen to such nonsense. Azel was desperately holding onto his fading consciousness. Those words didn't make any sense. He was just a little bit more talented at using the sword than others. He was merely a reckless daredevil. He had no idea what to do, so he just repeatedly fought enemies that appeared in front of him. However, Liglan was different. He was someone who lead people towards ending the Age of Darkness. He had shown Azel the way, and Azel was able to find a more meaningful place in life. That kind of person was about to die for him. The frank meaning behind his gesture was unavoidable. Liglan hadn't just stopped Azel. He had calmed Azel's magical energy, which had run wild. He had also poured in a power that would save Azel's life. It was the Dragon Macon. Liglan was standing in front of the Dragon Demon Generals, but one of his dual sword wasn't a Dragon Macon anymore. He had give one of his Dragon Macon to Azel. He made it so that its power would act as a failsafe to preserving Azel's life. In such a brief amount of time, this was the only choice he could make to save Azel's life. He had to fight two dragon demon generals yet he had wasted so much power. Ah, his consciousness was blinking in and out. The incessant noise from his surrounding kept cutting in and out. It made him want to throw up. Rogan. A horribly cracked voice leaked out of him. Rogan was running with Azel in his grasp. He avoided the falling arrows and magical spells. If he couldn't avoid it, he took the damage with his back as he protected Azel. Don't do this. Let us return. We have to save my teacher. Rogan shouted with an emotional voice. Shut up. His voice rang out like thunder even in the din of battle. The sound assaulted Azel's ears. Rogan had taken the attacks instead of Azel, so he was a bloody mess. He spoke in an angry scolding tone. Don't act like a child, young human. A great man like him just entrusted you with the future. Even if it feels dirty, live on to become a hero. If you don't, you will despise yourself for the rest of your life. I don't know if you are the vessel able to carry out this task. However, you have to prove that his evaluation of you was true. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? In the end, Rogan had escaped the battlefield with Azel. Liglan had stayed behind in the trap, and he had died after gravely wounding the two dragon demon generals. It took Azel two years to be able to use the dragon Macon given to him by Liglan. This occurred after he had made his own dragon Macon. Chapter 75. Those who covered the blood of a royal. Part 1. The dragon demon king worshippers always moved carefully. At one time, they were at the doorstep of controlling the world from behind the scenes. When the Nadic Empire fell, the humans were divided, and the dragon demon king worshippers had skillfully penetrated deep within the cracks that had formed within the ranks of the humans. They were leading the humans into darkness. They manipulated the history, and they were able to hide the important facts from the humans. They were on their way to shaping the situation to their liking. However, the Guardian Shadow suddenly appeared out of nowhere and the Guardian Shadow had stalled their activities in their track. The Guardian Shadow used the human population as a surveillance network, and they backed the powerful Dragon Demon King worshippers into a corner. Still, there are numerous ways we can avoid their detection. Nibiris bit her lips. It had been a while since she had come out of the Plane of Darkness. For the past four months, she had confined herself as he focused on increasing her ability as a magician. Now she had received a new mission, and she was heading towards the eastern part of the continent. She was traveling with Duran and Regina by her side. Nibiris suddenly asked a question. Did you hear about it, 
Sir Joran. What are you referring to, Miss? Laura is being sent into the Rulan Kingdom. Yes. Nibiris bit her lips. Laura Ornsaurus. She was the direct descendant of the goblet containing the Heaven's Tears Ornsaurus, who had served the dragon demon King Atane. In terms of bloodlines, she was of lower quality compared to Nibiris, who was related by blood to the dragon demon King Atane. However, Laura was of her generation, and she was her rival. They fought to outdo each other in terms of achievements as officials. Nibiris heard the news indicating her rival was being inserted into the region where she had failed. It frustrated her to no end. If Laura stylishly succeeded where she had failed, she would lose face. Joran spoke. The mission given to Miss is very important. You are in charge of finding his whereabouts. I know. Nibiris had come to the eastern part of the continent to find a figure, who was very important to the Plane of Darkness. He went missing around ten years ago, so no one knew whether he was dead or alive. The power vacuum created by his disappearance had caused a lot of disturbance in the inner power structure of the Plane of Darkness. After a careful and tenacious search, they were able to find a trace of this figure. It was a dangerous region in the eastern part of the continent. It was a place where humans and dragon demon worshippers dared not enter. This was why high-quality individuals such as Nibiris and Joran was being sent in. Nibiris spoke. Will Laura run into him? Are you talking about the man named Azel Zestringer? Yes. I have no idea. Do you have any more information regarding him, Regina? Once he joined up with the Dragon Sword Duke, we rarely get any information about him. Regina, who had been following silently, spoke up. She had been transferred to work directly under Nibiris. She was able to learn surprising secret techniques at the Plane of Darkness, and her overall battle capabilities had increased significantly. Moreover, she was acknowledged for her attention to detail, so she was put in charge of receiving information and dispatching personnel. Currently, he is holed up in the Dukedom of Tarantos, and he continues to train. We haven't received much information beyond that. He is training. It is said that the Dragon Sword Duke is giving him unfettered support. As Dragon Demon King worshippers, they couldn't approach anyone under the protection of Chiron Tarantos, since he's a member of the Guardian Shadows. There were hidden Dragon Demon King worshippers in the Dukedom of Tarantos, but they weren't in positions where they'll be able to get quality information. Nibiris grumbled. I hope he does appear in front of Laura. That'll be fair. Miss. I know that my thoughts are petty. However, they are using the carefully prepared measures for Laura. It pisses me off that they'll be using such methods to divert the attention of the Guardian Shadow. After their dream of dominating the world from the background was smashed to pieces by the Guardian Shadow, the Dragon Demon worshippers developed several methods that'll allow him to avoid detection. One of the method was to use the Dragon Slayer's ritual as bait to mobilize a dragon. When Nibiris was given the mission to kidnap Arietta, her organization hadn't used such extraordinary measures to help her. However, they were willing to use such carefully prepared methods to assist Laura Ornsaurus. This put Nibiris in a bad mood. Let's see how you do, Laura. I want to see how good your luck is. Nibiris furrowed her brows when she thought about Laura's expressionless face. He pushed himself to the extreme for 30 days and he recovered for 10 days. Azul's training cycle had been going smoothly. He had finished his third cycle, and he had just started his fourth cycle. Today Azel was using a variety of methods to push himself to the brink. Azel clashed with his clone. Accompanying the sound of an explosion, a cloud of dust rose into the air. At the same time, Azel desperately flew backward as he tried to create distance. There had been nothing in front of him. Yet something cut past the bridge of his nose, and a wound was formed. Azel was catching his breath as he looked at his surrounding. He had an unobstructed view of the training ground. However, aside from the clone, Azel was acting as if there were unseen beings was surrounding him. Azel was moving in a flashy manner as he left behind after shadows every time he used his instantaneous movement. He used the instantaneous movement to travel a short distance and he made a flashy turn to change the trajectory of his movement. It was as if Azel was continuously skipping space. However, 
Wounds kept forming on Azul's face and body. Something kept flying in to cut him. Then, a magical spell flew in, and it exploded. Azel was sent flying as the sound of the explosion rang out. Surprisingly, this was a form of image training. The clone in front of his eyes was given autonomous control, and it had substance. However, everything else was occurring within Azel's mind. Azel's mind techniques were trained to its zenith, and he was pushing himself in various situations he had constructed. He recreated situations he had experienced during the Dragon Demon War, as he fought full tilt against his clone. Others couldn't see the entities around him, but these constructs felt like reality. It was also able to have strong physical influence on Azel's body. Shit, when Azel lost his posture, his clone ran in towards him. Azel was in an unfavorable position, yet he was getting ready to counterattack with a do-or-die attitude. Sir Azel, a thunderous shout rang out. At the same time, the desperate atmosphere disappeared as if it was a dream, and the Azel's clone disappeared. By the time Azel righted himself, the ownerless armor and sword fell to the ground. Havans was calling him from the estate. He was in such a hurry that he used his dragon demon key to amplify his voice. It was so loud that his voice reverberated across the mountain. Something terrible has happened. Him, Azel had a quizzical expression on his face. He closed his eyes as he took deep breaths. He had purposefully blurred the line between reality and the construct he created with his mind. After withdrawing the constructs, he ran towards the estate. Havans had a hardened expression as he relayed a shocking news. The dragon demon prince has gone missing. Missing? Yes. The duke sent an urgent message to you asking for help regarding this problem. Please ready the healers and magic recovery potions. Hurry. Azel didn't need further explanations. He headed inside. After Saiga Vile Rulan had completed his coming of age ceremony, he was involved in around one battle per month. He was now working more in the public eyes, and his fame was increasing. The throne wanted Saiga to take it easy, but he wouldn't listen to them. I have to work hard right now to put my name out there. He asserted himself as he took on the work that had been meant to be shared with Arietta. At the same time, the troops under his direct command was rapidly increasing. As he traveled to various parts of the country, he scouted for useful prospects, and he gave them offers to serve under him. He also advertised that he would always welcome those, who are confident in their skill. Those who looked up to the dragon demon prince, and the ambitious people with no background continued to gather beneath Saiga. He moved with about 200 people around him when he was summoned to battle. Moreover, the A and B teams rotated every time he went out. Even at such a young age, Saiga displayed the knack for gathering men, and he was able to efficiently use a budget to support the men under his command. He was talented at it. Still, shouldn't you take a break soon, Prince? We are fine, but you are pushing yourself too much. The old knight Pullman had kept an eye on Saiga since his debut. He was an experienced knight, and he was the vice commander of the Royal Knights. He had been thinking about retiring from his post, but he went to serve under Saiga at the request of the Dragon Demon Queen. The Dragon Demon Queen was well aware of her son's ambitions, so she determined that he needed the support of an experienced veteran. Saiga spoke. Him. You are right, Sir Pullman. However, I'm fine for now. I'm not that tired since only minor skirmishes have occurred recently. It isn't as if the prince's work ends after a battle is fought. Two teams were being rotated, so Saiga was doing well at managing the fatigue felt by his personal troops. However, Saiga continued to go into battle without rest. Saiga was doing so much that it was hard to think of him as a 15-year-old. As he stepped up in the battlefield, he also maintained good relationships with the high nobles and various departments that supported the throne. He had a talent for politics, and he even paid attention to the business side of having an outfit. He gave only the best gears to the men serving under him. He supported his men both materially and morally. Moreover, when he wasn't out on the battlefields, he didn't rest. He accepted invitations from nobles, and he went to parties to build his personal connections. This required Saiga to have incredible amount of physical energy and mental power. 
Sega's body was much sturdier than a human, but his schedule was going to sap him dry from fatigue. Saiga let out a bitter laugh. There was still a childlike quality to his face, and one could see signs of fatigue on his face. I'm sorry for making you feel concerned. However, I have to do it for a little longer. At the very least, I have to maintain this pace until the beginning of next year. Why? Your reputation is already well established. I want my sister to have some free time. Pullman was at a loss for words. Saiga spoke. I'm not saying I'll entirely take over the role being fulfilled by my sister. I'm not that impertinent. I have a better understanding of the work she is doing. Originally, Saiga had thought differently. He planned on doing all the work required of the Dragon Demon royal family. He hadn't wanted Arietta to do any work. He wanted her to gain her happiness as a woman. However, he soon realized that he had been too arrogant when he started to do the work. There were a lot of work required to be done by the Dragon Demon royal family, and the responsibility increased as the throne became stronger. The previous incident changed my sister's mindset. She is moving incrementally towards making her own organization. I want to buy her some time until she can set up a proper system under her leadership. After Arietta made Giles her personal knight, she was slowly gathering her own people. However, she wasn't as good at politics as Saiga. This was why she was gathering her people at a much slower speed. Saiga wanted to give her some time. This was why he went on a mission meant to be given to Arietta, and it had resulted in him overworking himself. Pullman shook his head from side to side. Prince is really. You put me to shame. I'm able to do what I do, because I have all of you with me. Understood. As a knight and a man, how can I stop you from fulfilling your task? I'll do my best to assist you. We'll end this with no problem at all. They were tasked to eradicate the bandits infesting the northeastern county of Balden. Unusually strong orcs were mixed in with this group of bandits, and they controlled wild animals as if they were pets. They had struck down the knights as if they were trampling reeds. Moreover, the bandits used the harsh terrains as a weapon. They moved like trained troops as they conducted a guerrilla warfare. The county of Balden had taken massive damage from them and they had already tried to hire famous knights from outside their region. However, it was all for naught. Two towns had already been thoroughly pillaged. When the upper class started taking massive damage from the bandits, Count Balden raised his two hands in surrender. He asked the throne for help. 